Volume One, Chapter One of The Rebel Rose. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Deanna Beauvais. The Rebel Rose by Justin McCarthy and Rosa Campbell Prade. Volume One, Chapter One in the lobby mr bellarmin can you tell me who that handsome girl is asked lady saxon i have been watching her this long time what is she doing here and why does she dress in that eccentric fashion she looks a cross between a lady horsebreaker and mary queen of scots the question was put in the lobby of the house of commons on an evening in may to one of the most rising young men of the conservative party this was mr ralph bellarmin lady saxon's latest favourite she was determined to make a victim of him it was said and he seemed quite willing to be victimised the lobby was full a great debate was going on and many strangers were waiting on the off chance of somebody leaving his place in one of the galleries and going away thereby bequeathing a seat to some fortunate successor lady saxon who was a clever woman and regarded life from the dramatic point of view was wont to say that to stand in this inner lobby of the house of commons on such an occasion was to feel the pulse of england to-night the very air was exciting an important by-election an election that is to say caused by some unexpected event such as a resignation or a death was going on and its result might be made known at any moment now and the result would be one of much moment and significance everyone in the lobby seemed to have the shadow of this coming event on his face every face had its own look of importance and preoccupation telegrams were flying off by the score from the clicking little room in the outer lobby a little mob had collected round the post office the floor was strewn with more than its usual quantity of torn paper. Members were gathered in knots, their hats tilted over their foreheads after the approved fashion of the House of Commons, and were talking earnestly or chafing each other noisily. Other members passed to and fro in an alert, eager manner. Only the policemen on duty kept their stolid, bored expression. Several ladies were dotted about among the groups one or two who waited against the wall while their escorts asked questions or applied for orders looked a little shy and awkward but for the most part the ladies in the lobby seemed sufficiently at ease and were eagerly snatching at all the information they could get from the various politicians who came in their way english political life was in a curious condition just then an ominous calm prevailed for the moment it had followed a storm and every one felt that it was sure to be followed by a storm. The Tories were in office, but hardly in power. They had succeeded in turning out Sir Victor Champion after he had held office for some years. But they had turned him out only by a small majority, and by the help of votes on which steady, old-fashioned Toryism could not always count. The fire new, energetic, and compact little band of Tory Democrats, as they chose to call themselves, supplied the votes which turned out sir victor champion lord saxon and the other liberal ministers of various shades and put the marquis of bosworth lord twyford and other tory nobles and gentlemen into their office but the tories had lost their great statesman de carmel the only man who could stand up against sir victor champion lord de carmel's death had brought lord bosworth to the front as leader Lord Bosworth was a Tory of unbending will and inveterate prejudices. The political sun must stand still for him. But then, would it stand still, people asked? In truth, there seemed a lack of some stimulating purpose on either side. Victor Champion's ministry had not been liberal enough for the liberals out of doors. Champion was kept back by his Whig colleagues so his radical adherents and his tory opponents declared but it seemed impossible to believe that he would not do his best to get hold of the country again a good war cry on either side would be a great thing everybody said the trouble with the tory government was that if the sun would not stand still for them neither would the tory democrats 
the trouble with the liberals was that they lacked a cause and a cry the lady who asked the question of mr bellarmin was herself of most striking appearance she was not in her first youth thirty she frankly owned to and probably she was a little older but is it not conceded that a beautiful woman of thirty is at her most dangerous age she was extremely handsome hers was a beauty that told of a passionate melodramatic temperament the most optimistic soothsayer would hesitate to predict for lady saxon a life undisturbed by any whirlwind of emotion she was luxuriant in form tall more than commonly tall and her height was increased by the style in which her bright yellow rather curly hair was brushed up from the nape of her neck and from her oval forehead and coiled in a mass on the top of her small very finely set head the upper folds of the coil were so much lighter than the hair beneath that they suggested a coronal of gold such as might have been borne by some early saxon princess the coronal was placed however a little on one side thus giving her a certain air of defiance and coquetry bringing to mind also the rakishly worn kp of a daredevil young french soldier her dark eyebrows and large dark eyes were in curious contrast with the golden hair which evidently did not owe its glory to art her mouth was ripe and red and had a slow way of smiling that was one of her greatest fascinations she was in evening dress having rushed from dinner to hear her husband speak and wore a long plush mantle the color of heliotrope which was a little thrown back and showed glimpses of a neck and arms half veiled in lace and of what sculptors call heroic size perhaps a fastidious observer might have said that there was just a little too much of her in every way that nature had made her a little too tall too yellow-haired too dark-eyed too handsome that there was something almost oppressive in her beauty that there was a faint suggestion of lack of refinement as in a dinner-table too prodigally adorned with plate and hothouse flowers lady saxon was quite entitled to feel at home in this political atmosphere she was married to the marquis of saxon eldest son and heir of the great duke of athelstane and one of the whig leaders in the house of commons lord saxon had been up and was now down and his speech was creating some talk in the lobby rolf bellarmin when he approached lady saxon had expected that she would say something about her husband's speech and was surprised to find her mind occupied with the unknown beauty he laughed pleasantly the laugh brightened his fine-featured poetic almost melancholy face which when in repose looked like that of a medieval hero of romance but when he laughed his ringing laugh and above all when he baited his opponents on the floor of the house in his pugnacious schoolboy style he seemed what he was a nineteenth-century tory democrat the leader of the little party which had been instrumental in bringing the conservatives into office that young lady has every right to get herself up as mary queen of scots lady saxon she is the honourable mary stuart beaton and who is the honourable mary stuart beaton you haven't heard of our new pretendress there was an article about her in the piccadilly last week it was called nineteenth century jacobites lady saxon smiled i like my politics and my scandal at first hand she said but i'm behind instead of before the newspapers in this case mary stuart what does that mean i retract my remark about the lady horsebreaker since she is a friend of yours her majesty has a distinguished look and is certainly very pretty tell me about her lady saxon turned a critical gaze upon a little group of ladies and gentlemen who had just been brought into the lobby anybody could have seen at a glance that this particular lady about whom lady saxon was inquiring was the principal figure in the group one could as well have failed to pick out diana herself in the midst of a group of her maiden huntresses there was indeed something of the huntress in this young woman's aspect in her height she too was taller than the ordinarily tall woman in the erectness and freedom of her carriage 
in her slimness and the poise of her head and in the clinging robe of black velvet which fell in straight folds from the waist and looked odd and picturesque in contrast with the more inflated draperies of the fashionable london women whether by accident or design the costume reminded its beholder of that style of dress which we associate with portraits of the scottish queen the stiff long bodice made with a sort of modern adaptation of the old-fashioned stomacher the rosary and cross hanging from the girdle the bonnet peaked in front and edged with large jet beads the full lace ruffle all harmonized with a face startlingly stuart in outline this nineteenth century representative of the white queen bore a curious resemblance to some of the best known and most authentic portraits of her hapless prototype she had the oval face and long slender neck the rather high forehead over which dark brown hair with a ruddy tinge through it parted in natural waves the long straight nose the full clear almond-shaped hazel eyes and fine arched brows even the little pointed chin with a dimple upon it the face was full of decision and of a certain innocent pride it was not without the shade of proverbial stuart melancholy but this was only noticeable when the features were in repose and then it gave to the countenance a pathos and feminine sweetness that was perhaps its greatest charm yet surely the tragic could have no association with this mary stuart whose smile suddenly illuminating the face was so frank and bright and whose manner when she talked had almost childlike animation miss beaton is the lioness of a certain coterie answered bellarmin she holds a sort of court of her own so they tell me and gives herself quite naturally i suppose the airs of exiled royalty a queen of the gypsies said lady saxon scornfully come now lady saxon that complexion doesn't look like gypsy blood charles the second looked like a gypsy didn't he lady saxon interjected well miss beaton doesn't as you see if you were a legitimist i should tell you that there stands your lawful queen your queen by divine right you count yourself english i suppose now he added i am english of course replied lady saxon composedly though i was married to a german bellarmin bowed certainly lady saxon's pronunciation of the letter r was too trill-like to bear out the current rumour that she was of teutonic origin though many fanciful pen-and-ink sketches had been made of lady saxon in society publications nothing more was known as positive fact about her than that lord saxon had married her in frankfort some eighteen months previously and that she had been the widow of a certain baron langenwelt ennobled for scientific discovery but tell me said lady saxon still looking toward the quasi-royal group tell me about this miss beaton what are you talking of is it a joke or a mystification or a case of the bend sinister nothing of the sort i am quite serious that girl is the legitimate descendant of the stuarts you can study her genealogy in the almanac de gotha lady saxon if you doubt me she starts from henrietta maria duchess of orleans who according to scandalous chronicles was poisoned by her husband henrietta maria left a daughter married to a prince of savoy miss beaton's mother through whom her stuart blood runs was a bavarian princess and she married an englishman lord beaton a legitimist a tory of the old school of the divine right church and king order in short a conservative like you put in lady saxon fixing her dark eyes upon the young man and smiling one of her enigmatic smiles not in the least like me returned bellarmin like lord stonehenge if you want an illustration and he glanced toward a tall slight aristocratic-looking man with a peaked van dyke beard who was standing near miss beaton and was at the moment speaking to a portly white-haired lady evidently one of miss beaton's companions lord stonehenge was a catholic a jacobite by education whose ancestors paid homage at st germain's and whose association with the english court ended when the dynasty of revolution began i am interested in lord stonehenge said lady saxon 
his place is not far from a queer little nest of mine you don't conserve traditions then mr bellarmin i am a tory of the new-fangled sort replied bellarmin that is not a tory at all in the old-fashioned sense what lord saxon would call a tory i only conserve the traditions which are not rotten enough to crumble away of themselves there i differ from your leader your champion of christendom as they call him who wants to go at established institutions like st george at the dragon social evolution is my theory lady saxon though i and my progressive tory party did turn out you liberals the other day you should be in our camp said lady saxon her eyes still gazing into his you have nothing in common with the tories and you know it but you like to be master of the situation mr bellarmin you love a free fight you must be always in opposition showing up abuses and bullying the placeholders you have it in your power now while the balance is so even to turn out any government that has been your aim and ambition oh i know it is a proud position for so young a man but will it last till the general election said rolfe in a tone rather of question than of assertion you refused a place in the ministry continued lady saxon yes the place of a junior lord put in bellarmin ah well you see mr bellarmin i do know some political secrets which the newspapers only hint at she went on you were quite right not to commit yourself i may tell you that there was meaning in her tone i suppose i understand you lady saxon you think that sir victor champion will soon have to face the country on a new issue well the time may come to demolish the house of lords fifty years hence perhaps but i don't quite see it now bellarmin lowered his voice and glanced cautiously round i am quite ready to believe that you know a great many political secrets lady saxon perhaps you wouldn't mind giving me the straight tip about these mysterious negotiations some knowing ones are talking of of the mine which people say champion is springing beneath the foundations of the constitution lady saxon's eyes shot out a gleam oh i cannot tell you anything about that she said slowly she drew a deep breath and involuntarily perhaps pressed her hand to her bosom sir victor champion is a great man she said a man of indomitable will of infinite resource his enemies have not done him justice nor she added his friends has he any friends not so many as worse men but those he has are true to him said lady saxon yet his secrets get out you see bellarmin answered you think so i have proved it have i not i am amazed i confess said lady saxon after a moment's pause how did you get to know about these negotiations if you choose to call them so she replied what else could any one call them well no matter what they are called don't fence with me surely we know each other too well for that how did you get to know the shadow of an emotion passed over bellarmin's face at her appeal but he shook it off he was evidently under constraint and tried to hide what he was feeling under a mask of conventional banter he laughed come isn't that rather cool on your part lady saxon you want me to tell you everything and you who hint at a great deal but will never really tell one a political secret i don't so much want to find out what you know as how you came to know lady saxon said emphatically after all if there are traitors in sir victor's confidence men who reveal his most secret purposes lady saxon seemed moved to generous anger lady saxon said bellarmin gravely there was nothing of that kind there was no underhand revelation of anything there was no treachery of any sort lady saxon's eyes flashed with a delight which she hastened to conceal all this talk had been a little fencing match between her and bellarmin and quite unconsciously bellarmin had been vanquished lady saxon had never before heard one word of any negotiations going on between sir victor and any set of politicians 
Bellarmin had taken it for granted that she must be aware of the whole matter through her husband, and had had a hope that, by playing a bold game, he might get to know something of Lord Saxon's purposes. He gained no addition to his stock of information. She gained much. She learned that there were negotiations. She knew that her husband had not been told anything about them, and from Bellarmin's last answer, she also learned that the negotiations were carried on semi-officially with him on behalf of his party. That was the only construction to be put on his declaration that there had been no treachery. Let us come back to our princess, said Bellarmin, as if he wished to turn the conversation. See how these men are doing homage to her? Here in the lobby of the House of Commons, he laughed. There's something odd and incongruous and picturesque about the whole thing, Lady Saxon. It takes my fancy. It is going back to Sir Walter Scott and Flora MacIver and all that sort of thing. It's dramatic. It's refreshing in these days of the Birmingham caucus and the divided skirt. Don't you think so? I agree with you that Miss Mary Stuart Beaton has a sense of the dramatic, said Lady Saxon rather absently. She would have preferred to talk about this unknown scheme of champions, the leader of the opposition, this great coup which people said he was meditating and which was to shatter or cement the Liberal Party. She wanted to talk about practical politics and not about visionary dynasties. The interest she had felt in Mary Stuart Beaton was imperiously expelled by another and more powerful interest, an interest that lay deep deep at the core of josephine saxon's heart she herself became conscious that her bosom was answering to an emotion not warranted by the mere casual mention of her husband's chief and she tried to pull herself together making a peremptory little sign to bellarmin to await her pleasure she suddenly nodded and smiled to a lady who came up at that moment how do you do lady mavis there was a half-whispered colloquy just come from poles mare it was too terrible we are getting as serious as the bostonians everybody in corners with dictionaries trying to see how many words they could make out of sardanopolis that sort of thing then guessing words somebody gave cupid and psyche and lady poles mare the bride who they say learns her lesson by heart every morning and is too stupid and too lovely for anything said but who is psyche I never heard of Psyche. Had she ever heard of Cupid? Well, my dear, she couldn't come to a better person than you to learn about him. Have you begun your parties yet? Ask me soon to a little dinner, only don't put me beside one of your horrid radicals. Since you gave Hodge his vote, the ladies' gallery has become a bear garden, a pair of radical shoemakeresses talking so loudly that it was impossible to hear any of our side i spoke to the doorkeeper but it was of no use he couldn't do anything oh poor mr samuelson lady saxon said i didn't ever suppose that he had any radical tendencies all creatures of that sort have radical tendencies lady mavis affirmed in a manner that ought to have settled the question I always fancied that he was a mild conservative, Lady Saxon said. My opinion is, Lady Mavis Redhouse gravely declared, that doorkeepers ought not to have any political ideas of their own. I do not believe that politics were meant for doorkeepers. Lady Saxon bantered her friend upon certain Primrose League proceedings in the provinces. It was evident that the Tory party depended mainly upon Lady Mavis Red House for its maintenance and consolidation. Bellarmin marveled at the frivolity of women, especially of political women. There were barbed congratulations on Lord Saxon's speech and parting allusions to coffee on the terrace. Rolf Bellarmin, watching Lady Saxon's face, fancied that he had a clue to the changes in her manner. He did not doubt that she was acquainted with the springs which moved the figures in this game of politics. It was whispered that Lord Saxon, heavy wig and unimaginative, unambitious leader of the less progressive liberals, 
was not in complete sympathy with champion's bold views on the subject of reform bellarmin suspected that whatever coup champion might be meditating he had not the absolute certainty of lord saxon's support he made a shrewd guess that champion calculated upon startling lord saxon into acquiescence or upon his power of educating his party so secretly and so rapidly that lord saxon would one day find himself in the rear and comparatively powerless but in that case what was lady saxon's attitude she was too clever to be kept in the dark there were not two opinions on the subject of lady saxon's cleverness though it was often said that she lacked self-control that she made her likes and her hates too apparent to outsiders some of her words just now in reference to champion gave the impression of unguarded and devoted admiration bellarmin had not however observed any sign of intimacy between the liberal chief and the wife of lord saxon sir victor was not met in lady saxon's drawing-room though they were of course acquaintances it would seem that their acquaintance was only superficial to be sure there had been hitherto but few opportunities for social intercourse lord saxon's marriage had taken place the last autumn but one the liberal ministry had come into short power in the following summer and during part of their term of office lady saxon had been kept out of the whirl of london life by the birth and death of her first child a son she had only taken her place as a leader of fashion in london a few months ago her social prominence had been coincident with the dawn of her friendship with bellarmin this friendship had constituted a sort of crisis in bellarmin's career he began to find out that like other men he seemed to have a dual nature he sometimes wondered whether it was to his best or his worst self that lady saxon appealed there were moments when he felt a sense of passionate revolt against her influence moments when he had thought of marriage as a possible refuge or corrective but her ascendancy remained no other woman so far had been able to enchain even temporarily the young politician's affections the political atmosphere was to him so keen and so necessary a stimulant that to love outside its radius appeared to him an impossibility unmarried girls he found painfully insipid this is a conclusion to which many a london man arrives even without the splendid contrast presented by lady saxon the whole situation was piquant there was a double charm in the fact that the lady of his admiration stood in the first rank of his opponents could she win him over dared he trust himself within the enemy's lines was she playing with him or was she in heroic earnest was she goddess or diplomatist or mere everyday excitement loving coquette all this speculation heightened the charm and danger of the position no definite word had been spoken the draft was too strong to be taken without consideration of consequences bellarmin dallied with the cup but the fumes from it were mounting lady saxon turned again to bellarmin and lightly touched his arm with her gloved finger when are you coming to see me to talk of important things to-morrow you have only to name your own time always provided that it is not an hour when the division bell is likely to ring to-morrow it is an off day at six o'clock i have a great deal to say to you about serious things your eyes keep wandering to your Stuart princess she added in a bantering tone take care remember the fate of chastelard who is that tall man with her the man with the white moustache and the scar on his forehead he looks the dignified parent in a play is he her father oh no her father is dead that is general falcon an englishman i believe who was in the austrian service and has given up everything to act as her what shall i say i really don't know prime minister master of the horse chief secretary manager factotum anything you like to call him i don't particularly want to call him anything answered lady saxon a little disdainfully i can understand what the office is 
a pretty young pretendress is that what you called her wants just such a picturesque and stately and unimpeachable sort of person to introduce her and manage her affairs oh yes one knows all that there was a tinge of bitterness in lady saxon's tone her hearer might almost have fancied that she herself had known what it was to face the world without an introducer unprotected youth and beauty are at a disadvantage in these days well i should imagine that general falcon's figure and moustache would count for ever so much with a jury of british philistines and will impress society greatly is your stuart princess going to assert her claims to the throne of england oh no said bellarmin again with more eagerness than was quite pleasing to lady saxon for it showed too strong a measure of interest in the lovely unknown i can't think that anything so absurd is dreamed of she has very sensible friends in this country i hear some of the tory catholic set and they won't let her be led into nonsense there is a notion that she has come over to claim some money or estates or something that once belonged to the ancestral stuarts you seem to be well up in her affairs have you been presented at her court not yet but i shall get an introduction i think the whole thing is most interesting do you i don't somehow i can remember the tishborne case that excited me a little at first but it became so tiresome claimants to anything are bores i would rather look at my mary stuart than at the gentleman who called himself sir roger tishborne said bellarmin no doubt lady saxon answered coldly one can't help admiring her ralph went on injudiciously i think i detest her already lady saxon said i hate shams of every kind perhaps she added with a curious burst of candour which was the characteristic of the woman because i am a good deal of a sham myself lady saxon in truth was a little out of tune when will men learn or will they never learn that women do not delight in hearing the praises of other women especially when these praises come from masculine lips that might be employed in saying more appropriate things meanwhile miss mary stuart beaton was conducted by lord stonehenge the gentleman with the van dyke beard and some members of the house of commons to the entrance of the legislative chamber in order that she might have a front view of the debate passing through the outer door between the great leather chairs where the twin doorkeepers sit one comes on a sort of hall out of which the division lobbies run the no lobby on the right of the visitor the eye on the left straight in front are the swinging brazen doors which open only to members of parliament and within which is the debating chamber itself on the extreme left of the left-hand door is a kind of niche with a small leathern seat on this seat in this niche it is the privilege of women and only women to stand they are escorted in there not more than two at a time by a member of the house and standing on that perch and looking through the plate glass encased in the brass of the door they can see mr speaker on his throne and the members of the government on the treasury bench at his right and the leaders of the opposition at his left and leaders of independent parties below the gangway the ladies gallery be it observed is above and behind the speaker's chair and miss beaton might go there for ever and not see what the occupant of the speaker's chair is like or how the house looks from the natural or pictorial point of view miss beaton had not looked upon this sight before and she ran across the tessellated pavement of the lobby with the eagerness of a girl anxious to see something new and the careless freedom of one who has got it well into her mind that she is at liberty to do anything that she likes in the way that pleases her her escort mr levin a scotch member descended from a family which had forfeited its title in the rebellion of seventeen forty five was a little behind her and her skirts were long and trailing and he was afraid of treading on them he had to plunge forward however for she was positively about opening the brass door and calmly entering the sacred precincts of the house itself where the apparition of a woman would create as much bewilderment and consternation 
as her intrusion into the mosque of omar while the services of the mahometans were going on this way please he said breathlessly not into the house this little perch this perch here oh am i to mount on that if you please do you know that you were going into the house of commons itself mary laughed not in the least abashed by the knowledge of the sacrilege she had so nearly perpetrated she mounted lightly to the perch and studied the front view of the house for a moment in silence i feel rather ridiculous here she said looking down on lord stonehenge i am like a schoolgirl mounted on a penitential stool i think i am rather too tall for this sort of perch i'll get down oh what is happening two members were rushing wildly past and thrusting their way into the house one of them was waving a telegram in his hand miss beaton remained on her perch for the moment eager to see and hear she saw the member who bore the telegram break through the groups who were standing at the bar and while the doors of the house were yet swinging open she could hear him say in quite a loud and excited tone fourteen hundred majority for trestle then there was a tremendous burst of cheering from the opposition benches which was again and again renewed it utterly bewildered a member of the government who was haranguing from the treasury bench he could not at first understand the meaning of this strange interruption did not know what had happened and stumbled hopelessly in his oration mary dropped lightly to the floor without touching lord stonehenge's reverential hand she and her escort came out into the lobby again and mr levin explained the meaning of the telegram and the cheering the election had gone in favour of the radical candidate by a large majority but that was not all the victorious candidate was tommy trussell a very advanced and audacious radical an independent eccentric sort of man but that was not all trussell had been representative of the constituency for a long time but his radical opinions had been growing more and more pronounced of late and he had been making furious attacks upon the house of lords his opponents taunted him with having betrayed his constituents and promised him that he should never get into the house again or at least for that constituency the general election whenever it came would settle him they said whereupon Tressel promptly applied for the Chiltern Hundreds, in other words, resigned his seat and came forward again as a candidate for the same place, in order to give his constituents a chance of saying whether they approved of what he had said, or done, or not. And now, behold, he is sent back to the House with an immense and wholly unexpected majority to encourage him. No wonder the Radicals cheered yet another incident occurred sir victor champion and lord saxon were passing out in deep conversation and the moment sir victor was seen all the radical members in the lobby set up a wild cheer and other radicals came rushing out of the house and joined in the cheer and soon quite a crowd formed around sir victor cheering for him as if he were the hero of the hour sir victor looked pleased lord saxon scowled what's the row about now lord saxon asked when the cheering had at last subsided oh trestle's election of course sir victor said carelessly but i don't see what we have to do with that i mean what you have to do with it why should they cheer you because trestle has been elected sir victor said nothing lord stonehenge whispered a word or two to mary who nodded assent and then he stopped the two statesmen and presented each to miss beaton lord saxon a tall heavy-jawed man with a stolid face deeply flushed a full reddish beard and a shambling groom-like way of walking felt awkward and looked it and said only a formal word or two sir victor's eyes darted upon miss beaton and fastened on her face he felt and showed the deepest interest in the meeting and before many seconds had made it clear to mary that he understood all about her history and genealogy lady saxon and bellarmine watched the movements and gestures of the little group come you had better take your turn and do homage with the rest lady saxon said she was willing to do without bellarmine now she wanted to come in the way of sir victor champion the interview between miss beaton and champion was over 
lord saxon saw his wife and came across and spoke to her i want to know why sir victor has not been to see me said lady saxon in a low rapid tone make him come here you seem annoyed saxon has anything happened nothing much talk to you by and by lord saxon said brightening a little then he turned and motioned to sir victor who was about to pass on merely lifting his hat to lady saxon my wife wants to speak to you he said lady saxon moved forward and held out her hand sir victor joined them lady saxon's opportunity had come end of volume one chapter one Volume 1, Chapter 2 of The Rebel Rose by Justin McCarthy and Rosa Campbell Prade. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 2 On the Terrace. Sir Victor was a man the first sight of whom gave one the idea that he trod the earth with a peculiarly firm tread. His walk was not a stride nor a plunge, but an assured, rapid, masterful walk each foot seeming to take a steady hold of the ground until the other had found its place sir victor moved with the air of one who believes that all he sees belongs to him he had a large forehead strongly marked features heavy eyebrows and quick gleaming eyes his face was almost smooth shaven he kept his head thrown back as he walked he was not handsome but he was commanding in appearance and few who looked at him would have thought of mentally inquiring whether he was handsome or not there was something stern something tragic about his face his forehead seemed scarred with the thunder as with marcellus in virgil's poem darksome night appeared amid all his triumph to gather its black shadow around his head women admired him that was certain admired him and were afraid of him admired him all the more because they were afraid of him he had been a very successful man thus far he had entered public life with some fortune to back him but with no aristocratic connections he had married both fortune and rank his wife had died after a year but his success was assured his marriage had been the turning point in his career now he had come to be the maker of peers and the patron even of dukes he had a consuming ambition his friends said it was a noble ambition his enemies said that it was an ambition ruinous to his country it was not a selfish ambition in the lowest sense but if it led him wrong it would be likely to do infinitely more harm than any merely selfish ambition could have wrought in such a position as that of a modern english statesman had sir victor only coveted office rank power influence for himself and been content with such acquisitions he might have had enough to sate the most greedy ambition and yet have done no great harm to anything except his own nature and his own soul but the ambition of sir victor champion was to have his own name inseparably associated in time to come with some great change wrought in the condition of his country his admirers insisted that his only desire was to have his name remembered in connection with some great good deed done by or for england but his enemies would have it that he was resolved to be remembered in history at england's expense if he could not be remembered in blessings both sides it is likely were partly right were seized of half the truth the ambition which identifies our country's glory with our own does not always regard our own glory as identical with that of our country the aspiring youth who fired the ephesian dome was only a fool for his pains or a madman it is a comfort to reflect that there are not many ambitions like his but a man of very different quality might have set fire to the temple under the impression that he was only illuminating it while inscribing his own name in letters of flame round its dome lady saxon having got her opportunity was determined not to lose it she wanted to bring sir victor champion to her side here in the full light of the house of commons lobby she had deeper and much stronger reasons for this desire 
but one of her minor and superficial reasons was to inflict a sort of punishment on bellarmin who had been thinking a great deal too much about miss beaton and her claims and her beauty we have not met for a long time sir victor lady saxon said turning her eyes upon him and then letting them droop except in the most casual and commonplace way we have not met to talk no we have not been floated together sir victor answered in a deep melodious voice which fell caressingly on her ear and made the blood rush for an instant to her cheek i am glad to find you in town lady saxon looked up again straight into his face there was something at once seductive and defiant in her glance her expression was peculiar she seemed to be commanding sir victor's attention and to be appealing at the same time to a claim upon his sentimental regard which only he and she understood lord saxon it was evident suspected no such claim his heavy head was bent showing the bull-like conformation of neck and giving him an appearance of dull obstinacy in striking contrast with the alert dominant expression of the liberal chief the eyes of both sir victor and lady saxon turned for a second upon him and met again lady saxon laughed in a forced manner but her voice faltered in spite of herself the current has drifted us together at last she said but you might have found me before look here josephine lord saxon broke in i have got to go away for a while you know i dare say champion won't mind seeing you back to the ladies gallery or the terrace if you want to go i'll meet you later on at lady dorrington's very well she answered and gave him a smile as she added that means there will be nothing much going on here and that there is to be a political caucus at the dorrington's instead saxon doesn't often go with me to an evening party lord saxon strode away i don't think i need give you the trouble of mounting up to the ladies gallery with me sir victor i have heard enough for one night and it is hot and stuffy up there why do you gaze up in that sort of way i think i had better get home and go on to lady dorrington's shall i see you there sir victor shook his head he seemed to be hesitating as to what he should say next she watched him narrowly she was eager to see whether he would take her at her word and let her go will you come for a turn on the terrace he asked at last in a low tone the night is delightful she could hardly restrain a deep breath of exultation yes thanks since you are so good indeed i told one or two women that i should be on the terrace come this way sir victor said and she swept out of the lobby with him making as she passed a parting bow to bellarmin who had just been presented to the mysterious stuart girl and who appeared by no means unhappy even though lady saxon was leaving him lady saxon and sir victor passed out of the lobby into a corridor lined on both sides with the schoolboard like numbered lockers in which members keep their papers they went through a swinging brass door on the left and made their way down a tortuous staircase darksome as that of a jail and at the bottom of this sordid staircase to another door which conducted to a stone passage on the right wheeling round to the left again they were at a gate through which they suddenly passed into all the beauty and glory of the soft night of early summer and found themselves on the terrace where the river washes the southern walls of westminster palace there was a moon shining but its brightness was dimmed by the amber glow which poured down from the library windows above and the lamps set at intervals along the balustrade illuminating the wide stone walk a fitful breeze swept up from the water the river closed in here by the two stone bridges with their cavern-like arches and triangular jets of light had a ripple on it and looked alive the reflections of the lanterns in the barges lying along the embankment seemed to dance in the depths opposite rose the great square blocks of st thomas hospital with their spectral windows and the tall grey shot tower lower down lost itself in the mist a little steamer puffing and groaning and the roar of the sharing cross train gave life and commonplace reality to the scene which otherwise had a curious solemnity and impressiveness i am always ashamed of that vile dark staircase champion said in his conventional manner as they walked up to the end and turned again and yet 
I think we ought to keep it as it is, if only for the reason that the terrace looks so much more attractive because of the caverns through which we have to get to it. Don't you think so, Lady Saxon? I have been thinking of many things since we came out, but not of that, she answered. Perhaps Sir Victor did not wish to notice the significance of her tone, or perhaps his mind was occupied with the late election and Tressel's majority, or perhaps he had thrown off the statesman for a moment and was enjoying the picturesqueness of the place and of the evening. Sir Victor Champion had a quick and vivid interest in almost everything. Certainly there was hardly anything in which he could not promptly get up a genuine interest. He had a liberal knowledge of art, science, history, poetry, romance, the acting drama, architecture, Japanese coloring, and old china. His power of throwing himself from subject to subject gave some excuse for the allegation of his enemies, that a fatal levity, a want of depth and adhesiveness, was destined to mar his best gifts and make his career dangerous to his country. He soon became conscious of the beauty of the scene, and found a pleasure in expatiating on it to Lady Saxon. As they walked along the terrace, he began pointing out to her what he regarded as the most interesting objects, and he was launching into quite an eloquent dissertation on the history of Lambeth Palace and the Lollard's Tower. Lady Saxon's bosom heaved with impatience. She had not come there to be told of the Lollard's Tower. We walked together side by side, the first time for years, she said in a low tone of impassioned remonstrance, and you can only talk to me about Lambeth Palace? Victor! Her voice dropped to the lowest, softest, most plaintive note of appeal as she looked into the statesman's face and called him by his name. He stopped and turned to her in some surprise. Lady Saxon, he was beginning to say. Lady Saxon, she repeated in a low, wistful protest. Josephine, he said. Josephine, how many years is it since I called you by that name? She did not answer. They had reached the end of the terrace and turned. Sir Victor glanced at his companion. Lady Saxon, in her splendid beauty, with her stately carriage, her arms folded in her rich mantle, and her eyes gazing earnestly into the night, had about her a suggestion of the dramatic, which was not without attraction for Sir Victor. His temperament required the stimulant of drama. He wondered what was passing in her mind. He half expected some theatrical outburst, but it did not come then. Have you noticed those thin white tracks along the latticework pattern of the pavement? she asked quietly. There are three of them. See, the middle one is very distinct. They are the marks of many footsteps, he replied, the tracks of the men who have walked up and down here, the tracks of the men who have made and are making history. You are of them, Victor. I think that if I were a writer, I could compose a poem or a satire by the inspiration of those three narrow paths. Think of the big schemes that have been worked out here in the brains of ambitious men, and think of the agonies of disappointment some of those men must have suffered as they paced these stones, when their schemes had come to nothing. Yes, said Sir Victor, you have a quick imagination, Josephine. These stones could tell many a soul's story. Think of the women who have walked here too, Lady Saxon went on, of the hopes that might be spoken and of those that might not even be whispered, the fears and the ambitions for the husband or for the lover. I wonder how much oftener for the lover, the light flirtations, the intrigues, the heart tragedies. But I don't want to talk of intrigues, the heart tragedies. Oh, I've seen enough of the House of Commons, Victor, to know that love often walks along this place masquerading as policy. Not with me, I am not one of the politicians who turn the House of Commons into the background of a flirtation. Why not? Politicians, I suppose, are but human and want some pastime in the intervals of their serious business. Mr. Bellarmine is not the only one of you who finds it here ready to hand. What makes you instance Bellarmine? He comes naturally to one's mind. People are talking of him just now. He is young handsome and a power in his way and he will be a greater power still before very long 
Remember, he is the leader of the party which turned us out of office. He has a future. You are right, said Champion thoughtfully. A woman who bound him with her chains might feel proud of her captive, said Lady Saxon. Report speaks of you as that woman, doesn't it? Is that why you have avoided me? she asked in a different tone. Let us be frank with one another. Surely we have known each other too well for masks to be necessary now. It would be more prudent to wear them, would it not, at any rate in this place, he replied, waiting till they had passed through the knots of people who were gathered about the various little tables in the middle of the terrace. Not at all, she said. No one would be surprised that I should be here with my husband's friend and leader. But tell me, why have you avoided me? Because, Josephine, I felt that there might be danger in our intimacy. Danger? she repeated. To which of us? I scarcely know. I was afraid that the position might be painful to you. Our past has some troublous associations. I thought it probable that, as Lady Saxon, you might wish that past forgotten, or at least ignored. Not one memory of it which links me with you. I cherish these associations. They are sweeter to me than rank or riches, sweeter to me than anything on this earth. They are myself. Josephine, if all that makes the good or ill of my life were to crumble into nothingness, they would remain. She paused and placed herself with her back against the balustrade, which fronted the river. The two were in shadow and far out of hearing of the merry groups scattered here and there by the tea tables. Do you ever think of those old days, Victor? She went on in a voice of smothered emotion. Those dear old days, when we were so much to each other. I have remembered them always, Josephine, with tenderness and gratitude. He, too, spoke with emotion. To a critical listener, it might have seemed only the echo of her emotion. You loved me? She asked eagerly, even though you left me. I loved you indeed, and for many a long day I missed you. But, he hesitated, you put the case harshly. Well, be frank, you owe me that. She spoke with agitated insistence. I find a greater difficulty in touching upon the past with Lady Saxon than I might have done with Madame Langenwelt. You know that Langenwelt married me after that, because I refused to accept him on any other terms, she put in coolly. I had become indispensable to him. The trade would have collapsed without me. He was ennobled? Oh, yes. A patent of nobility bought out of the proceeds of quack medicines, she laughed in an odd, tuneless laugh. It's a queer sort of career, isn't it? Not altogether unlike that of Emma Hart. Lady Hamilton, you remember, only I'm better educated. I have to thank Langenwald for that, and I'm not going to make a mess of the wind-up as she did. Good heavens! In the days when I exhibited at sixpence a head, who would have dreamed that I should ever have the right to go into dinner before your wife? Josephine, said Champion, in some embarrassment and much pity, it pains and perplexes me to hear you talk in this wild way. Your outspokenness is alarming. I beg you for your own sake. Oh, she interrupted with a gesture of her hands, as if she would fling away pretenses. Outspokenness is the most highly prized of luxuries to me. I can't afford to indulge in it often. You shouldn't grudge it to me on an occasion like this. You and I, Victor, have the faculty of appreciating a situation, as they say in the theatres. At least I used to think so. There's something dramatic about our meeting tonight, isn't there? And to be in this place, of all places, the theatre of your glory. You sacrificed me that you might play your part here, and it's only fair, now my turn has come, that I should be allowed to do a little melodramatic spouting of my own. Again she laughed. Just then some passing member took off his hat. Lady Saxon bowed. A lovely night, she remarked indifferently, and so warm for the time of year. Do we lose anything by enjoying this delicious air? Who is speaking? You have lost nothing. Only old what's-his-name hammering away still for the government— he was awfully put out by the cheers for Tommy Tressel's election. Hasn't quite recovered even yet. 
the member moved on lady saxon turned again to champion she put out her hand and touched his for a second as it rested on the balustrade you don't know how i've longed for this meeting i've dreamed of it i've rehearsed it i've she broke off with a low passionate ejaculation you don't seem moved you are your old self still impassive carried away sometimes by your intellect never by your heart and you are still your old self too he answered gently impulsive and emotional as you always were to you all this is nothing she went on bitterly a mere episode in a parliamentary session as i was in days gone by but i'm going to be something more than an episode now victor we meet on equal ground i can be of use to you i can further your projects i can be a valuable ally instead of the shame and the hindrance you once thought me <sighs> josephine your reproaches cut me like a knife his deep voice which in debate or invective was sir victor's most powerful weapon thrilled lady saxon's ear and heart think of our position then and you will admit that they are a little unjust come can we not bury the past can we not make a compact from this night to be friends dear friends and comrades you must hear first what i've got to say oh i'm not reproaching you i think i admire you for your impassiveness and the cool judgment which made even love subordinate to political ambition i always knew that i couldn't love a man unless he were my master surely your husband is a man whom you can love and who might make himself your master lady saxon threw her head back with a cynical disdainful uplifting of her chin my husband i once read of a woman of whose husband it was said that he was her slave her drudge and her convenience lord saxon is my slave and he is my convenience there was a silence between them for a few moments lady saxon was the first to break it i have never loved any man but you victor i may tell you this even though my frankness alarms you you and i are above shams i only ask you to be frank with me brutally frank if that is to tell the truth i'll be as frank with you josephine as your courage and generosity deserve that is well let us talk our minds out for a few minutes only yes i loved you victor as i can love and at first when you left me i hated you i wanted to be revenged on you then as i watched your career i admired you for what you had done i felt glad and proud that you had bought success even by the sacrifice of me at a distance i began to understand you better to see what your genius had seen so quickly and unerringly your time had come your opportunity was before you to seize or to leave it was a choice between giving up me and giving up a grand future you chose wisely you gave up me you gave up your agnes sorel your aspasia don't you think that is a pretty way of putting it she said suddenly with a scornful laugh well i thank you if you hadn't chosen so what should i be now instead of being what i am you made me lady saxon and i shall have made you dictator of england no one has ever understood me as you understand me he said with a low-toned fervor you have a noble sympathetic soul josephine you too feel that compelling force which drives our destinies and which i have always felt so strongly within me i have a mission which to me is more than love i know it i know that i too have a mission yes we stand on equal ground now victor we will fight side by side we must fight either for or against each other we breathe the same political atmosphere your life is mine the current has drifted us together you say let us make a compact from this night to be friends and comrades yes but on one condition name it whatever you ask shall be agreed to you loved me once i had great influence over you i am content to take a secondary place but i must have no rival there we will not talk of love you and i my burst of melodrama is over this only i ask you i know you too well to doubt the truth of your answer do you love any other woman i love no woman in the world josephine unless it be yourself 
Since my wife's death, I have given myself up completely to politics, and I have no thought of marrying again. The first place is yours. The second place, she corrected. I will yield the first to England, but I will not yield it to a woman. There shall be no misunderstanding. This is not a drawing-room conspiracy. I have said that we will not talk of love. Let us bury the past, then. So, the compact is made, your hand upon it. They clasped hands silently. His was cool and firm. He could feel hers through her glove, trembling and feverish. End of Volume 1, Chapter 2 Volume 1, Chapter 3 of The Rebel Rose by Justin McCarthy and Rosa Campbell Prade. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 3 Who Shall Separate Us? Now tell me of your plan, she said impulsively. What is in your mind? What are the prospects of the party? I want to understand your ambitions, your personal ambition. Personal ambition? he said doubtfully. I don't say that a man is bound to shut his mind and heart against such a feeling. No, I don't go so far as to say that. But is it not his duty to foster within himself only that truer and nobler ambition, which devotes itself to the real greatness of his country and the abiding happiness of his people? There was a ring of the House of Commons peroration which did not please Lady Saxon. "'Are you ashamed of acknowledging your personal ambition to me?' she said, turning the full light of her eyes upon his. "'Did I not always know you were ambitious? Did I not always urge you to give your ambition full play? You took me at my word then. Did I not admire you all the more? Well, yes, let it be admired. Did I not admire you all the more because of your ambition? Ah, times and things may have changed.' but I shall never forget. I have never forgotten the days when it was allowed me to share your ambition. I share no ambition now. Yet surely you have conquered for yourself a splendid a position as an Englishwoman could achieve. You are Lady Saxon. You will be Duchess of Athelstane. Yes, she answered, and the triumph is sweet to me, though sometimes, sometimes, Victor, I ask myself, whether Bohemia wasn't a pleasanter place to live in than Mayfair. I exult in it, and I scorn it at the same time. For all that sort of thing isn't my highest ambition, and never was, and you know it. But we have dropped the curtain on old scenes. My husband cares about nothing except in a dull, heavy, prosaic way. He doesn't care one straw for the highest prize and the highest fame that political life could give. I always longed to be the wife and the comrade of a fighting man. And now, well, I don't want to talk of myself. I want to talk of you. You are meditating a great stroke. I know that much. I don't ask you what it is. I only ask if I can help you in it. Help me. Without knowing what it is? Without asking? Yes, without knowing, without asking, if you wish. It will be enough for me to know that I am helping you in some scheme that holds your heart. Josephine, you deserve my full confidence, and you shall have it. Yes, I am sick of being one of a party. I am sick of compromise and cold counsel and postponement and, and surrender. I am determined to make a great radical party and to lead it as I have never yet been able to lead. The time has come to appeal to the imagination and the passion of the English people. How could such a people be enthusiastic about petty modifications of the suffrage and peddling schemes about local government and county boards? We have no longer a great party because we have no longer a great principle. I mean to appeal to the English people on behalf of the first step to the creation of a commonwealth of an educated democracy. The first step, she asked, with all the seeming of breathless interest, the abolition of the House of Lords. Let us have our sovereign and our people, the sovereign of the people, with no privileged class or chamber to intervene. 
loosed the bonds of England and let her go. Then, for the first time, we shall see what an English commonwealth is capable of attempting and achieving. We shall gather our colonies round us as the bird gathers her young. Come the three corners of the world in arms, and we shall shock them. He spoke in a tone kept purposely low, and his voice dropped to a whisper now and then as they passed in their walk some other promenaders. But his look and manner were full of enthusiasm. He always spoke like a man addressing an audience whom he has to persuade and carry with him. Have you spoken to any one of this as yet? she asked. Not as yet, at least not in any distinct way. Not to Lord Saxon? Not to Lord Saxon. He is your husband. But you won't mind my saying that he is not a man to warm to such a scheme. At least he is not a man with imagination to take to it at once. You see, it would pull down the house of which he is one day to be a member, said Lady Saxon thoughtfully. Do you know, I don't think such a consideration would influence Saxon in the least, he said. I do him that justice. I am sure that if it could only be got into his mind that it would be for the good of England, he would give the scheme his heartiest support. I hope to be able to convince him that it is for the good of England, but I don't believe it would do to flash such a proposal on him at the present moment. When it takes shape and he finds that it is a reality, he may then come to it. He will never come to it, Lady Saxon said firmly. You may make up your mind to that, Victor. Sooner or later you will have to separate from him. You think so? I am convinced of it. It might be possible, perhaps, through my influence, to pull Saxon up to a division on some general declaration of a wish for some reform of that kind. She paused. Beyond that, I doubt. Your influence over him is strong. I suppose so. I have not cared to exercise it in political matters. She seemed to be reflecting. I don't know. It might be possible to carry him over the crisis which would oust the Tories. That even would be something worth trying for. I suppose it is your idea ultimately to go to the country? Yes, when I have declared my purpose in the house. You will not take Saxon with you. There is bound to be a split of the party. Well, what then if it be strengthened from another source? At the worst, you can separate from him. You will be better without the Whigs. He looked at her earnestly, full of admiration for her courage and her quick decision. He could not help thinking to himself, if I had such a wife. I know what was passing through your mind this moment, she said. You were thinking how it would be with you if you had a wife with courage and ambition. I was indeed. How did you know? I knew. Oh, well, because I was thinking at that moment, if I had a husband with courage and ambition— well, I can help you, I think, Victor. I should welcome help from you. I know there is one man whom you would like to bring to your side, a very different sort of man from my husband. There is one man, Champion said slowly, to whom I have even made a sort of overture, because he has talents and imagination and any amount of courage and, I presume, ambition, and because he has a mind free from stupid tradition and inane party prejudice. Yes, we mean the same man, she said composedly. Are you sure, he said with a certain degree of hesitation. We both mean Mr. Bellarmine. Yes, you were right just now when you said he had a future. I think highly of him. He is forming a party which he has purposely pledged to nothing but a name, and I do not see why progressive Toryism and educated democracy should not be accepted as meaning one and the same thing. Lady Saxon looked keenly into his face to see whether he was speaking these words in irony or sarcasm, but he was not. He was quite in earnest. He had little of the humorist in him. He was considering, in all gravity, whether the two designations might not, by bold and clever manipulation, be made out to mean the same thing for political purposes. "'What has Mr. Bellarmine said?' she asked. "'Hardly anything so far. "'Of course, you didn't speak to him yourself?' 
oh no that would never do it is too early for that i got a man to open the thing to him in a tentative sort of way who was the man victor tell me the manner in which she took possession of his confidence had a certain fascination for him he had for so long been such a lonely man that her frank assumption of camaraderie and companionship had a sweet and soothing sound in his ears of course i will tell you it was tressel that man victor you have made a mistake bellarmin would never treat as serious anything coming through tressel i believe mr tressel is profoundly serious i think he showed it by his pluck in resigning and standing another contest sir victor said looking at her with puckered brows he did not like being told that he had made a mistake and especially such a mistake very possibly i know little or nothing about him you probably know the real man but the world does not take him seriously and mr bellarmin would not have any way of knowing that you had got at the man's true self no bellarmin would not open his mind to him you must try again and through someone else you are the leader now not i he said with a smile that gave a peculiar sweetness to his melancholy face well josephine tell me the man you would recommend i don't recommend any man i don't think it's a man's office i recommend a woman the smile passed from his face and was succeeded by a look of wonder a woman he said slowly a woman victor the one woman who could be trusted in anything that concerned you i offer you my own wits such as they are for this purpose let me negotiate with mr bellarmin see there he is she stopped suddenly and made champion also stop she looked toward the doorway of stone through which one comes on to the terrace from the interior of the house bellarmin was coming out escorting miss beaton and miss beaton's retinue a peculiar light flashed in lady saxon's eyes as she saw the group you know who the lady is sir victor said in a low tone oh yes i have heard a woman whose friends tell her she is the legitimate queen of england what childish absurdity in days like these too if bellarmin should become devoted to her sir victor said she will not be likely to inspire him with much inclination for the abolition of the house of lords and the cause of a democratic commonwealth lady saxon looked curiously at him once again wondering whether he was not speaking in satire but no sir victor was quite in earnest he was considering within himself whether it might not be to the disadvantage of his position if bellarmin were to be taken captive by the feminine representative of divine right and the cause of legitimacy we must intervene lady saxon said with alacrity and emphasis he has had no time yet to be influenced by her he never saw her until to-night perhaps up to this moment sir victor had not been very cordial in his reception of lady saxon's generous offer champion was never much of a believer in the use of the petticoat in politics in spite of his asseveration to lady saxon it was said that more than once in his life he had been strongly under the influence of some woman but that influence had not shown itself in his policy now however as he looked at miss beaton and at bellarmin together and saw how beautiful she was and how young she was he did begin to admit to himself that the intervention of a brilliant and fascinating woman like lady saxon would have some advantage he saw that her eyes were lighted already with the flame of battle he admired her he felt a pride and a new delight in her professed devotion to him they continued their walk you accept my service victor lady saxon asked most cordially i put my trust fully in you speak to bellarmin tell him as much as you like or as little and we are friends and comrades once more friends and comrades once more who shall separate us just then they turned again and came towards miss beaton and bellarmin end of volume one chapter three Volume One, Chapter Four of *The Rebel Rose* by Justin McCarthy and Rosa Campbell Pray. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter Four, Mary Beaton. 
a bright gleam of interest lighted up mary beaton's eyes when lord stonehenge presented bellarmin she had been hearing a good deal lately of the bold brilliant young political freelance but she had not remembered just at that moment that he was so young and it was with a pleased surprise that she saw the handsome well-shaped well-dressed youth brought to her notice as mr rolfe bellarmin her very first words much more abrupt than ceremonious were sweeter to bellarmin's ear and heart than the most courtly turn of compliment mr rolfe bellarmin i am delighted but i never thought you were so young and you have done so much their eyes met and hers were all brightness and vivacious kindliness he felt his cheeks flush with a strange feeling half modesty half mere delight her frank sweet expression seemed to single him out at once with special interest she held out her hand to him and he bent over it with the deference he would have shown to the princess of a reigning house his instinct at once told him that thus he must meet the free and friendly graciousness of her reception he spoke a few words of gratefulness of gratification that she had heard of him and he addressed her as madame he had heard lord stonehenge do so and he assumed that this was done in recognition of her illustrious birth her claims and her peculiar position and bellarmin did not find that it qualified or compromised his allegiance to the sovereign of england to give to this beautiful interesting and most friendly creature any title which her friends wished to adopt for her and which she was willing to receive mary beaton really felt much interested in him he was young like herself and there was a glance in his eye which spoke of a vivacity somewhat wanting in those who chiefly surrounded her yes i have heard of you she said and of your party of young progressives i like anything fresh and original mr bellarmin and i am afraid she said in a somewhat lower tone that i have a leaning towards anything which is called young she threw a somewhat mischievous glance backward at an elderly lady with a prim face and white hair dressed a la marquise who stood behind her and at the stately soldierly like old man whom bellarmin had described to lady saxon as her factotum general falcom was gazing at her intently and surprised her glance a sudden gleam shot from his eyes and for a moment transformed his calm severe face giving it an expression of fierceness almost of malignity it was as though he interpreted and resented miss beaton's playful look both mary and bellarmin were struck by this unexpected fire mary laughed lightly now you wouldn't think that general falcon was touchy on the subject of his years she said in a low tone but i assure you he is as vain as my dear lady struthers who will tell you if you ask her why her hair turned grey so prematurely she shook her head in an amused manner at the general who bent his ceremoniously but did not speak all the same mr bellarmin i did not expect to find you so young mary went on it's such a strange thing with all you english statesmen and politicians you were all so old i mean the others are all so old i am told of some one who is said to be a rising politician still quite young and i see a man of forty forty-five or fifty perhaps look at lord saxon i always heard of him as a young man and look she shrugged her shoulders with a pretty movement of wonder and protest yes we think lord saxon quite a youthful and rising politician replied bellarmin and then he added with a glance toward lady saxon and the liberal chief who were moving off to the terrace there's sir victor oh tell me about sir victor mary cried eagerly it doesn't seem to matter with him whether he is young or old i've heard and read all kinds of things about him i want to know why he has got the nickname of lucifer it came out of a joke of tommy trussell's answered bellarmin champion was making a speech in one of his most highly wrought moods just a trifle too highly wrought perhaps and he was glorifying his own political career and showing how absolutely consistent it was my mission is to bring light he exclaimed and then tommy trussell was heard to murmur dreamily the one word lucifer so the house laughed and it stuck to champion but i thought mr trussell was a devoted follower of sir victor champion's 
was not that why they cheered sir victor so much just now oh yes but tressel likes to have his fun with champion's little weaknesses all the same he does champion real service he will do anything for him almost and he pays himself with a laugh every now and then another man would expect a baronetcy or a privy councillorship or a place in the administration or a peerage tressel cares for none of these things he considers himself amply repaid by being allowed to make fun of his chief sometimes quite a court jester mary said scornfully well one doesn't altogether despise chico the jester replied bellarmin but tressel is much more than a mere jester he is one of the most disinterested public men i know a man ought to have ambition a high ambition i mean i am attracted by sir victor champion he has a high ambition everyone says yet it may be a little wearisome sometimes to those around mary spoke in a different tone as if her mind had been drawn along some new line of thought general falcon has great ambition for me and it wearies me sometimes i think perhaps i should like mr tressel now and then to come and say amusing things and make me laugh her manner touched bellarmin there seemed to him something curiously pathetic in the position of this young girl she must be lonely he thought all her views of life must be strangely coloured by the conditions under which she had been brought up he had an odd desire to talk to her about herself to get at what she really felt and thought and hoped for there is lord stonehenge mary said suddenly now he is young but yet he is so grave and serious that i would never dare to approach him with the frivolity of youth i am afraid you were very much shocked just now lord stonehenge she added turning towards him when i was so near blundering into the very midst of the house of commons not so shocked as mr levin who has an intense reverence for the forms and traditions of the house said lord stonehenge smiling in his grave sweet manner besides you have an ancestral claim madame to a place on certain occasions in another house mary smiled we mustn't bring mr bellarmin into our traitorous schemes i see he is thinking already of tower hill and the block i think nothing would be more delightful than to die on tower hill bellarmin answered that would be dying like a gentleman like a brave loyal englishman of a better time than ours is that the faith of the progressive tories mary asked do you speak for your party mr bellarmin or only for yourself you see i have learned something of your political phraseology already meanwhile general falcon and lady struthers who was miss beaton's gouvernante chaperone mistress of the robes or such like anomalous functionary had been communing together madame expressed herself anxious to see the terrace lord stonehenge said lady struthers is the present an appropriate time for madame's wish to be gratified just a moment my good struthers madame said apparently in no impatient anxiety for the terrace i want you to tell me mr bellarmin are there any of your celebrities in the lobby just now lord stonehenge has just been saying that there are not any general falcon observed and lord stonehenge knows everybody on the contrary lord stonehenge gravely interposed i know very few i seldom come here mr bellarmin is ever so much a better guide there is no one i'm afraid said bellarmin miss beaton studied the lobby what a strange-looking venerable old man i never saw a face like his before who is he he is a celebrity surely yes in a sense replied bellarmin he is an odd sort of person that is old clarence greenleaf he has sat for one and the same constituency for fifty-seven years he has never spoken in the house there is a tradition that he once presented a petition he boasts that he has never missed a division the house is his home it is all the world to him he has neither kith nor kin he has never married he knows everybody a little and nobody well he likes to make the acquaintance of any one who is a celebrity or is even talked about he calls himself a liberal but in reality he has no politics i see him looking at you with intense interest i have no doubt he is planning in his mind how he may get presented to you poor old man exclaimed mary to whom the picture seemed a pathetic illustration of the life of the house of commons 
will you present him may i oh yes if he cares about it he will only be too delighted you may be sure that he knows all about you already bellarmin crossed the lobby and immediately returned with mr greenleaf who came along making a succession of solemn bows and had taken off his hat the moment he first put himself in motion madame has been kind enough to say that she wishes you to be presented to her madame is all graciousness the old man said in a thin reedy voice and again bowing lowly before mary i had the great honour of knowing madame's father he sat for a while in this house before he succeeded madame's honoured grandfather in the title i had the honour of seeing madame herself when madame was a child in the palace of my illustrious friend the late grand duke of schwalbenstadt may i trust that madame will grace and favour us by making a long stay in england which is indeed her country in some sense england i hope is my country in every sense mr greenleaf mary said i was not born here but it is my country it was the country of my ancestors madame cannot claim the country more eagerly than the country claims her and he bent again as he might to a queen on her throne then mary bowed and so to speak dismissed him the old gentleman went away delighted with himself he had contrived to let her know he thought that he understood her position and her claims and without compromising himself had almost given it to be understood that on the whole he rather favoured them than otherwise in his secret heart mary for her part was amused i think mr greenleaf managed his part very prettily she said he almost made a profession of true allegiance to me but i saved him from compromising himself with the hanoverian people i stopped him just in time you have made him very happy said bellarmin he will become quite a figure at every dinner party for the next few weeks on the strength of this interview with you the young man laughed softly as he spoke but his laugh had something tender in it and was rather the outcome of that curious compassion he was beginning to feel than of any sense of amusement at the unconscious assumption of the young pretendress at any rate she is perfectly sincere he thought i am glad she has faith in herself miss beaton's eyes roved round in eager curiosity now they looked up at the groined ceiling now down at the tessellated pavement and at the inscription in old english letters which surrounded it general falcon she said imperiously why haven't i been here before i want to go all over the house it can be very easily arranged madame returned falcon i am sure that mr levin or mr bellarmin are entirely at your service madame put in bellarmin would you like to see the library and the reading-rooms now before we go on to the terrace the little party moved along the corridor bellarmin and mary in front falcon closely following them mary examined the oak presses as she passed and looked in at the open doors and asked questions about everything sometimes turning to falcon as to her recognized protector more often to bellarmin i like this place she said it excites me watching people and things here is like seeing the heart of england beating isn't it so yes replied bellarmin his eyes fixed upon her here is the heart of a great nation mary went on enthusiastically here in westminster oh i i wish she stopped abruptly what do you wish asked bellarmin never mind you people who are at the core of it all and who sit here and make the laws don't seem to notice or to care about the wrong and misery that are crying at the very doors of this westminster they were about to enter the library and had just passed the door that leads into the newspaper room and the members tea room beyond at the side of this door the side nearest to the library stands a desk beside which members often stop to read letters or to write a hasty note or to confer with somebody let us not go in just yet bellarmin said i can't take you into the library under these new regulations let us stop here a moment i am anxious to hear you on this subject he was really much interested in miss beaton's views and was glad to have a chance of knowing how the condition of things in england impressed her the little party came to a stand accordingly oh i haven't anything to say which can be new to you i have only my own crude notions i judge hastily perhaps by what i see well for instance 
it was only yesterday we walked about some of your streets general falcon and i i like to go about among the people in that way for how could i do any good if i did not know we had a friend with us a lady who is interested in that work and we went into some alleys and houses oh mr bellarmin mary stopped short and clasped her hands excitedly well he said it chills me to the marrow it makes my blood freeze to see these hideous contrasts this terrible poverty that lavish wealth it's like death behind a carnival mask haunting one everywhere when one is driving in the street in the park when one is going into smart parties oh do you remember the face of that man last night she turned to general falcon and then again to bellarmin a man was trying to sleep as he cowered in the doorstep of a fine house and the woman the girl the child who was trying to get coppers by sweeping a crossing oh what sights for a christian country thank god that i am not really queen of england no though i wish i were i wish i were queen of england only for one day as somebody was caliph of baghdad or wherever it was i would do something for the poor i would do something too for the rich for while things go on as they are in england look you she said sinking her voice to a low grave tone these rich cannot enter the kingdom of heaven what can they do they can't help being rich falcon said abruptly no can't they can't help being rich and people as good as they starving in thousands all round them at their gates on their doorsteps and they can't help being rich she cried in her childish way the tears starting to her eyes i feel sometimes when i am sitting down to my good dinner when i am putting on my jewels as if i were the most cruel and heartless girl who had ever lived and i can do so little they will let me do so little i think to myself how it will be with me when i stand up before the judgment seat shall i be asked how much have you or how much have you given away it is quite true said lady struthers in an aside to lord stonehenge the misery in london preys upon her frightfully she gives away all that she can she would have sold her jewels if it had not been represented to her that they were heirlooms bellarmin heard the aside mary had moved to another table he followed her but money given away in thoughtless charity does no good to any one the giver or the receiver he said thoughtless charity no but could true charity ever be thoughtless and see what you have made of it what they have made of it whoever they are who are always preaching against thoughtless charity yes and practising very faithfully against it i haven't the slightest doubt what have they made of things and of life here in england here in london could any thoughtless charity make a worse hand of it can you get me to believe that the condition of things is right and satisfactory in which one woman spends a thousand pounds in flowers for a single ball the show and pleasure of one night and another just as good as she gets three halfpennies yes they told me it is so three halfpennies a penny and a half for making a shirt end of volume one chapter four volume one chapter five of the rebel rose by justin mccarthy and rosa campbell prayed this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter five if you were queen what would you do if you were queen bellarmin asked he was deeply interested in her vivid faith in her own power to settle much perplexed economical problems i can't tell you off-hand mary answered with a certain self-sufficing imperiousness of manner but i can tell you this mr bellarmin i would do something i would devote my life and my thoughts and my care to it i would set my heart on settling the question and i should end in settling it i would never rest happy while a single honest englishman or englishwoman was starving for want of employment and hundreds of thousands of other englishmen and englishwomen who never wrought one stroke of work in their lives were sinking into the mere corruption of too much wealth yes if i were queen queens can do so much 
things are very bad in america in the united states lord stonehenge struck in the contrast between extreme of wealth and extreme of poverty is equally terrible there i am told yes mary answered shifting her ground with quick sweet woman-like disregard of logical consistency but then america has not a queen everything is left there to drag on at the mercy of politicians and political economists and all that and there is no presiding influence no presiding sympathy to intervene and give a chance to something better well i should try if i had the chance now nobody cares it is every one for himself and god for us all only fancy god being for the set of wretches who were every one for himself she flung her handkerchief on the desk with the air of a sovereign who throws down his truncheon to signify that enough has been done in a duel that the fight is over and that the combatants must now be parted there was nothing new in what she had been saying bellarmin admitted that to himself her logic was crude her facts were faulty it was all just the same sort of thing that he had heard many a woman say before almost every sweet-natured intelligent woman in countries like ours has said the same at one time or another the fact is that women never did and never will acknowledge the absolute authority of economic law the intelligent women do not go the length of saying that there is no fixed economic law only they have the impertinence to suggest that men have not yet got an absolutely certain knowledge of the exact interpretation of the law woman is by nature a mutinous creature and on this question of political economy she will not allow herself to admit that her husband or her brother or her father is infallible they are a poor lot these women they can never reason says mr hunks m p after a futile attempt to persuade his wife that the eternal conditions of human society justify starvation and the three halfpence for the making of a shirt bellarmin was not without some secret misgiving about the woman's view of the subject he fancied sometimes that she had got hold of her half of the truth and that the man had not quite got hold of his and that some day or other an attempt must be made by statesmanship to bring the two halves together in the construction of a sound social system but even if bellarmin did not admit to the full all the feminine reasoning of mary stuart beaton he was none the less charmed with her fresh sweetness of nature her generous impulsiveness her bold self-confidence her simplicity her quick and flashing sympathy a man he thought felt braver and better for talking to her for hearing her talk can you do nothing in the house of commons mr bellarmin she suddenly asked nothing nothing whatever nothing at least that you would call anything i am speaking now of what we call independent members they can't do anything even if we saw our way to any proposal and we don't what could we do put on some motion by the favor of the ballot for a tuesday night and if we succeeded in getting an early date bring on our motion and be counted out but why don't you all stand together you independent members and not be counted out because he answered gravely we english are a practical people mary said no more and they passed into another corridor and after some further wandering and an attempt to hear part of a speech from the back row of chairs in the ladies gallery they went down to the terrace as they were going down a telegram was thrust into bellarmin's hand he glanced at it this is what it contained am coming up to town tonight shall be at spinola's be sure to go want to talk to you Tressel. lady struthers thought all that she heard about politics in england very shocking it was her first visit to the house of commons and she asked many questions wanted to know who the men in wigs were sitting at the table and why members got up and walked this way and that like a flock of sheep when the bell rang and if it were a division why weren't sir victor champion and mr bellarmin in their places and since it was all of no consequence what was the good of wasting people's time for nothing general falcon who in a quiet way was amassing a good deal of information had already made a mental note of tressel as a man who ought to be propitiated on the subject of mary beaton's claims to the forfeited stuart property 
These two principal members of Miss Beaton's household differed in one important respect. Falcon was reticent and made his observations in secret. Lady Struthers blurted out her opinions with an undesirable lack of discretion. People who knew both looked upon Lady Struthers as a harmless, good-natured person, but there were many who regarded Falcon with vague dislike and distrust. As has been seen, Lady Saxon and Sir Victor were passing by when Mary Beaton and her companions came out through the massive doorway onto the terrace. Mary noticed that Lady Saxon paused in her walk, noticed also the look she turned on Bellarmine. An involuntary movement on Bellarmine's part also struck the young girl. She was going to ask him a question about the regal-looking woman whom she had remarked in the lobby, and whom she concluded to be a person of consequence, when General Falcon pressed rather eagerly forward. "'Mr. Bellarmine, can you tell me who is that lady?' "'That is Lady Saxon,' replied Bellarmine, "'the wife of Lord Saxon, to whom we spoke in the lobby.' "'The wife of Lord Saxon? Is it possible? "'She has not been long married.' "'About two years,' answered Bellarmine carelessly. "'Why do you ask?' "'Oh, for no particular reason. "'I fancied that I recognized her as a lady whom I have seen in Schwalbenstadt. "'Lady Saxon's first husband was a German,' said Bellarmine. "'He turned to Miss Beaton. "'Do you admire Lady Saxon? "'She is considered one of the most beautiful women in London.' "'Yes, I think her very beautiful,' answered Mary, a little constrainedly. "'But I don't know that I like her.' They say, Mr. Bellarmine, that women are not fair judges of one another. I am quite sure that I should not like to have Lady Saxon for an enemy, or even for a friend. The words made Bellarmine color a little, and wince, almost start. They touched him, even hurt him, in a curious way. Miss Beaton saw that she had given him pain. Oh, I ask your pardon, she said earnestly. I am so sorry. I forgot that Lady Saxon was a friend of yours. I really meant nothing, Mr. Bellarmine. It was only my absurd, impulsive way of saying right out any nonsensical idea that comes into my mind. I hope you will always speak to me in the same frank way, Bellarmine said, he too, yielding to sudden impulse, and he spoke the words with a certain emotion which a little surprised Miss Beaton. General Falcon was standing near them, looking impatient. Just then a soft sheet of summer lightning enveloped the scene, and there came a long, low roll of thunder. "'Come, madame,' General Falcon said imperatively. "'It is time to leave this place. A storm is coming.' "'My good Falcon, there is no need for haste. We are near enough to shelter if rain should come.' "'But you ought not to remain any longer,' Falcon remonstrated. "'Madame will perceive, too, that she is keeping Mr.' this gentleman, from his parliamentary duties, which I have no doubt are highly important. General Falcon spoke in accents of hardly suppressed passion. Miss Beaton looked up surprised. A cloud gathered on her face. "'You must forgive the zeal of my friend General Falcon,' she said, turning to Bellarmine. "'He is always somewhat too anxious about me.' "'General Falcon's zeal for you doesn't need any excuse,' Bellarmine answered. It can only recommend him to all your friends. Bellarmine really felt what he said. He was not in the least angry with Falcon. The acquaintance is too short for Mr. Bellarmine to presume to call himself one of Madame's friends, Falcon interposed rudely. Bellarmine now, indeed, felt angry, and was on the point of expressing his anger in words. Miss Beaton stopped him with a look. You are forgetting yourself, General Falcon, she said coldly and with decision. I have to ask Mr. Bellarmine, as a favor to me, to forgive your rudeness and to believe, as I do, that it is not meant to give offense. At this moment, Lady Saxon, who had again passed, stopped and turned. Her keen eyes and quick perceptions took in the whole of the little group. She saw the embarrassed look of Bellarmine, the enforced composure of Miss Beaton, the smoldering fury in Falcon's eyes. Another flash of summer lightning illumined and emphasized the living picture. Lady Saxon could not, of course, understand its meaning, but it told her of some existing elements of discord, and she was pleased. She marked out Falcon from that moment as a man to be studied. Then, with the manner of one who yields to a sudden impulse, she advanced towards the group. Lord Stonehenge was with her now, as well as Sir Victor Champion, 
she came directly to where miss beaton stood i have asked lord stonehenge to make me known to miss beaton she said my husband i believe has already had the honour of being presented bellarmin felt surprised it was not like lady saxon to seek acquaintanceship with one of her own sex in this informal fashion her manner was graceful and winning and mary frankly accepted the courtesy though with a certain dignity which was observed by both sir victor and bellarmin there was some desultory conversation about the beauty of the night and the summer lightning and the debate which was going on general falcon and lady struthers were presented and then lady saxon and bellarmin fell back a few steps she asked him to take her to her carriage and bade good-night to miss beaton saying that she hoped to be permitted to call upon her shortly i dare say we shall meet later on this evening she said to rolfe where are you going i am going to madame spinola's he answered madame spinola's repeated lady saxon i don't know madame spinola i didn't suppose that you ever found your way into bohemia lady saxon bellarmin said it's a country that befriended me when i was a homeless waif and i owe it some gratitude no i'm afraid i shan't turn up at any of the places that you were going to this evening good night she said there was something caressing in her voice the footman was holding her carriage door she stepped forward then turned her head back looking at him half over her shoulder remember to-morrow she murmured still in the same caressing manner presently she had stepped into the carriage the door was closed and she was whirled off rolfe bellarmin lingered a few minutes in the stone-paved square at the entrance to the ladies gallery he took out a cigarette and lighted it and said a few words to the policeman on duty it was getting late now the deep notes of big ben sounded the quarter to eleven late that is to outsiders for busy fashionable women with a ball or two on hand as well as for members of the house of commons real night business was only just beginning two or three broughams were drawn up in the courtyard one of these which had the appearance of a carriage let out by the season bellarmin conjectured to be that of miss beaton he wondered if she too were going on to some ball and decided that she was not mary stuart in her black velvet gown and coif like bonnet seemed an incongruous figure against the unpoetic background of london society why did she dress like her far-off ancestress was it part of the masquerade part of the game or only a girlish whim was she rich or a mere high-born adventuress with whose shadowy claims general falcon was trading rolfe recalled all that he had heard or fancied now that he had heard of miss beaton's parentage and connections no he felt sure that she was if not rich certainly not poor he had a dim recollection of having read in some book of memoirs of an estate left to the stuarts in the latter days of anne by a devotee of their cause and confiscated by the hanoverians there was some reality then in the claims she had come to urge and about which in talking to lady saxon he had by some momentary freak seemed to know a great deal more than he actually did know the girl interested him she was old-world poetic she appealed to the romantic vein in his nature she stood out in his imagination like some moonlit statue that once seen is never forgotten as he strolled irresolutely down the covered archway he had a vague intention of going to seek her a curious consciousness of disloyalty to lady saxon checked the impulse and he crossed into palace yard a sudden contrast to the cloistral enclosure he had left there seemed something at once fantastic and workaday in the aspect of the place a blending of the past and the present of the ideal and the actual bellarmin had in his nature a greater admixture of the dreamer than he would have been ready to admit he was struck by this thought to-night the great square with its innumerable lamps its bustle and movement the men passing to and fro the carriages and cabs the newspaper messengers hurrying with latest intelligence to the shed where their horses stood saddled and then the majestic walls of the building the spectral clock tower rising aloft the grey solemn time-stained abbey which appeared so little in keeping with the roar and rush of the london night all had been suddenly magnetized for him by some new spell of association and had been perfumed by that essence of poetry which ever since helicon's diviner days is most often distilled by a woman 
but bellarmin did not trace his vague sense of intoxication to its subtle source he believed that what he felt was a keen thrill of triumph in the success which had made him part of this throbbing life around him and which had set him here to help in weaving the threads of england's destinies it seemed only the other day that he had come to westminster an obscure youth with apparently no chance of ever distinguishing himself and now now i've turned out the liberals and champion is making overtures to me he said to himself and then another thought set his pulses tingling lady saxon's boudoir was a dangerous place lady saxon was beautiful it was her whim to play the game of political intrigue he knew this he had often told himself that forewarned is forearmed but already his fancy was reveling in anticipation of the morrow of the hour in her companionship he half hated himself for this eager longing there were times when he almost hated lady saxon for her influence over him her cool fencing excited and irritated him it was alternate allurement and recoil pastime becoming conflict with an effort he wrenched his mind away from lady saxon he had much of the typical schoolboy's enjoyment of contrast and variety now for bohemia he said half aloud he delighted to jump from serious debate to rollicking fun from the atmosphere of pathos and poetry into that of club gossip and drawing-room frivolity he got into a hansom and gave the order to drive to madame spinola's end of volume one chapter five volume one chapter six of the rebel rose by justin mccarthy and rosa campbell prayed this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter six madame spinola at home the countess spinola lived in a small old-fashioned house in the buckingham palace region the countess spinola was an english woman married to an italian and it was well understood that he and she were poor at least that they had but slender means according to all received traditions of satire and fiction count spinola ought to be in such circumstances a mere sham nobleman and his english wife ought to be a woman of real position sacrificed to him but it was not so in this case count spinola was unquestionably a man of high and genuine rank and nobody quite knew what his english wife had been some people said she had been an actress some whispered that she had been an artist's model and that if you wanted to appreciate to the full her claims to be considered beautiful you had only to go to the south kensington museum and see the painting of andromeda chained to the rock which was done by the lately deceased chief of romantic school of art but all this was only talk and no one had anything substantial to say against madame spinola except that she was very pretty that she was poor and that nevertheless she and her husband managed to see a good deal of society their parties might indeed be said to represent a certain phase of london society and a book professing to describe london life would certainly not be complete unless it took in madame spinola and her set the countess spinola was very pretty and oddly enough she the englishwoman was dark-haired and her husband the italian was fair not many women came to madame spinola's parties perhaps she was too pretty to make women anxious to go near her a lady of fashion once laid it down as a canon of good taste that no really well-bred hostess ought to be prettier than every one of her guests the reason why women kept away from the place could not be because madame spinola flirted a little now with this man and now with that for she did not flirt nearly so much as many ladies did whose drawing-rooms nevertheless had in them more petticoats than pantaloons and indeed madame spinola's flirtations were very general and so evenly distributed as almost altogether to disarm ill-nature itself still the women did not come much only a few came who were well known to madame spinola who were regular pals of hers and would have kept her, her through thick and thin and some like a certain mrs rivers who would go to any house at which there was a man to be seen or a supper to be eaten madame spinola however did not seem much to miss the fair sex her house was a rendezvous for agreeable lively distinguished and sometimes fast men she could hardly be said to give formal parties 
she never issued invitations but she was at home on certain nights in the season and her friends were free to go and see her then and one might come very late for the meetings were well kept up if she anywhere met a man she liked she told him he might come and see her on any or all of her evenings and then if he was on the free list so to speak if he wished to bring some friend into the circle he asked madame's permission and it was generally given and the permission put him too on the free list if a man only came once in the season the countess was satisfied but if he did not she gave him to understand that he was not to come any other season there were some faithful friends who came every night regularly and stayed till the very end there was always a little supper very late in a rather small room below stairs madame spinola passed round among her guests the word who should go first when so many had remained as to make it impossible that all should sit down together her principle was to send down first those she least cared for they did not usually sit very long over their supper having the disturbing consciousness that others among whom was the hostess herself were waiting for a turn then those who came last stayed over their supper and their drinks as long as they liked and cigars and cigarettes were lit up and people made themselves really happy the supper was simple but in its way it was dainty delicious little sandwiches gelatins and the appetizing dish which one meets with so often in new york but is so rare in its appearance in london the real chicken salad there was good sound claret there were some excellent wines in huge straw-sheathed flagons there were brandies and soda there was really fine whisky madame spinola kept no manservants the waiting was done by two bright and quick-witted as well as nimble-handed tuscan girls it was said that people sometimes played and played highly and deeply at count spinola's house and this was talked of as a possible explanation of madame spinola's frequent entertainments madame spinola wore diamonds fine diamonds who gave them to her folks inquired with meaning glances and shrugs if there was any gaming indulged in at the spinolas it was certain that bellarmin never saw it although at one time he was a frequent guest perhaps the explanation of the entertainments is as simple as that of many a social mystery count spinola although he had but a small income certainly had an income and a regular one and the pair had no children madame was still very young very lively very fond of company and her husband was very fond of her is it not within the limits of bare possibility that she may have liked to spend some of her income on a succession of little parties cheap in themselves but which often brought her in the season a company that the riches of the richest city stockbroker might have failed to attract to his vast dining table is it not credible that count spinola may have been glad to be able to afford his wife this one pleasure which she so loved and may even have been willing to pinch himself in other ways that she might not be deprived of this enjoyment may he not have admitted to himself that he owed her some recompense for having bound her youth and her charms up with his elderly companionship but this is not the fashion of reasoning in vanity fair now mr bellarmin don't you attempt to go away without supper and don't attempt to go down with the first lot i won't have it you must stay and you must wait for me i haven't seen you for ever so long and tommy tressel is coming and he's the hero of the hour is he not i am in rare good fortune to-night now your word i pledge myself bellarmin said to take you down to supper hear me swear bellarmin was very popular in this circle and indeed in most circles his good spirits his bright ways his flow of talk his utter freedom from pretentiousness made him a favorite he never patronized any man and he did not carry the tone of the house of commons always in his voice he never took account in private life of what a man's politics might be and therefore he was welcome to out-and-out -out radicals as well as to no surrender tories and even to pale-blooded lymphatic whigs with whom lady saxon notwithstanding he was naturally less congenial one of those who now rushed up most vociferously to greet him was big ross bingley a journalist the noisiest the cheeriest of men with his big frame his big head his big beard his big voice his big laugh ross bingley was a living type of bigness 
He had been a war correspondent and a resident foreign correspondent, and now he was settled down in London journalism. He hated numbers of men whom he did not know, for Bingley, unlike most journalists, was a fierce politician, but he liked everyone he knew. He could spend hours in execrating Champion's most devoted followers, and if he had been brought into personal relationship with Champion, he would doubtless soon have come to adore him too. He could talk many languages and play on many instruments, and had been in love a great many times in a great many countries. Now a London home and a wife claimed him as their own. His pith helmet, which he used to wear in his war correspondence days, was, metaphorically speaking, a hive for bees, like that of the noble old warrior in the poem, and Mrs. Bingley ruled him. "'Now, Mr. Bellarmin, you must talk to me. No, no, you must not go away, at least not just yet. I have not seen you for ever so many ages.' This was spoken by Mrs. Rivers, who caught his arm to emphasize her appeal. Bellarmin protested that there was nothing he so longed for in existence as a talk with Mrs. Rivers, and as he looked into the dimming beauty of her eyes and heard her voluble tongue going, he began to moralize mentally and to preach to himself a little wan and outworn sermon on the nothingness of human hopes. Short, comparatively, as had been his experience of London society, he could almost remember Mrs. Rivers a beauty. She was one of the first of the galaxy of professional beauties who were publicly recognized as such, and dubbed with that name of doubtful compliment. When Bellarmin heard of her, she was the central star of almost every social constellation. Men of rank and fashion and wealth and genius swarmed around her, scrambled to get near her, were proud to be seen with her, even to be seen saluting her in the park. Now nobody cared twopence about her. She had to ask men to come and sit by her. She had to insist on their talking to her. She had to get up and cross the room to arrive at some particular man who would not arrive at her. In her bright days, she had never troubled herself about women, and now women never troubled themselves about her. What had happened in the meantime? She had gone off. She had gone down. She had gone out. But there were others who had started as professional beauties with her who were keeping the field as professional beauties still, she had not quite lost her charms, although her luster had faded and her figure had got too firmly set and her movements were stiffer, at all events were less supple than they used to be. She had had a quiet separation from her husband. They did not get on very well together. There was no scandal. She had never been seriously talked about with any man, but after her separation from her husband, she got into a way of drifting about the social world, which was fatal to her. She had to make herself too cheap. The allowance from her husband was small, and she knew that if she gave cause for scandal, it would be stopped altogether. In the days when her beauty was fresher and more prized, she could, of course, have found admirers who would have lavished money upon her. But if she was not good enough to depend on goodness, neither was she bad enough to depend on badness. She must have society, the society of men. She must have admiration or at all events the profession of admiration, and she made this too plain. Men began not to care about her, began to avoid her, to think her a bore, even to speak of her as a bore. Women sometimes talked of her as poor old Mrs. Rivers, and she was hardly outside forty yet. When she went to a party, which in the season she did every night in the week, Sundays included, her mind was always set on finding some good-natured man to take her home. It was not for the sake or in the hope of being flirted with or made love to or being complimented. It was wholly and entirely to escape the payment of her cab fare. If she had to pay all her cab fares, she could not go out to parties. And if she could not go out to parties, she could not live. Bellarmin was always very kind and good-natured to Mrs. Rivers. He had taken her home many a time, although he had come to know long ago what was the reason of her anxiety for escort? She touched him with a curious feeling of pity. He was amused in a half melancholy way to observe how she succeeded now and then in getting hold of some very young man, to whose vanity it was pleasing to suppose that he was mashing a married woman, who had been, perhaps, even still was, accounted a professional beauty. Soon the very young man dropped off. 
Perhaps he heard someone talk slightingly of old Jenny Rivers, and his feeble, factitious love light went out at once. Another youth would no doubt succeed to him, but the secession must every season be more and more interrupted, and at last must come to an end altogether. What then would remain for the poor creature who had staked all her earthly happiness on society and on men's admiration? If she sank into being recognized as a mere bore among men, the women certainly would not invite her to their parties. How could she live without these parties? They formed part of her means of living. She did not very often get asked out to dinner now, but still she had some dinner invitations, and when she was not lucky enough to have a dinner on hand, she ate no dinner and made up for the want as soon as she decently could by going to the refreshment room of some evening party. There she consumed her sandwiches with only too keen an appetite, and she drank her wine with a heart as merry as well might be under all the conditions. Sometimes her first really solid meal in the day was made at a ball supper table. When the season was over, she got invited a good deal to country places still. People in the country regarded her yet as one of the reigning queens of society, and were astonished when some irreverent young man or woman, fresh from the west end of London, described her as an old bore there is not after all very much that is more truly tragic in the world than such a career such an ambition such a game of life such a failure such an end mrs rivers is but the type of many a woman who hangs on to the skirts of london society mrs rivers talked with a curious little emphasis on wholly unimportant words the truth was that she never quite knew what she was talking about and so got into the way of trying to supply meaning by emphasis. Her mind was, as nearly as possible, empty of all but her own little schemes and shifts and dodges. In her professional beauty days, men delighted in the vapid chatter which rippled through such full red lips. The lips were full and red still, but somehow the value of a professional beauty depends very much on what society says of her. She may be a beauty still to the cool, impartial eye, but if society ceases to regard her in that light, then there is no use protesting. There is an end to her beauty. So men now began to value the chatter at its real worth, now that they had ceased to believe in the loveliness of the lips through which it flowed. I saw you the other day, Mr. Bellarmine, but you did not see me. At least, I suppose so. I must hope so. It was in Palace Yard and she laid as much emphasis on the word yard as if there were serious possibility of his supposing that she had seen him on the palace roof. You were driving by in a hansom. I do drive into Palace Yard in a hansom pretty often, Mrs. Rivers. I think that I pass a great part of my time in hansoms. You are so much occupied, so much sought after, I wonder you have time to come here tonight to honor a company like this with your presence. Do you know, I am told, that you are invited out to more dinners than any other man in London? Nothing of the kind, I can assure you. I am not by any means such a favorite in society. Besides, it wouldn't be any use. I have to dine so often in the House of Commons, I can't help it. If I am in a thing, I like to stick to it, Mrs. Rivers. Yes, I see. And how is your beautiful princess? "'My princess?' repeated Bellarmine, with a startled and somewhat displeased glance back at Mrs. Rivers, from whom his eyes had been roaming. "'Oh, I heard about you this evening. The lady who is said to be so like Mary, Queen of Scots, and whom the society papers are talking about, and who they tell me is going to set up some claim to the crown jewels, or the revenue, or the duchy of Lancaster.' "'Or the crown itself?' suggested Bellarmine. Well, I don't know, perhaps even the crown itself, but tell me all about her. Is she coming here tonight? Here? Oh, no, Bellarmine said with a sudden wonder that he could not conceal. Oh, no? How odd of you, Mr. Bellarmine. You seem to be quite shocked at my question, but what was there wrong in it? Why might she not be here? There's nothing surely in our dear hostess which should make it so very extraordinary that even a young lady of great family should condescend to cross her threshold. My dear Mrs. Rivers, I never meant anything of the kind. I was presented to Miss Beaton for the first time an hour or two ago, and I am a great friend and admirer of our hostess, 
as i am a great friend and admirer of yours but you know the political ways of people differ so much that i was a little astonished at the thought of an uncompromising representation of jacobitism and divine right being found in this cosmopolitan assembly where the red republican lion lies down with the peace society lamb mrs rivers did not in the least understand what he was talking about but she looked up and saw some woman passing who had occasionally slighted her and she was delighted to be seen in apparently deep and confidential conversation with the fashionable and brilliant bellarmin the enigma of so many conjectures and speculations at the same moment she thought she detected in bellarmin's manner a desire to escape and she could not allow him to go while her critic and enemy was still in sight but now mr bellarmin there is something i wanted so much to ask you about something very particular indeed and you can tell me and mrs rivers began exploring all the corners of her mind to discover something on which she wanted to get mr bellarmin's opinion delighted mrs rivers tell you anything you want to know bellarmin said vaguely but mrs rivers had fastened on her hostess who was passing kitty dearest she whispered in a tone quite audible to bellarmin may i stay for the second lot too i do so love to hear mr bellarmin and i want to congratulate mr tressel but jenny love i'm afraid we shan't have room oh but i must now i must mrs rivers implored and her once lovely features underwent an odd little contortion like what children call making a face she was really on the brink of the fountain of tears she had been so little used in her bright days to be contradicted and crossed in anything the best places had always been for her you dear old silly the good-natured hostess exclaimed of course you must have your way i'll pack off somebody else never mind i'll manage it somehow oh here is tommy tressel tommy tommy we all congratulate you how do you do kitty mr tressel drawled out in languorous accents as he entered the little drawing-room and with a single glance of his half-closed eyes seemed to take in the individuality of every creature in it how do bellarmin i am going to have a row with you oh i am so delighted countess spinola exclaimed i'm so glad when you have a row it is such fun but i am afraid of tressel bellarmin said i always find that i am bound over to keep the peace when i meet him as captain bobadil found when he was suddenly confronted with downright now who is captain what's his name and who is downright madame spinola asked are these nicknames of men in the house is it true that they call one man pussy and somebody else the goat what do they call you tressel they call me drawl replied tressel promptly and they call bellarmin rattle this was pure invention struck off on the spur of the moment you haven't looked at me mr tressel mrs rivers complained with appealing eyes haven't i really jenny then i will come and let me look at you this was exactly what mrs rivers would have delighted in she just wanted tressel to sit beside her and look at her but tressel turned away immediately and began to talk to someone else in countess spinola's little drawing-room the manners were free men went there at least men of mr tressel's order because they were wanted to go and because they liked it they did not feel under any strict obligation to be attentive to the women they met there the women were called by their christian names as often as not with the addition of the word dear mr bingley usually went a step further and called each woman darling tressel did not get as far as the use of dear or darling his manner rather said oh yes i see you are there i suppose i ought to call you jenny and say something nice there now i have called you jenny and said something nice run away and play with somebody else yet mr tressel was no woman hater or report belied him tressel the honourable spencer christian tressel was a tall thin man with a swaying body he always looked through life with half-closed eyes but he saw a good deal his profile was aquiline and in its outline thus suggested something of the force of character and the strong individuality which the half-closed eyes and the languorous accent might have hidden or denied spencer tressel was the younger son of a nobleman he had offended his father very early in life by avowing radical opinions good-natured people said he had only assumed these opinions to spite his noble parent 
and that if his father had become a radical the son would have declared himself converted back to the tory faith however that might be spencer tressel stuck to his opinions he further offended his father by marrying a very poor and very pretty girl his father made him only a miserable allowance his brothers dropped his acquaintance he discovered suddenly that he had great capacity for political writing and he got an engagement to write leading articles for a bright and audacious evening paper he lived manfully with his wife on his earnings as a journalist and the pair were as happy as birds in soft springtime the happiness was almost as short-lived as the springtime the young wife took sickness and died tressel disappeared from the sight of all friends and acquaintances for a long while no one knew where he was he held communication with nobody people were beginning to forget him when he suddenly turned up in london again he never made the slightest allusion to the death of his wife and he never said a word about his long absence some time after he told a friend that he meant to marry for money and he did marry a good-natured uninteresting widow with an immense fortune not long after his second marriage a distant relative of his who had never taken the slightest notice of him got into some sort of quarrel with tressel's father and to annoy him made a will leaving his whole fortune to tressel and died soon after the will was made probably if this event had happened a little earlier tressel would not have married the rich widow but he was very kind and attentive to her though he did not in any way give up his life to her he made politics his business as he said his amusement as others preferred to put it he was always assailing and denouncing the peerage and especially members of that highly privileged body who had had the good fortune to serve their country as foreign ambassadors tressel's father had been at the head of several embassies tressel now had a great house in one of the most fashionable squares and was understood to be a good deal of a wire-puller in the interests of the extreme radical party perhaps the principal stimulant to his taste for wire-pulling in this direction was the good of his country according to his understanding of it perhaps it was to be found in the fact that whenever a tory ministry was displaced tressel's father and elder brother straightway had to bundle out of office are you going my way bellarmine when you leave this tressel said as there set in a general movement and scattering some guests having come from the supper-room others preparing to go down going anyway i don't much mind well walk my way then don't let's drive i hate driving all right bellarmine answered i will discourse with my philosopher end of volume one chapter six volume one chapter seven of the rebel rose by justin mccarthy and rosa campbell prayed this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter seven tommy tressel the selected guests the initiated ones the guests of this night's second circle were settling down to the table madame spinola sat at the head her husband who scarcely ever spoke to any one took the other end there were only three women madame spinola mrs rivers and a clever eccentric woman of fashion lady cora mallory who went in for amusing herself in life went wherever she pleased and did not care what people said of her she was a widow she was only thirty years old she had just enough money to live pleasantly and she found the ordinary society of the season dull bellarmine came down to supper and tressel and bingley and colonel towers and some others colonel towers was a man who lived happily and proudly on the reputation of being managing diplomatist and secret wire-puller to the inner circle of the conservative party at present the party in office he had been for some time in the house of commons and he had never spoken there some people believed in towers and his confidential relations with the tory chiefs others and they formed the majority did not tressel always affected a profound belief in him you asked tressel what he was going to make a row with me for madame spinola bellarmine said as they were sitting down oh yes yes mr tressel tommy tressel what were you going to blow up mr bellarmine for it's this do you know that they counted me at least they counted one of my supporters on his great motion tuesday night and you promised me long ago the support of your whole progressive priggism party ain't that what you call it 
you promised me that the whole five of the progressive prigs yourself included would be in their places to support my man as i couldn't be there myself it was a favorite joke of tressel's to assume that the progressive democrats only numbered five a favorite retaliation of bellarmin's to talk as if they numbered hundreds you outrageous humbug bellarmin promptly replied do you pretend to forget that the bargain was conditional i promised you all the influence i could bring to bear on the progressive tory party to get some small proportion of them fifty or sixty let us say to keep a house for your man on condition that he let us go to a division the moment he had fired off his own speech we couldn't stand having the thing argued by solemn blockheads on both sides of the house i can stand you tressel on the expediency of extinguishing all our embassies and legations abroad and it amuses me to hear the anecdotes and the bits of scandal about the pompous old ambassadors and the wives of the secretaries of legation that sort of thing my good fellow is amusing enough but i can't stand hearing it argued out why didn't you get your fellows to hold their tongues i don't believe you ever showed up at all better employed up in the ladies gallery that was about it wasn't it or out on the terrace if you had been in the house you'd have seen there were lots of fellows on both sides dying to show that they had travelled and each of them wanted to drag in his imaginary experiences of some particular court or capital it wasn't that they wanted to argue the thing they didn't care a bit more about the right or wrong of it than you do bellarmin or than you do tressel i have thrown my soul into it safest thing you could do with your soul if you can only manage to keep it there said bingley with a great jolly laugh at his own joke is that you bingley didn't see you before i know you have been trying a joke because you laughed and no one else did it was always a great thing when people could get bellarmin and tressel together at the supper table in count spinola's house the two chaffed each other unendingly and the animated rapidity of the one man set curiously off the languorous slowness of the other oddest thing in the world tressel observed the house of commons will never take either bellarmin or me at our word i say that i am a serious politician and they won't believe that i am he says that he is not a serious politician and they are firmly convinced that he is what do you think about mr bellarmin's seriousness the hostess asked do tell us pray bellarmin won't mind will you bellarmin there were occasions when the countess spinola's manner to men and her way of speaking generally did suggest that after all there might be some truth in the story that the pretty creature was the daughter of a washerwoman and had begun active life as an artist's model i shan't mind said bellarmin i'll tell him if he guesses right now then tressel oblige the company i think bellarmin is one of the most serious politicians in the house of commons the most serious i should say after myself said tressel calmly taking a rosebud from a vase near him and fastening it into his buttonhole he has been devoting himself for several years back with the most indomitable perseverance and energy to the task of finding out what his political opinions are the two women laughed in a somewhat puzzled manner and he has just this evening discovered that his political opinions are incompatible with allegiance to the reigning house continued tressel solemnly good gracious tommy tressel what do you mean asked madame spinola the age does well enough for commonplace people like you and me madame spinola but it's too crude and practical for a poetic creature like bellarmin said tressel gravely bellarmin has found that england is getting vulgarized by american republicanism and the almighty dollar and the liberty of the press and all that sort of thing don't you know bellarmin thinks that sentiment and chivalry are dying out and he can't get along without sentiment and chivalry bingley gave a hoarse guffaw quite right bingley you can't either while well, bellarmin intends to revive them by a revolution a new dynasty a queen whom he thinks one might die for with some feeling of satisfaction tower hill the block a declamation on the scaffold that's bellarmin's form nowadays a new dynasty 
not really the block the scaffold cried mrs rivers in horrified accents oh mr bellarmin bellarmin's sense of humour was not easily tickled this evening he saw nothing amusing in tressel's joking he seemed absorbed in the peeling of a peach which he placed daintily on madame spinola's plate go on she said to tressel it's you that are the rattle now mr bellarmin doesn't even condescend to answer you how much of it is serious every bit of it said tressel don't you know madame spinola that there's a regular jacobite faction in london lord stonehenge is at the head of it on my honour i assure you white cockades and all the rest of it only charlie over the water is a fascinating young woman got up after the mary stuart pattern she was in the house this evening i'm told old greenleaf tumbled up to me on piccadilly half an hour ago in a state of intense excitement to tell me that he had been presented to her and he said that bellarmin was dangling at her skirts along the corridors instead of leading his five progressive prigs in the house by jove exclaimed bingley who had caught the name of mary stuart and turned from a whispered conversation with colonel towers it's the cheekiest thing i have heard of for a long time takes one's breath away don't it in a country like this where by jove we are all devoted to the reigning house and to every member of it i say we all know that you are bingley said tressel languidly you are quite a tame cat among the royalties ain't you now tressel himself had that reputation his radical opinions notwithstanding and bingley who had never been presented to a single member of the august family felt that the speech was barbed but suppose now tressel went on that the prince of wales was banished from the british dominions and had to take up his residence in say camden oneida county i wonder if you'd follow him there into exile every one laughed except bingley who said emphatically i was talking to colonel towers about it and he quite agrees with me that something ought to be done i'm quite with towers there tressel gravely observed oh you too think that something ought to be done tressel i think that something ought to be done always and indeed i am of opinion that something is always done but in this particular instance bingley what is the emergency well haven't you seen that thing in the park lane pictorial what thing the portrait of that audacious foreign woman you are talking about who presumes to call herself lawful queen of england no i haven't seen that said tressel now pretending unconsciousness what does it matter oh this must be your princess mr bellarmin mrs rivers whispered well it seems she is a miss beaton bingley began in an explanatory tone but you said she was a foreigner so she is at least her mother was a foreigner and she herself was brought up abroad she is not a foreigner bellarmin interposed she is an english lady the daughter of an english nobleman mr bellarmin knows all about her mrs rivers said with a little malice in her tone i have had the honour of being presented to miss beaton i have the honour of her acquaintance look here bingley my good fellow i would not advise you to get into the way of talking disrespectfully of that young lady she has a good many friends in england but why does she call herself queen of england madame spinola asked i never heard of her calling herself queen of england bellarmin answered her friends say that she is the legitimate queen of england and so in that sense she is only for the act of settlement she would have as much right to be queen of england as lord saxon will have to be duke of athelstane when his father dies oh mr bellarmin you are talking treason lady cora exclaimed with a laugh this is quite delightful jacobitism in the nineteenth century the white cockade oh i like this seated at table as she was she broke into a rattling version of the famous jacobite song nor would anything stay her until she had finished her verse now then she said tell us all about our rightful queen i am only mentioning dry hard historical facts bellarmin said but his cheek was a little flushed for all that this lady claims to be the heiress of the stuarts and she is the heiress of the stuarts nothing on earth can alter that count spinola spoke for the first time she stems i suppose from henrietta maria duchess of orleans she does 
oh yes then it will be this way and he gave a full detailed account of mary's pedigree count spinola was a living moving almanac de gotha exactly bellarmin said there is the case if any one in his senses can deny that this lady is the heiress of the stuarts then all i can say is that he would deny anything bingley was chafing with impatience we don't care about that he exclaimed what we say is that the constitution of england has put the reigning family on the throne and any one who sets up a claim against them is a traitor and a rebel by jove and ought to be clapped into the tower or newgate and sent from there to the scaffold very good bingley very good indeed your sentiments do equal honour to your head and heart said tressel but then i knew what they would be of course knowing my friend bingley as well as i do i don't yet know what the park lane pictorial has been saying about this young and lovely creature she is lovely ain't she i haven't much curiosity on the subject of the stuart pedigree but i do feel some curiosity about that may i be allowed to know what she is like look at this said bingley handing him the paper the park lane pictorial was a journal of which bellarmin had never to his recollection heard before it was now passed from hand to hand and eagerly studied by each possessor in turn so that it was some time before it reached bellarmin when it got to him he found that it was a pretentious-looking society paper which published weekly portraits of distinguished and fashionable and beautiful women and the portrait in this number was that of mary beaton evidently taken from a photograph beneath the portrait was an inscription in latin setting forth mary's parentage and pedigree and declaring her the law for constituting the secession alone standing in the way queen of great britain and ireland defender of the faith a short memoir accompanied the portrait bellarmin saw the whole thing with unspeakable dissatisfaction it was most unlucky he felt convinced its appearance was most untimely it would set people against her it would be assumed by those who did not know anything about her to be published with her authority and connivance there was something about it which seemed to him utterly out of harmony with what he supposed were mary beaton's own feelings and temper it was not of any political or personal responsibility on mary's part that bellarmin was thinking but there was a vulgarity about such an appeal to publicity which he felt sure would be bitterly hurtful to her nature as to her claims bellarmin did not suppose that anything could do much good or harm to them but he shuddered to think of what might be said in public and private about this ill-omened publication then he pulled himself up with almost a laugh at his own concern about a woman to whom he had spoken for the first time a little while before well what do you think of that bingley asked impatiently of tressel simply a statement of fact it seems to me of course it's a mere statement of fact said bellarmin you see tressel continued all that this says is that except for the act of settlement this young lady would have a rightful claim to the throne of england but that's so ain't it and where is the crime in saying it but at such a time and in such a way to put out a portrait of this woman in their windows and a latin proclamation under it declaring her queen of great britain and ireland and defender of the faith why the publisher ought to be taken out and shot shot before his own door i must say interposed colonel towers i do think that you two men make far too little of this do you think they would stand this sort of thing in any other country such a thing might do some harm in a foreign country don't see how it could do any harm here tressel said dryly i don't know i am not by any means of your opinion i think i must talk to some of the chiefs about this these are strange times there is a great deal of restlessness everywhere suppose you put a question in the house about it towers tressel suggested with a keen glance at bellarmin nothing would have delighted tressel more than to see towers make a fool of himself i should hardly like to do that replied towers with a look of great solemnity at least not without taking advice in a manner getting authority it would hardly do in my case tressel of course i am not in office and a great shame too tressel interjected so we all say i can assure you i don't know tressel i don't know really 
these things are difficult to manage and there are so many men who want office you know and have to be conciliated i always make it a point when a ministry of our men is being formed i always make it a point to say to our chief lord bosworth never mind me never mind about me you know i would rather be out of office than in so far as personal feeling goes provide for the men who want office i'll work with you all the same you'll give me your confidence all the same and he does of course just the same tressel said i haven't the slightest doubt of that yes yes just the same but about this princess do make a row in the house about her towers do now the hostess appealed to him it would be such fun such capital fun and won't you get me a seat in the ladies gallery i should love to be there i think it is rather a matter for tressel colonel towers suggested you see tressel goes in for being independent he doesn't acknowledge any authority he has no responsibility besides you go in for out-and-out -out radicalism tressel sort of disguised republicanism isn't it so it would come better from you perhaps you can't be supposed to have any sympathy with the sentiment of divine right there i can't quite agree with you towers i go in for sentiment i'm altogether a man of sentiment most of the company screamed with laughter at this announcement tressel went blandly on i am a man of sentiment altogether i am touched with the melancholy beauty of that hopeless claim that lost cause and then i am a slave to the charm of female loveliness no towers i can't do it for you on the contrary i should think your duty was clear does she go to the house mrs rivers asked confidentially of bellarmin i believe she went there for the first time this evening will you take me down to see her oh please do my dear mrs rivers she is not on show and even if she were i am not her showman now i have made you angry oh yes i have i can see it but indeed mr bellarmin i meant nothing i am quite sure of that bellarmin said anyhow you will look into this thing towers bingley shouted you won't let it drop out of sight mind i reckon on you if you don't i'll get someone else it shan't be allowed to pass unchallenged i can tell you end of volume one chapter seven volume one chapter eight of the rebel rose by justin mccarthy and rosa campbell prayed this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter eight about champion bellarmin and tressel were walking through the green park they are badly advising that girl tressel said abruptly who are they i don't quite know the people whoever they are who have her in hand why did they get that thing put into the park lane pictorial why such a thing anywhere and in any case why the park lane pictorial oh they know nothing about it don't they you bet they do someone does if i know anything about anything i know that the park lane pictorial never published that portrait and that memoir and the whole lot of it without being well paid oh but that is impossible she would never listen to such an idea bellarmin spoke with angry surprise she wouldn't eh well you ought to know i suppose better than i at any rate tressel cast a keen glance at bellarmin's face as he spoke anybody who knew anything of her would know that as a matter of fact i judge from inference only i met her for the first time in the house of commons to-night yes very good then somebody about her is doing things without her knowledge and she ought to be put on her guard lord stonehenge certainly would not tolerate anything of the kind bellarmin said no no of course he wouldn't in point of fact no one who knows london would do it but the people who have this girl in hand don't all of them know london anyhow there it is you had better give someone the straight tip or tell her yourself you speak as if you had some knowledge of her affairs said bellarmin with an interest which he could not disguise i have some knowledge of the affairs of most people replied tressel and i am always in a quiet way on the lookout for information there's no knowing when it may come in handy a habit acquired in journalism and not a bad training for a politician try it 
I do happen to know something about Miss Beaton's claims and Miss Beaton's adherents, Stonehenge among them. Does he want to marry her? Bellarmin asked abruptly. Don't think so. No, Stonehenge is a dreamer, a man of chimeras, like many of these Catholic people, a man who half believes in the king's evil and the virtue of royal touch, by a legitimist sovereign, of course, a man who cherishes, as a sacred heirloom, the historic wig of His Majesty Charles the Second. No, Stonehenge doesn't want to marry her. They are only hoping to put the thin end of the wedge in. By the way, did anyone ever try to put the thick end of the wedge in? If it were not too ridiculous, one might imagine some deep-laid scheme. Oh, there won't be a civil war just yet, unless you start it. You might turn the Irish-American energies in that direction. Not a bad notion. A second Stuart bid for the Irish support. Stonehenge isn't such a fool, though he is a legitimist. There may be a plot against the throne in the brain of that white-mustached old ass who got the saber cut at Solfrino. Why always a saber cut? added Tressel meditatively. Have you observed that fanatics, foreign finions, and legitimist agitators, which all comes to much the same thing, have generally, in novels and out of them, got a saber cut somewhere? Why not a bullet hole? However, a bad whist player will try to force his enemy's hand with the ten of trumps. I dare say that's the general's notion. But Miss Beaton's claims? Has she any at all, any that are real? I have heard something of an ancestral estate. Oh, yes, she has a bona fide claim on an estate in the Palatinate of Lancaster, left by a steward adherent in the latter days of Anne, when the old woman herself seemed inclined for a Stuart restoration. It was left to the eldest princes in the Stuart family, and in default, to the eldest succeeding princesses of the line. There's the whole pretension in an historical nutshell. Well, said Bellarmin, well, the Hanoverian ministers simply seized the property for the crown. It's conceivable, however, that a prime minister of England, say, an enthusiast like Champion, possessed with fantasies of reform, might be wrought upon to recognize the claim on the part of the undoubted representative of the Stuarts, merely as a family possession. However, enough about that. Now what about Champion? About Champion? Quite so, about Champion. Are you coming to terms with him? You may speak out with me. I know all about it, and I saw Champion today, and he particularly wished me to see you in an easy, informal sort of way, and get to know what your ideas are on the whole subject. First the thing itself, next the time when. Bellarmin was silent for a while. He was surprised to hear that Sir Victor had made Tressel his confidant on such a subject. Bellarmin himself was inclined to believe in Tressel on the whole as a sincere and serious politician, but he never supposed that a man with the intensity of conviction and the lack of humor which alike characterized Champion could be got to put himself and his schemes into the power of a teller of scandalous anecdotes and a maker of cynical jokes. I see that you are a little astonished, my youthful politician, to think that Champion should make me his emissary. It does seem odd, doesn't it? But I managed to work it out of him and to work myself into him. I have my peculiar advantages, don't you see? And I got him to see them. I talk to everybody, and so nothing is inferred from my talking to anybody. Then, I am not a serious politician. Everybody says that, and what everybody says must be true. Therefore, of course, nobody would believe that so tremendously serious a politician as Lucifer would think of taking me into any confidence. Then, if I were to let out the secrets, nobody would give them a moment's attention, seeing it's me, don't you know? Then again, if the worst came to the worst, I could be disavowed so easily. Oh, it's only Tressel's absurd talk. Nobody minds him, and the thing is at an end, don't you see? Yes, there is a good deal in what you say, but this is a serious business. Has Champion told any of his colleagues in office? Not one. Most of them are mere puppets whom he can set in motion when he likes, 
and move in any direction he pleases. Saxon he is a little afraid of, but he thinks it safest to keep Saxon in the dark for the present. Saxon is the sort of man who accepts accomplished facts. If Champion can say to him, Look here, this is a definite policy, to which I am pledged in my own mind. Will you go with me or desert me? He thinks there would be his best chance for nailing Saxon. Well, what does Champion want of me? Champion thinks you are a clever young fellow with some fresh ideas and plenty of go, who has made enormous strides in the political race, and has the faculty of keeping the house amused by showing it game. The house always likes that. He thinks you must be about as tired of the stupid old ways as he is himself. That's why I stick to Champion, because he wants to do something new and plucky. Champion thinks that you would have wit enough to see that some reform of this absurd old anomaly must be made soon, and that a clean sweep would be as easily done as a little trimming and clipping. He fancies that you are a sort of man who would rather be identified with a great reform which is inevitable, then care about the barren honor of opposing it. He thinks progressive Toryism might very properly include in its progress a march over the ruins of the House of Lords. He wants to form a new party, and he is eclectic, and he wants you to belong to it. Will you see him? No, I think not. I don't see the use. I don't fancy I could do him any good, just now at all events, the house of lords as it is now constituted has got to go every one with the prophetic eye must see that i should like my progressive tories to have a hand in the construction of the new chamber whatever it is to be of course champion would go for some sort of second chamber oh yes i wouldn't if i could but he is strong on it and i don't much mind either way but I doubt about the time, and I am inclined to think that Champion's notion of springing the scheme upon his old colleagues will lead to a smash. I don't see my way to it, Tressel. That's all I can say. If I were to advise him, I should tell him he ought to take Lord Saxon into his confidence at once. He won't do that. Look here, Bellarmine. It's not Lord Saxon I'm afraid of, so far as this business is concerned. No. Who else? Lady Saxon. I've some reason to suspect that she and Champion are old pals, and he would be easily managed by a clever woman like that. I don't believe there is an atom of foundation for your suspicion about her and Champion, about their having been friends before her marriage, said Bellarmine hastily, yet with an uneasy recollection of the conference on the terrace. All right, said Tressel. Good night. End of Volume 1, Chapter 8Volume 1, Chapter 9 of The Rebel Rose by Justin McCarthy and Rosa Campbell Prade. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 9 The Princess at Home. Mary Beaton lived in a wonderful little house very near the walls of old Kensington Palace. It was only chance which had given her a domicile, but it seemed sometimes to her, when she was in a mood of exaltation, that the hand of providence itself had settled her down in the immediate neighbourhood of the palace, where Queen Anne died beneath the very shadow of its walls. The house General Falcon and Lady Struthers had succeeded in getting possession of was a long, ancient, low-roofed building. It had only one story above the ground floor, and that upper story held only bedrooms. The whole day life and evening life of the house was therefore on the ground floor, and the reception rooms ran out of one another in a quaint and curious way in each room there were long low windows some of them shadowed by the trees of the kensington gardens some of them looking on the walls of kensington palace when it was decided that mary beaton should come over to england and set up her claims there general falcon went on in advance to find a suitable dwelling for her and after a while lady struthers came to help him in his quest General Falcon decided from the beginning that the heiress of the Stuarts could not condescend to occupy any house in one of the new and fashionable quarters. Belgrave Square, he put aside, after some consideration, rather as being under the social and historical condition undesirable, 
than because the rental was beyond Mary's means, though that was certainly the case. It had, of course, the traditional attraction to a legitimist that it was the scene of the famous pilgrimage to do homage to Charles X. But times had changed since that time, and General Falcon could not find any fragrance of divine right and exalted, self-sufficing legitimacy lingering now along the stuccoed lines and ridges of Belgrave Square. Eaton Square he held to be as utterly out of the question as Cromwell Road itself. Park Lane would not do. It was occupied far too much by hangers-on to the Hanoverians, as he put it, and by the aristocracy of birth and of money who habitually went to court. There was too strong a savour of Marlborough House about it for his purpose, he thought. So, when after the coming of Lady Struthers, and when things seemed well-nigh desperate, a strange chance threw the long, low, old-fashioned house at Kensington in his way. Falcon thought he saw the finger of Providence distinctly intervening for his guidance. He took Lord Stonehenge into council, and they arranged for a long tenancy of the house. Everything was prepared for Mary's reception by the dowager Lady Stonehenge, Lady Struthers, and General Falcon in permanent council, and when all was done, Lady Struthers and Falcon went back to bring their young mistress to her London home. Nothing could exceed the delight of Mary Beaton when she first ranged through the rooms of that delightful old house. She thought she could never have enough of it. She studied all its peculiarities and all its views and glimpses. She kissed Lady Struthers a dozen times in her rapture. She felt almost inclined to kiss dear old Falcon, too, so she told Lady Struthers in private confidence. With all her little dignities and airs, Mary was a thorough girl. Mary was very fond of Lady Struthers, after a fashion, but it was not surprising that she sometimes found this scion of the aristocracy a little tiresome. Lady Struthers prided herself on the length of her pedigree. Her mother had belonged to a noble Highland Catholic family, and she herself had married she considered beneath her rank. Sir Peter Struthers had begun his career as an apothecary's assistant, and had ended it as a court physician. He had doctored various foreign royalties. He had died after making an unaccountable, and to his wife, eminently unsatisfactory will, by which the bulk of his fortune had gone to his children by a former marriage, while Lady Struthers was left but a moderate annuity, and the consoling reflection that she was suffering for having demeaned herself by such a union. It had seemed natural enough that Lady Struthers should accept the position of governess to Miss Beaton, and at the court of Schwalbenstadt, where the young lady was brought up, Lady Struthers had reveled in titles and high life, and had become so accustomed to addressing her acquaintances as princess, countess, or baroness, as the case might be, that she found some difficulty in adapting herself to humbler society in England. It was a disappointment to Lady Struthers that Miss Beaton's claims were not at once recognized, and that she did not immediately receive invitations to all the greatest houses. The Catholic coterie was all very well, and Lord Stonehenge had proved himself a valuable ally. But Lady Struthers wanted and expected something more than that. General Falcon and Lady Struthers had this in common, and perhaps almost this only, that they were both devoted to their young mistress. They had watched her grow up from childhood with pride and delight, they had bent before her petty, willful ways, admiring her the more for them. Would she be a steward if she were not willful? They had yielded her an exaggerated deference, exulting in the thought that her nature was too sweet for adulation to spoil it, and even when scolding her for her shortcomings and tutoring her in what they conceived to be the duties of her position, they had never succeeded in inspiring her with any wholesome awe of themselves. Gradually, Lady Struthers' supremacy had waned. Now she was a mere picturesque dummy, for she was certainly very picturesque with her snowy hair and her stately presence, an amiable chaperone, whose ideas of propriety never interfered with her charge's inclinations. General Falcon, however, seemed with years to become more exacting and more tenacious of such authority as he held over Miss Beaton. In truth, Mary sometimes felt a little puzzled by his manner, 
and impatient of his system of surveillance. His humor was by turns querulous, suspicious, and curiously emotional, tender, even impassioned. She would have been more annoyed by the ill temper were it not that the tenderness appealed to her warm heart and to all that was romantic and queen-like in her nature. His affection, she thought, was something more than mere personal devotion. It was devotion to the memory of her dead parents, to a cause. It was the living example of that mysterious poetic fascination which the Stuarts had always exercised over their followers. The day after the visit to the House of Commons, Mary was in her own room, her peculiar place of retreat, some time before the regular breakfast hour. It was her custom, after the fashion of the continent, to have her coffee alone in the room early, and then to meet her household circle at a set déjeune à la fourchette, about noon. She seldom saw General Falcon till the time of the midday meal, and after that, they usually began and got through the business they had to do, a business which generally consisted in considering and dismissing absurd and impossible suggestions from unthinking and unsolicited advisers. On this particular morning, however, General Falcon sent a formal message to say that it would gratify him if Madame would kindly allow him to wait on her. In all superficial intercourse, he treated her with an almost exaggerated ceremony, Madame at once accorded the interview, and Madame shrugged her shoulders and pursed her lips and pouted, well knowing that she was to be scolded. She did her best to escape censure. She met Falcon with a look of sweet, disarming welcome, but Falcon was not to be disarmed. As he entered, gray, erect, with the scar on his forehead conspicuously white, Mary thought she had never seen his face sterner or more ill-tempered. She was puzzled by a certain air of excitement and forced self-repression, which she noticed in him. "'What now, I wonder?' she murmured half aloud, and with a mocking accent. "'London air is too stimulating for the general's nerves. "'Come, something is wrong,' she went on in a louder tone. "'Well, let us have it out. What have I been doing?' Falcon was silent for a few moments. "'I am afraid that you shocked Lord Stonehenge and Mr. Levin last night,' he said. "'You were near going, actually, into the House of Commons, and you only laughed and made fun of it.' "'Well, there was nothing to weep over, was there? Why should Lord Stonehenge care? He is one of us. As for Mr. Levin, "'And then you kept rambling about the terrace with Mr. Bellarmine, as if you were a schoolgirl.' A man like Lord Stonehenge could not approve of that. Mary gave up all thought of conciliation. I wish you would not speak to me as if I were a schoolgirl, she said petulantly. I wish you would not act as if you were a schoolgirl, he answered as petulantly. I wish you would try to remember that you are not of the schoolgirl's age or of the ordinary schoolgirl's position. I wish you would try and remember my position a little more than you do. You scold me in a very disrespectful and disagreeable fashion. What have I done that was so bad? Come, tell me all my faults, and heaven send me patience to listen. Give me a bead-roll of them, but stay a moment. I presume the task will be pretty long. Let us make ourselves comfortable. She pushed a soft and heavy armchair towards him with an air of mock humility, and settled herself on a great heap of cushions, converted to the duty of an ottoman. She settled herself down very comfortably, unfurled her fan, and waved it gently before her face. She did not look at Falcon, her eyes were upturned. Had she looked, indeed, she might have been surprised by the gaze bent upon her, a fierce, melancholy longing, almost tragic in its intensity. It was as though Falcon had dropped his mask for a moment, and allowed play to the emotion he had been trying to conceal by his petty fault-finding. His eyes literally devoured her, and his face, lighted by the gleam of ardor, seemed for an instant youthful once more. But Mary saw nothing of this. She appeared to be languidly studying the painted ceiling. There was a minute of silence, and then she said, "'I'm waiting, General Falcon.' "'Waiting?' he said dreamily, pulling himself together with a start and turning his eyes away. For what, madame? Waiting to be lectured. 
to be scolded to be told of all my various sins of omission and commission won't you tell me i only want to be put right i'll promise not to be aggravating she said coaxingly oh it isn't any use he exclaimed with sudden sharpness i haven't any influence over you now any longer i'd better give up general falcon said mary solemnly what would you have did not i play my part properly last night you said that you wanted me to know influential people in the political world people who would take up my claims and see the justice of giving me back the estate which these hanoverians confiscated well isn't sir victor champion an influential personage you are extremely unreasonable thou shalt praise me to-day o caesar this was the least that i expected madame it is not for the descendant of the stuarts to boast of an introduction to an adventuress like lady saxon i am not boasting general quite the contrary i behaved prettily to lady saxon last night from a sense of duty and indeed i thought i had put quite the right infusion of dignified reserve that's your phrase into my manner is she an adventuress then my instinct did not deceive me it's always so comforting to know that one may put trust in one's instinct of course i should have supposed her to be a very great and high-born lady if it hadn't been for my little inward monitor which labelled her with a big d doubtful what do you know about lady saxon general falcon enough to make use of her you are dreadfully melodramatic tell me the mystery i adore a mystery there is none said falcon let me advise you madame to treat this lady with a certain amount of reserve not to become too intimate with her not for example to discuss your private affairs with her your likes and dislikes your theories your feelings yes it is the want of that dignified reserve in your manner which i complain of in your conversation with mr bellarmin ah i understand mary interrupted with scornful amusement you are jealous of mr bellarmin that's it you are jealous because he is young and good-looking and famous and agreeable and because he interests me good gracious what have i said now a sudden wave of red rushed to falcon's face and overspread his forehead except where the scar seemed it leaving his cheeks pallid his eyes flashed angrily he bit his moustache and rose abruptly madame i was right when i accused you of levity and i when i told you that you were melodramatic she retorted what did you object to in my conversation with mr bellarmin he made an impatient gesture and moved a few steps from her without answering oh i know you want me to be stiff and formal and superficial to every one but yourself you did not like my talking to him so openly about what i thought of the poor people and the state of england and everything why i wonder general falcon for heaven's sake let me be myself sometimes a young woman with heart and sympathies and yes some wish to amuse herself i want to have a taste now and then of a girl's natural life i am tired of this sham sovereignty i am weary of it all she spoke with impetuous warmth general falcon had stepped nearer her again he did not look at her his face still working with some untold emotion was turned towards the window god knows that i am weary of it too he cried with a burst of passion there was silence for a moment or two you speak strongly general said mary with a puzzled wistful glance at him are you tired of me he turned to her with a gesture of apology forgive me madame i forgot myself why are you unhappy are you tired of me mary repeated well yes in a manner the general spoke now in a forced mechanical voice dropping out the words slowly as if he were deliberating while he uttered them i am not tired of you but i am tired of trying to make you do the right thing and see things in the right way and i see that you rebel against the restraint i see that i bore you i see that my influence over you is weakening day by day and yes i get tired and sore and sorry and i don't see what is to come of it he threw himself into his chair with a heavy sigh my father would be grieved if he could know of this mary said softly 
more as if she were talking to herself than remonstrating with Falcon. He would be so sorry if he could only have known that the friend he loved best and trusted most would come to weary so soon of the task of taking care of his daughter. "'How dare you talk in that way?' Falcon exclaimed, starting forward, tremulous and excited. "'You, you are a wicked girl, a wicked, heartless girl, to play upon me like this, to bring up your father's name, to say that I have wearied of taking care of you, when you know that I only live for you. Oh, say what you please, torture me as you choose, but don't cry. Don't, don't begin to cry.' for there were tears in the girl's brown eyes, and she put up her handkerchief to hide them. General Falcon sat like one terrified, not knowing what to say or do. After a moment or two, Mary looked at him with a serious face and eyes that were still moist and wistful. General Falcon, she said, tell me, what is it that you want? You cannot make me Queen of England, you know. I can't make you Queen of England, he repeated, and his eyes were fixed upon her with a rapt gaze, that seemed more befitting a lover than an elderly guardian. Would I, if I could? I have dreamed so many wild dreams, Mary, dreams in which you were the central figure, dreams of glory and of poetry and of love. His voice dropped in a sort of caressing cadence, and the girl started and blushed. I have dreamed so much, he went on, that sometimes I can hardly tell the real from the unreal, the possible from the impossible. I often think that dreams are my only real life. General Falcon, said Mary in a soft voice of compassion, you idealize me, you know. You mustn't do that. I'm only a girl, and a very frivolous girl sometimes, as you tell me yourself. Mary Stuart was only a girl when she came to Holyrood, but she had in her face and her voice that magic which made men forget that she was the queen and made them dream wild dreams of ambitious love and daring deed, ay, and do the deeds. There are women still who have such magic, my princess, women with the dangerous gift of fascination by which a man may be turned into a madman or a hero. You are one of these, Mary. You have that gift, but there clings round you something more than the magic of the woman. There is the magic of an historic cause." I know it, replied Mary soothingly. I like to feel that some of the romance of the dead and gone Stuarts is revived in me, and there are moments, oh, many, many, in which I am proud and glad to be a Stuart. You must not think that I undervalue your devotion, or that I don't know what it means. Do you know what my devotion means, madame? My princess, my queen, if you do know, you are wiser than poor old Falcon, who makes himself wretched in trying to understand it. He laughed a quavering, uncertain laugh. Devotion like yours is the birthright of the Stuarts, said Mary affectionately, touching his hand lightly as she spoke. I accept it as such dear old friend, and I will try to tease you no more. Dream no more dreams, Falcon, about magic charms and heroic deeds and impossible thrones. Make me glorious and rich, if you please, in a matter-of-fact nineteenth-century fashion. Curry favor, if you like, with Her Majesty's ministers, present and to come, and settle me in my historic inheritance with my historic thousands. In good truth, Falcon, she added with a laugh, I think we shall need them, for though this house isn't a palace, and I am not a pauper, I am quite certain that we spend more than we ought. "'You must spend money,' Falcon answered impatiently. "'You must keep up an establishment. "'It seems to me, my good general, "'that I myself am something of an adventuress. "'I fancy that my Stuart dignity "'might be supported without a hall-porter "'and with a fewer number of men in livery, "'and that I might have a better chance of heaven "'and should be a worthier daughter of the Mother Church if I spent more in charity and less upon this vain state and show. But we have talked of this often enough, and now I hope that our quarrel is over for today. Yes, thank heaven, murmured Falcon, in a relieved tone. He seemed to have descended to the nineteenth century level. His emotion was past now, and he leaned back composedly in his chair. Mary came and sat herself on one of the broad arms of the chair, and laid her left hand caressingly on his shoulder. At first he winced at the touch, 
Then, as if with an effort, he put up his right hand and placed it on hers. Yes, dear old friend, Mary said, you shall give me the list of all my sins, offenses, and negligences, but no more now. Some other time, I am going to coax you. I have a great, great favor to ask of you. You will take me to the East End and let me see the sort of life that goes on there. Come, promise now. I'll be as sweet as honey to you for a whole week if you will say that I may go. She bent down and looked into his face with a childlike coquetry that was irresistible, at least to General Falcon. He gazed at her fondly, admiringly. Then he moved his hand from hers and timidly touched her soft cheek. The contact might have been magnetic. He withdrew his hand again so quickly, and he gave a sort of shuddering sigh. Promise, insisted the girl. Yes, you shall go, he answered. You shall go with me, alone with me. There was a wildness in his manner of pronouncing the last words, of which he himself seemed to become conscious, for he added in a different tone, and after a moment's pause, Perhaps it is as well that you should see for yourself what life is. Exactly my own notion and what I have been trying to impress upon you ever since we came to London. I want ever so much to see an East End music hall, and I don't want to be seen and known. Listen, may I go in boys' clothes? I should like that, because I should be so much more free, and nobody could suspect who I was, don't you see? I am afraid that you would never be fit for a queen, he said in a half-melancholy remonstrance. I every inch a queen, she said, and she sprang to a standing position and stood before him straight as a spear, tall, with one hand raised to her forehead as if she were placing a crown there, and the other held on her bosom as though it grasped the symbolic orb. General Falcon had in his time seen many queens and empresses and princesses of all sorts, nationalities, and even colors, but he thought in his heart that he had never looked on so queenly a form as that which now stood before him and challenged impeachment of its right to sovereign state. Mary threw herself down upon her cushions again. I want to go to court, she said defiantly. To court? But, madame, surely you don't think of what you say. Indeed, Falcon, I am afraid I very seldom think of what I am saying, or at least of what I am going to say. I do now and then begin to think of what I have said after I have said it, and the reflection is not always encouraging, but I mean what I am saying this time. I want to go to court. If you wish to be presented at court merely as the Honorable Mary Stuart Beaton, daughter of an English baron, I presume that could be arranged, Falcon said doggedly, but I should hardly have thought you would condescend to such a performance. I want to see the sight, but I suppose it wouldn't be the proper thing. It would be like a recognition of the Hanoverian family. No, we must not do that, but I want to see the Queen in private. Do you think you could manage that? See the Queen in private? Yes, I want to talk to her about the condition of England, the poverty, the misery. I am sure she could do something if only her eyes were open to the real truth. I am sure she is not allowed to know anything about the wretched condition of so many of her subjects, I mean of the people who are her subjects for the time. You may be certain that her ministers and her courtiers and the ladies who are about her take good care to keep her in perfect ignorance of the truth. Well, I want to see her and tell her all. It is my duty. I must not stick at points of etiquette where such interests are concerned." Falcon smiled compassionately. Madame, you may take it from me that the Queen knows as well what is going on all over the country as any man or woman in the land. She has the newspapers read to her regularly. She keeps herself thoroughly informed. Yes, read to her. There it is. You see, you admit it yourself. Read to her. Of course they only read the pleasant parts. They leave out all that could distress her or make her think that she had duties to perform which they don't want her to be troubled about. I understand these things, General. Why, I remember so well when I was at the residence in Schwalbenstadt, the newspapers were all carefully examined before they came under the eyes of the Grand Duke or the Grand Duchess. The ministers and court people would not let either of them know a word that would give them any trouble. 
i let the grand duchess know all the truth of some stories i can tell you and how the court people hated me for it ah yes i know mary beaton sighed with the air of one on whom long and varied experience has forced the knowledge of hard realities general falcon became more compassionate than ever my dear child he said with fatherlike tenderness this court here is not in the least like any of the little courts you have seen the queen knows everything and if there was anything in her power to do she would do it mary dropped the discussion but did not feel satisfied after a moment of silence she began again i should like to know the princess of wales general general falcon was becoming impatient madame you must know very well that sort of thing can't be for the present why do you let such ideas get into your head at such a time well we are also dull here you are a brave soldier and a good dear friend falcon but you are not lively come now are you you know you are not no i am not lively falcon admitted grimly and lady struthers dear thing she is very obliging and knows languages and has an exalted and very proper notion of the high life as they say in french novels mary laughed softly but you wouldn't call her a very amusing companion would you and i'm tired of the people we have to meet and the solemnity of it all everything so ordered and so stately and so cold and such a sham if one were a queen actually a queen reigning i suppose one would pull one's courage about one grandly and put up with it but to me and as we are here it has no reality it is all stiff chilly stupid i want to be amused and yes i want someone to admire falcon looked suddenly at her she caught the expression of his face and broke again into a little peal of musical laughter falcon's features were convulsed as they had been a little while ago and he kept his eyes down as if afraid they would betray him positively said mary your look means why don't you admire me you vain old hero well i do admire you very much but then i am so accustomed to you that i don't think of you what i mean is that i want to see someone from the world outside whom i could admire as a hero madame burst fiercely from falcon's lips then he checked himself and laughed discordantly exactly he said you are so accustomed to me that you don't think about me what if some day i were to do something which would force you to take me into account in your life something wild daring if i were to act one of those dreams i spoke of just now you would be obliged to think about me then madame what sort of dream i don't understand you to-day general falcon mary spoke uneasily of course i take you into account in my life don't you know that i'm very fond of you you don't need telling surely and now that i haven't a single relation left you are closer to me than anyone else in the world but i don't think of you in a in a girl's way general no you don't think of me in a girl's way he repeated with a sardonic emphasis well let us look around there's lord stonehenge everybody who knows lord stonehenge must admire him oh lord stonehenge yes indeed i do admire him very much he is a man of gold he knows everything one could want to know he is ever so kind he is very handsome falcon interjected as if he were saying don't pretend to forget that he is very handsome yes that one sees she admitted he is not very young quite young for such a man falcon declared authoritatively he is only just over forty only just over forty mary made a little grimace oh yes i admire him i think he is a little shy of me and do you know my good falcon an idea has once or twice come into my mind that some of you are making up a little scheme to marry me to lord stonehenge she spoke with the utmost composure and looked quietly into falcon's eyes waiting for a reply falcon appeared embarrassed madame he said gravely if any hint of that kind were to reach lord stonehenge's ears he would be shocked and horrified mary glanced at herself in the glass and smiled you understand quite well he replied almost gruffly lord stonehenge would regard it as presumption on his part to lift his eyes to the daughter of the stuart kings it would be impossible for him to devote himself 
as he does to you and your cause if any such talk were to get about i beseech you madame to guard your impulsive utterances i observe my dear general that you have not disclaimed the intention all the same mary said quietly i never supposed that lord stonehenge was a party to it or to anything half so amusing suppose that i were to take a liking to him she added to fall in love with him what would have to be done then should i have to propose to him and suppose his modesty and his devoted allegiance were to compel him to refuse where should i be then i don't think you ought to talk in that way madame well let us talk in some other way i wish you would tell lady struthers to write and ask mr bellarmin to dinner mr bellarmin yes i think he is very clever and he amuses me and i'm sure he has a career before him and he isn't like everybody else i want him to dine here general or somewhere else where i am going to be i want him asked to lord stonehenge's when we go down there see about that general falcon i have no doubt madame that whatever you insist upon can be done but i would have you remember that some people call mr bellarmin a political adventurer what is an adventurer general in politics you say lady saxon is an adventuress i have a notion that i am a political adventuress now how do you define a political adventurer is it one who goes in quest of adventures and to whom life is only a game i wish i were a man and an adventurer in that sense it must be delightful mary allowed a half sigh to escape her well what we call a political adventurer is a man who has no fixed principles who goes into politics rather to advance himself than to advance any great cause but my good general falcon what an immense number of adventurers there must be in english political life i never name any public man without being told by somebody that he is utterly unprincipled that he has no good purpose whatever that he is only thinking of himself and of his own ambition and so forth and so forth i don't see in that case how mr bellarmin can be any worse than most other men and he has certainly the advantage of being young and handsome and agreeable he may amend falcon he may repent he may develop wonderful principles some day he may be the moral hero of the coming england meantime let us have him to dinner madame is mistress in her own household is she falcon really now is she mary smiled at him mischievously she had apparently forgotten her promise not to tease him i am so glad to hear it for there are times do you know when i should not quite have thought it mary beaton was it must be owned in a somewhat provoking mood to-day falcon stood under severe self-restraint i hope he said that neither lady struthers nor i have been unduly interfering oh no no my dear creatures you have been absolute perfection i fancy you are a good deal too near perfection for me but you will remember mr bellarmin falcon i am sure that he is not by any means perfection and he will suit me all the better for that i will speak to lord stonehenge said falcon stiffly thanks and now about the east end that shall be arranged madame since you are set upon it a little perhaps after the stonehenge visit and mind i shall wear boys clothes now you know you have promised and in return i have promised to admire you to consult you to adore you seriously to be so sweet to you general and so good i shall never believe in your affection again if you are going to be as inflexible and as unyielding about the proprieties as you try to be on most occasions unyielding about the proprieties and i have consented to allow the heiress of the stuarts to go to an east end music hall in boys clothes unyielding oh mary my princess you see too well how blind and foolish are my affections he rose and strode up and down the room mary looked at him with amusement in which there was a faint trace of perplexity now general if you must be theatrical imagine that i am the queen of scots as an archer of the guard you know she was up to a good many pranks it's in the stuart blood that reflection will comfort you 
I know you like to please me, she went on in a different tone, and I suppose I do like to try your patience sometimes. There's not the least doubt that when I get married I shall try my husband's patience and temper terribly. You don't like me to talk of marrying, General, but I suppose that I may take a husband some day. I'm not in the act of settlement, you know, and there's nothing to prevent me from marrying a shoe-black. Indeed, madame, he exclaimed bitterly, I have almost brought myself to believe that your marriage would be the best thing for you and for me. I shall at once set about introducing suitors to your notice. That's right. Understand, I shall want to govern this husband absolutely. I shall take positive delight in conquering him and taming him and making him obedient and submissive. Yes, and you will despise him if he is obedient and submissive, said Falcon with a melancholy laugh. I wonder, would that be so, do you think? I don't know at all. I haven't followed out my track of thought so far. I have only got to the subjugation point. I have enjoyed in advance many a triumph over his complete subjugation and his final acknowledgment that he was subjugated, that he was my captive and my slave and so forth. But I haven't studied the question beyond that point. That has been my skyline, my horizon. I haven't asked myself how I should feel to my slave when he had meekly put on his collar and accepted his yoke. You don't like all this nonsense, do you, Falcon? I can see by the look on your face that you disapprove of it highly. Excuse me, madam, I was not venturing to express disapproval or approval, but I would remind you that I came at this early hour to talk over some matters of business before luncheon, and that luncheon time is now near at hand. You are right, General Falcon. Your words recall me to myself, as the people say in the plays. Well, let us get to business. I dismiss my fantasies and my as yet untamed husband. Go on. I am all attention. So General Falcon went into a great number of questions of policy and expenditure and so on, and one might have fancied, from the way in which Mary lolled carelessly upon the cushions and toyed with the fan in her hand, that she was not listening to a word he said. But she, every now and then, drew her eyebrows together and interrupted him with a shrewd question, or made a quiet, keen suggestion, which showed that she was not altogether the frivolous girl that she seemed. End of Volume 1, Chapter 9《ボリューム1 Chapter 10 of the Rebel Rose by Justin McCarthy and Rosa Campbell Prade This LibriVox recording is in the public domain Chapter 10 Rolf Bellerman Bellerman lived in St James Place a small street opening out of stately St James Street His was not an august habitation he was not rich his father allowed him enough money to live like a gentleman in london to pay for gloves and cabs and all the rest of it and was willing to make such an allowance to him forever but as our readers will see bellarmin had not yet opened out any career for himself in a paying sense he had been drawn into political life and had made a mark there and he meant to stick to it up to the present however he had not got any money out of it and therefore he took care not to live extravagantly. His lodgings consisted of a sitting-room, a bedroom, and a bathroom. The sitting-room was rather small, and it was encumbered, as is the sitting-room of every bachelor member of Parliament, with piles of blue books and parliamentary papers of all kinds. Newspapers, of course, were scattered all around. The chairs, the sofas, the tables, the floor were encumbered with books and papers. The books that Bellarmin kept in his sitting-room were not, however, the books that he read. They were the books that he intended to read, or that he told himself he intended to read. They were, first the blue books, and then the works of various kinds which Bellarmin meant to study in order to supplement the knowledge to be derived from the blue books. For example, there came to him the latest blue book on the affairs of South Africa, now, to understand and to test the statements in the blue book, it seemed necessary to get a number of non-official books about South Africa, 
and Bellarmin got them with full intent to read them. But then came in the blue book on bimetallism, the blue book on our dealings with Russia in relation to the Afghan boundary, the blue book on the employment of Pitbro girls, and all these and various other subjects Bellarmin wanted to get additional information, and so got in additional books from the London Library. When he set out on his political career, he wanted to study everything, to know everything. But then came in the social attractions, the dinners, the luncheons, the garden parties, the visits to country houses, the race weeks here and there, and Bellarmin wanted to accomplish all that too. Arthur Pendennis said of himself in his position in London society, I am in the swim, and by Jove I like it. Bellarmin was in the swim too, and by Jove he liked it. One result was that the blue books got less and less studied, and that they accumulated more and more. Bellarmin was loath to acknowledge even to himself that he had abandoned any particular subject, and so he would not get rid of the blue books, which he had once fondly believed that he could master. Nor had his acquaintance with Lady Saxon, nor had his appreciation of the charms of Mary Beaton's society, tended in any way to expand his opportunities for the study of the South African question and bimetallism and the work of the Pitbro girls. The books, which he said he must not allow himself time to read, but which he did read pretty often nevertheless, were all in his bedroom, a room comparatively large for a set of London apartments. There were the books that he loved, a few of the classics of ancient and the classics too of modern days there also were various novels and memoirs and biographies got from moody's library and never destined to be classic at all but which bellarmin sent for because people were talking about them and in such matters too his ambition was to know everything on the walls of his sitting-room were displayed the ordinary west end lodging-house frames and engravings but in his bedroom he had some really fine etchings given to him by artists or bought by him here and there and some curious swords and pistols and fans and bronzes and he had a long japan box which contained his court suit cocked hat and all the mantelpiece in his sitting-room was littered with letters and cards of invitation there was no mirror there this was an alteration bellarmin had insisted on he could not stand the lodging-house looking-glass over the lodging-house chimney-piece so he had the glass taken away and he substituted for it a screen which he well-nigh covered with photographs of celebrated persons and of men and women who were personally interesting to him but there was no photograph of lady saxon there doubtless she must at some time or other have given him one but if so he did not display it probably he kept it treasured apart and away somewhere was there in life anywhere a happier man than rolf bellarmin he was young he was handsome he had a graceful figure slender but vigorous and there was an almost antique air of good breeding about him although he was nothing of an aristocrat by birth but indeed only the second son of a very successful business man in one of the great provincial cities the bellarmins to be sure were understood to have good blood in their veins even though of later years some of them had succeeded and some of them had failed in the effort to make money in the ways of commerce and industry rolf's father had a great ambition not for himself but for his sons and as the elder loved business and the younger detested it he resolved to make a liberal allowance to rolf and start him in life as a gentleman rolf took to the calling very kindly he passed through the training of a public school and a university in the regular fashion but he had some extra studies in paris and bonn as well and then he went boldly into politics he had the gift or the genius of success he threw himself upon a constituency and was elected no one expected him to make much of a figure in parliament he seemed cut out for mere social success but he contrived to play a conspicuous political part from the very beginning there was something winning about his youth his bright ways his refined medieval looking face and his well modulated voice and let it be added his audacity which was in such odd contrast to his appearance he had an absolute faith in himself 
after he had made his first speech which was what some one called a rattling success a friend of long experience in parliament cautioned him that he must take more pains to catch the tone of the house catch the tone of the house was the reply of that brazen youngster that abominable sing-song not if i know it let the house catch my tone if it likes or if it can the sage adviser shuddered but young bellarmin went his own way kept to his own tone and before two sessions he had a little knot of imitators he was always taking divisions moving adjournments, coming boldly up to the rescue of some forlorn independent member, to whose Tuesday evening crochet no one but Bellarmine would think of giving countenance. He despised no one. He made friends everywhere. He soon attracted the notice of the conservative leader, for Rolfe had gone in as what he liked to call a progressive Tory, and the leader was pleased with his buoyancy, his brilliant animal spirits, his evident delight in all the life and all the ways of the house of commons bellarmin had a good stock of more or less superficial information on almost all subjects likely to come up in parliament he knew enough of most things to be able to make some use of any fresh facts at all events he knew enough to be able to talk without talking obvious nonsense one evening he came in rather late flush from a dinner party with gorgeous flower in faultless dress coat a debate was obviously breaking down the conservatives then in opposition were trying to make something out of a foreign question on which a motion had been put down for papers on going into committee of supply the government had laid some papers on the table to meet the demand had in legal phrase paid so much into court and the opposition did not seem able to carry on the discussion in face of that fact the leader for reasons of his own particularly wished it to be carried on for the whole evening some of his weighty men his big guns were not yet on the field and he kept looking anxiously at the doors in came bellarmin ask bellarmin to speak the leader said in a voice low as an evening breeze but distinctly audible to bellarmin as well as to the party whip for whom it was intended bellarmin felt his cheek glow with pride and delight to be thus specially invited to take part in a failing fight by his leader was a compliment such as one might have had from a caesar or a napoleon on the field of some desperate battle the whip came to bellarmin chief wants you to speak he whispered what is it all about asked bellarmin breathlessly what am i to say oh it's right information in papers wholly insufficient pitch into ministry you know was the comprehensive and luminous reply and the whip scuttled away after having thrust a blue book into bellarmin's hand bellarmin began to read the letters all dancing before him just at that moment the minister who was speaking came to an end of his discourse with the declaration that he was convinced the universal judgment of the house would admit that the government had produced ample and sufficient information for the guidance of all honourable members and that the house might now be permitted without further delay to get into the business of supply the hint was enough for bellarmin the moment the minister sat down indeed before he had got to his seat bellarmin leaped to his feet after the manner of one who has been choking all the evening with a hitherto vain desire to unburthen his soul of something it is his duty and mission to say mr speaker he began the right honourable gentleman who has just sat down has been talking of the ample and sufficient information contained in the pages of the blue book which i hold in my hand ample and sufficient information i wonder if the right honourable gentleman really believed that he could either cajole or bully the house into an acceptance of the contents of this worthless book as ample and sufficient information the minister in question was a man of violent temper and bellarmin knew this and expected some interruption which might give him a chance of even a momentary glimpse into the contents of the blue book the minister sprang to his feet i rise to order mr speaker he said in a tone of half suppressed fury i wish to ask you sir if it is in order for an honourable member to charge a minister of the crown with the desire to cajole or bully the house of commons 
Bellarmin did not care three straws how the point of order was decided. He was only trying, meanwhile, to get some rapid notion of the general subject of the blue book. Up to this moment, he did not know whether it was a question of home or foreign politics. Now, to his immense relief, he saw it had something to do with Russia. His chief, appreciating the situation, came to his assistance in good time. On that point of order, Mr. Speaker, he blandly said, may I direct your attention to the fact that my honorable friend, oh, how Bellarmine's young heart beat with pride to hear the great conservative leader speak of him as my honorable friend, did not accuse the right honorable gentleman of any desire to cajole or bully the house. Cries of, oh, oh, from the ministerial benches interrupted the orator, and now the house began to fill in the eager hope of a scene of some kind. I do not understand the meaning of these interruptions, the conservative chief went calmly on. I fancy the honorable gentlemen who indulge in them do not understand their meaning any more than I do. I said that my honorable friend did not charge the right honorable gentleman with any desire to cajole or bully the house. My honorable friend put a mere hypothesis. There were new cries of, oh, oh. Yes, I repeat it, a mere hypothesis. He merely asked whether the right honorable gentleman really believed that he could either cajole or bully the house into a certain belief, into the belief that these papers contain ample and sufficient information. This ingenious interpretation was greeted with delighted cheering from the benches of opposition, and much laughter and diverse manifestations of various emotion from other quarters. The speaker rose with becoming gravity, and said that, although it might have been better, perhaps, if some other form of expression had been used, he could not take it on himself to declare that the honorable member had been actually transgressing the rules of order. Bellarmine had got all he wanted. He had seen that the blue book was something about Russia and was quite content. Once fairly started on the designs of Russia and the danger to England from a ministry blind or indifferent to such designs, there was no reason why Bellarmine should not go on talking for hours. Every now and then he read at random from the blue book some paragraph or passage, and then demanded of the house, in language of indignant eloquence, whether such pitiful crumbs of information doled out to Parliament on such a subject could be held to satisfy the just demands of the House of Commons, or to fulfill the duty of a government. Not half a dozen members in the House had read one line of the blue book, or had the least idea whether the information contained in this or that paragraph was ample or inadequate. The Under Secretary for Foreign Affairs could be seen rapidly fluttering the pages of his blue book to get at some of the passages which Bellarmine was criticizing. But before he had quite time to possess himself of the meaning of one paragraph, Bellarmine was off to another. At last, Bellarmine's chief, who was listening with a bland and smiling face, saw that his heavy men had come up. Tell Bellarmine he may stop whenever he likes, he whispered, and Bellarmine, winding up with some sentences of glowing patriotic passion, sat down, much relieved, and wondering within himself what he had been saying all the time. That was very well done, his chief whispered, turning round in his place to nod to Bellarmine, and Bellarmine felt like Othello, that if it were now to die, twere now to be most happy. Bellarmine had now got far beyond that stage of his career when a tour de force of this kind could be expected of him. He was the recognized leader of a party, a small party, it is true, but a party that had considerable influence in putting the liberals out of office, and had at present much influence in enabling the conservatives to stay in office. Bellarmine's little group was composed almost altogether of young men. They had faith in what they believed to be the principles of progressive Toryism. Progressive Toryism, they held, could do everything for England by taking necessary reform in time. Progressive Toryism must move with the age, must invigorate itself with the spirit of the time. Progressive Toryism was great in catchwords. Why not? Youth always has faith in catchwords. When progressive Toryism proudly proclaimed that 
we march with the movement of the times progressive toryism was as well satisfied as though it were really marching in fact was quite assured that it was marching bellarmin represented the juventus mundi of toryism the youthful ardor which believing it could not live without a principle was satisfied to live with the catchword it was the old story of ixion and the cloud ixion believed he was embracing juno while he was only throwing his futile arms around a cloud bellarmin and his friends believed they had got firm hold of their principle and were all the time in possession only of their catchword the elders for the most part had found out long ago that they could get on very comfortably without either catchword or principle bellarmin's social success was not the least wonderful part of his career he had come up to london almost unknown he never saw the interior of the house of commons until the day when he came to take his seat there as a member of parliament he suddenly found that he had the gift of knowing people the gift of being taken up by society he had not been aware that he had this gift he had not thought anything about it he wanted to be in the political world he was ambitious of a seat in parliament and he had vague notions that when he got into the house of commons he should be able to do something in some line or other but he had not bestowed one thought on mere success in society he got suddenly taken up however by this and that great house he soon became a man whom it was the right sort of thing the necessary thing to have at people's houses we must have mr bellarmin of course smart people said all the more because it was not by any means easy to have mr bellarmin bellarmin enjoyed all this mightily he had not quite got over even yet the delight of seeing his name in the newspapers the one thing he wanted was someone to write to and tell all about his success his speeches in the house of commons his dinners his luncheons his visits to great country houses his brother would not care a straw for hearing anything of the kind and although he knew his father would feel gratified by the fullest account of his son's successes yet somehow bellarmin felt ashamed to say much to him on the subject when he rode home many times he found himself wishing that he had a sister to whom he could send long confidential letters telling her about his good fortune and his enjoyment of life telling her what the newspapers said about him and what various great ladies said to him and how kind they all were and how easy after all it was to get on in good london society one can write these things to one's sister to a sweetheart one can't exactly she would be sure to think her lover was forgetting her in the society of people much smarter than she she would be jealous of the great ladies and would assume that they were as a matter of course young ladies and handsome and that they were making love to the lover and that the lover was falling in love with them and the sweetheart would let all this be seen only too plainly in her letters and then the lover would write about such things no more and would keep all his little triumphs to himself but the sister would not mind even though the kindly great ladies were all young and lovely the sister would never feel jealous or think herself forgotten and she would read with delighted eyes every word of praise that was spoken of her brother and would never for a moment think him egotistic or grow tired of his writing always about himself so bellarmin just wanted a sweet sister to write letters to and in the fullness of his still young and fresh heart he once let out as much to lady saxon she looked at him out of her deep eyes and said let me be your sister mr bellarmin i am sure i should like to have such a brother and i have no brother come to me to-day best of brothers at three o'clock I want to talk to you about something very important and interesting. Don't fail me on any account. This was the whole of a first little letter signed J.S., which Bellarmin received after the compact was made. It was the prelude to a volume. Lady Saxon had taken on herself the part of a sister ever since the day when she invited him to put a brother's confidence in her. She was too young as yet even to affect that mother's place in a young man's interest which coquettish matrons sometimes find very attractive with youth 
but the sister's part was suitable to any age and allowed of a charming and easy familiarity between her and her adopted brother it was the part of an elder sister decidedly and permitted lady saxon to take the initiative in giving advice or even administering reproof when occasion suggested she saw that bellarmin very much enjoyed the position thus given to him and was quite delighted to be petted as a brother or even scolded as a brother the scolding indeed was only petting in another and sometimes a more captivating form what could be more delightful to a young man than to be sent for to the boudoir of a beautiful and clever woman in order to receive a scolding for not having done something which according to her judgment would have been for his political and personal advancement lady saxon seemed to move in an atmosphere of sensuous emotion she carried her atmosphere with her around her wherever she went her looks her movements her figure her voice all gave out with them that bewitching sense of womanhood of woman's sex which is so magnetic to the temper of a young man the quietest most ordinary words she spoke seemed to ask the man whom she was addressing why don't you make love to me i know you are longing to do it i look into your eyes with mine and i read all your feelings there come make love to me i shall not be angry you may get nothing else by it but at least you shall not get a scolding nor a lecture on morality this was one of lady saxon's fascinations she seemed to put herself frankly on man's level to accept him and his passions without affectation of thinking him any better than he was she won many a man's heart by letting him plainly see that she quite understood his sensuous feeling towards herself that she did not blame him for it that she knew it could not be otherwise that she knew what he would have if he could and that although he was not to have it yet he was not to be censured by her in any way because of his impulses and his desires she was not in truth a passionate woman had she been so she could not have exercised over so many men the supremacy which she enjoyed so much the lion tamer does not feel the fierce rage of the lion had she been a passionate woman she could not possibly have escaped the scandal which so far at least had not seriously affected her fame short as had been lady saxon's career in london she was already notorious for daring flirtation there were men who envied ralph bellarmin his position and there were men who it was whispered shared the position with him lady saxon had more than one elder brother in the political world society wondered and speculated upon the meaning of lord saxon's complaisance was he still infatuated blind or only indifferent lord saxon was a man whose feelings it was difficult to guess habitually silent heavy and awkward he looked utterly unemotional he was supposed to be entirely engrossed in politics he had never been a london man in the conventional sense he was scarcely known in fashionable drawing-rooms his early manhood had been stormy and it was said that he had occasioned considerable uneasiness to the duke his father he had gone for racing had patronized ballet girls and committed follies he had built a theatre at the command of a beautiful burlesque actress who had a great reputation for ruining men she did not quite ruin lord saxon she deceived him and he found her out and from that time a change took place in his manner of living he gave up racing and ballet girls and theatres and took to politics instead he had become in a certain sense a power in politics he was looked upon as a sort of skid to the liberal wheel and likely to retard any violent innovations he was slow to make up his mind as to the course he would pursue and equally slow to swerve from it he was always opposed to wars and daring schemes of reform he could make a weighty speech the result of deliberate preparation and careful verification of facts and statistics but his delivery was awkward and hesitating his voice monotonous and he had none of that magnetic sympathy that spontaneity and adaptiveness to the hour which distinguished his enthusiastic and impulsive colleague sir victor champion he worked hard and took as much pains in acquiring statistical information 
as if he had been qualifying for an examination in political economy he had serious ideas as to the duties of landed proprietors and the abuse of aristocratic privileges he had little time for social or it might even be said for domestic enjoyment in the early days of his reformation ambitious mothers had made a dead set at him but to no avail and he had so long been given up as a match that the sudden announcement of his marriage was a shock rather than a disappointment no one knew anything about the affair till it was an accomplished fact the baroness langenwald had never been heard of till she appeared as lady saxon and burst in her wonderful beauty on english society an ample justification of any act of folly lord and lady saxon did not go about a great deal together and lady saxon had admirers but that was all lady saxon was a very clever woman far too clever a woman to allow her influence to become weakened by disuse she knew the man she had to deal with knew his weakness and his strength knew that she had captivated him in the first instance by her daring independence her impulsive frankness and a certain imperious air of mastery combined with that peculiar sensuous witchery that has been spoken of she knew that she was not the more likely to retain her hold upon him by adopting the attitude of a patient grisel the cleopatra part was much more effective and she could play it well perhaps she had spoken truly when she described her husband as her slave and her convenience she had only to exert her power of fascination and she could bend the great heavy sullen-looking creature in whichever direction she pleased but she did not always please to exert herself or even to disguise the fact that he bored her supremely she bade him do this or do that attend her or absent himself and he obeyed rewarded by a contemptuous smile or caress it was her mood just now to be deeply interested in politics and to keep him closely in that groove she had an ambition to open a salon and to make her drawing-room a rallying point of the liberal camp she wished to attract champion to her house she urged her husband to invite him to insist upon his coming but champion did not come his personal relations with lord saxon were not of an intimate kind he evaded the invitations pleaded disinclination for society and then lady saxon had a wild vindictive longing to make her power felt somehow to undermine his influence to split his party she had a vague intention of working against him of using bellarmine as a weapon but first she must discover if any opportunity of discovery presented itself whether champion was in very truth indifferent as he seemed she would make the opportunity and for this reason she frequented the house of commons her humour was of this kind when suddenly by favouring chance she and champion were drawn together for the first time since they had been lovers and now her mood in relation to bellarmine had changed end of volume one chapter ten volume one chapter eleven of the rebel rose by justin mccarthy and rosa campbell prayed this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter eleven Latera scripta lord and lady saxon lived in seymour place there was a stately forbidding-looking mansion in st james square ready for their occupancy when the old duke should be called to a better world but this was an event which for other than filial reasons lord saxon would gladly see postponed as long as possible he was not anxious to change his seat in the house of commons for one in the house of lords lord saxon before his marriage had a set of rooms in athelstane house in which mansion the duke and duchess and their unmarried daughters only lived for a few weeks in the season but though there was space and to spare for two establishments it did not suit lady saxon to be domiciled even for a few weeks under the same roof as the duchess lady saxon had an oriental taste which she had exercised in the decoration of her house in seymour place she was fond of bizarre effects and brilliant colouring and when she appeared in public 
like to be seen with a retinue her private apartments which looked out upon the park were furnished after her own fancy it was her custom to receive her intimate friends here when she returned from her drive at six o'clock and to have the entree at this hour was quite a different thing from being invited to lady saxon's formal parties bellarmin had often passed through the moorish anteroom with its wonderful arabesque ceiling its fretwork carving its hanging lamps in filigree silver its huge vases and magnificent draperies and he knew the pretty little japanese waiting-maid lady saxon's latest caprice who stood outside her mistress's boudoir and looked as though she had just stepped out of the mikado she ushered him into a most strange and luxurious apartment the walls of which were hung with red and gold peacocks embroidered upon a blue satin ground where each low chair and divan was a marvel of exquisite embroidery and each cabinet bronze and bit of lacquer work might have taken its place in the south kensington museum but lady saxon's sanctum was not in the least like a showroom in a museum it was very gorgeous but the eye rested nowhere on an inharmonious spot of colouring a piece of defective grouping or an incongruous effect lady saxon's old tokyo and satsuma ware was the joy and envy of connoisseurs but it did not obtrude its costliness and merely blended agreeably with the background no one would have suspected that the quaintly shaped pottery bowls which were filled with hothouse flowers or enclosed palms and tropical plants were almost unique as specimens of their period on first entering this room bellarmin had felt a sense of bewilderment so many uncanny monsters peered at him from walls and tables lady saxon had a fine taste in monstrosities sea serpents with grotesque human heads twined the legs of the tea-table dragons guarded the fireplace demons with tails and fins climbed over the chairs or did duty as footstools strings of hideous ivory masks festooned the drapery of the mantelpiece but after a time the confusion of colouring the demons and the monsters wrought themselves into the curious fascination of the place and of its occupant lady saxon called this room her confessional and certainly it seemed a spot which might well invite confidences of a tender kind and she herself appeared a fitting priestess of such a shrine she sat in a low wide lounge propped up by gold embroidered cushions and she wore a sort of robe of some rich velvety material of a deep yellow colour which toned with her yellow hair she looked bellarmin thought like some wonderful orange-coloured lily or orchid such as he had seen in tropical houses there was in her whole appearance in her glowing eyes her slow smile the soft undulations of her form something rare exotic and enervating to the senses she did not rise as he came in but held out her hand to him with a welcoming look at the sight of her a glow suffused his being it was a kind of intoxication he longed to press her hand to his lips but upon this he could not venture lady saxon in spite of her audacity had an imperious way of dealing with her admirers and of keeping them at a respectful distance she was always on guard even when she seemed most open to attack in her hand she held a copy of the park lane pictorial and it was open at the portrait and biography of mary beaton you see she said i am studying the genealogy and the claims of our heroine of last night it's all very ridiculous bellarmin took a chair near her yes he said with a faint hesitation it is ridiculous but it is picturesque lady saxon went on your mary stuart is delightfully picturesque the old gentleman with the scar is picturesque too and so is the white-haired housekeeper who talks so much of the grand duchess of schwalbenstadt i think that if i were to ask the princess and her suite to one of my parties people would find them attractive this would be an odd house wouldn't it for your pretendress to make her debut in i shall ask miss beaton to dinner 
and i shall invite some highly respectable members of the house of commons and a detachment from the lords to come and inspect the claimant to the throne of great britain lady saxon's laugh jarred upon bellarmin he did not want to talk of mary beaton her name seemed as much out of place here as at madame spinola's the people who put that thing into the park lane pictorial have done her an injury and an injustice he said with some warmth such a flourish of trumpets is absurd she can't help being a steward and there's the beginning and the end of it all is it then why is she here she might just as well have stayed in schwalmenstadt one finds it conceivable that miss beaton might wish to see her own country said rolf her father was an english baron but i believe there is a claim he added to a property in the north which was confiscated ah said lady saxon and it is intended that some chivalrous young member with influence in the house should bring forward a motion for inquiry and restitution is that to be your part mr bellarmin in the meantime liberal and tory politicians are to be attracted and conciliated i should say that miss beaton might have a very good chance of getting her claims recognized if she paused as though she were deliberating no no rolf there are graver issues than that coming up there is something more important for you to do than play the part of a political paladin to a pretty ambitious girl i have neither wish nor intention to play the part of paladin lady saxon tell me of these graver issues if we are to talk politics lady saxon leaned back against her cushions and looked at him thoughtfully for a minute or two bellarmin sometimes wondered if her eyes actually had some magnetic quality and if she were conscious of it and made use of it certainly they affected him peculiarly yes we are to talk politics she said and first i am going to give you some tea there was a train near her with a silver service and a tiny crystal liqueur flask koto lady saxon called and the japanese girl appeared with some fresh tea lady saxon poured out a cup and gave it to bellarmin he did not refuse the little glass of liqueur that koto handed him i will see no one said lady saxon koto made an obeisance and disappeared and lady saxon and bellarmin were alone again lady saxon had put down the park lane pictorial and now leaned forward her hands clasped on her knee still looking intently at him have you anything to confess to-day she asked abruptly there's something on your mind come out with it his voice trembled a little and his eyes seemed unable to move themselves from hers i have something on my mind and in my heart at this very moment are you really not afraid to know what it is afraid i was never afraid of anything in my life or of anybody except myself go on i shan't flinch however dreadful it may be i shouldn't mind that i shouldn't mind if you showed some sort of feeling so long as you were not scornful and angry and didn't forbid me to come near you i'm a mortal coward if there's a risk of losing your friendship oh that would stand a shock she answered softly i think i can promise you that short of murder or high treason you won't lose my friendship if you care to keep it i like you ralph bellarmin i am proud of you i wish you success and happiness i have your career as close to my heart i am as fond of you as if if you were my brother oh he exclaimed that's it i don't want to be your brother that relation is impossible with you why are you so kind to me lady saxon why do you encourage me to say daring things because i want to inspire you to do them because i am daring and ambitious for myself and for those whom i admire now i've one virtue mr bellarmin and that is frankness and i am going to be frank with you i can read your thoughts and i'll read them to you if you'll let me she gently furled and unfurled a fan of yellow feathers which had lain beside her and went on very deliberately you 
are in a state of irritation against me against circumstances against everything you are angry because we are only what we are you are distrustful of yourself and you are distrustful of me in spite of what you said a moment since you have an impulse to end everything to keep away from me and to break off in a highly virtuous and melodramatic fashion our harmless and pleasant friendship you want to have done with this brotherly and sisterly sham that's what you call it yourself you fancy yourself the good young hero from the country who falls a prey to the london peg wolfington that's how it is rolf she touched his cheek with the feathers of her fan and looked into his eyes with more of tender reproach than mirth but my dear boy you are no more the virtuous hero from the country than i am peg woofington it went out of date all that kind of sentiment before you came into parliament progressive toryism must keep pace with the times you know oh lady saxon don't be cruel to me the young man reddened and put out his hand imploringly i am a good thought reader then well i never pretended to be younger than i am and to be stupid and to know nothing of men and their moods to do myself justice ralph i may say that i never in my life pretended more than was absolutely necessary you shouldn't laugh at me he said rather sullenly i didn't mean to laugh at you my poor boy and i think i understand young men experience is my magic it's the only sort of magic labelled that is the genuine article mind that this brother and sister business ralph is difficult to keep up you are quite right it is a sham but my brother when one cannot have realities one must make the best of shams there was a note of plaintive regret in her voice which dropped in sighing cadence bellarmin fancied that her eyes were tearful he imprisoned the hand and the slowly swaying fan she let her hand remain in his for a few moments then gently withdrew it and shook her head sadly new purposes and plans were in her mind since she last received bellarmin in her confessional she had made her compact with victor champion i can't be your brother he exclaimed passionately my feeling towards you isn't in the least brotherly i'm quite certain of that though what i do feel about you in the very depths of my heart puzzles me a great deal more than lord bosworth's foreign policy look here lady saxon you won't mind bluntness i know i'm not fool enough to imagine that what i feel or don't feel makes any difference to you if i thought you really cared an iota i shouldn't think for an instant about what was good or bad for myself but i can't do the platonics i want to take your hand i want a thousand mad things heaven knows what i want i don't rolf spoke in a quick boyish agitated manner looking at her straight all the time but she kept her eyes on her fan a man who wouldn't lose himself risk everything give up everything for a woman's sake is a cad the young fellow cried but when there's no question of that and the woman doesn't care and he is only certain at best of hurting himself severely and perhaps of being laughed at he broke off well she asked calmly he had better not make any pretenses to her or to himself i think you are dangerous to me lady saxon and that's the truth complimentary or uncomplimentary as you may take it i will take it as complimentary she answered since i want to believe that you are not making pretenses but have a real feeling for me i have a real feeling for you it's horribly real and that's the worst of it but i should not feel like that about you if you were my sister i should be very sorry if any one felt for my sister supposing i had one in that way being with you is like taking opium one wants more and more of it yes the thought has come into my mind more than once lately that it wouldn't be a bad thing if i were to give up altogether and run away and keep away until i am cured and then after a month or so come back and marry some charming girl with a fortune or a rich widow she need not be too young 
that would be a certain way of advancing your career you might indulge in the luxury of political principles then you have an example before you in sir victor champion he answered in her own vein providence might not be equally kind to me lady saxon gave a little laugh so on your way here you were meditating how to make your escape you needn't let it trouble you any longer from this moment mr bellarmin you are free i release you from all vows and promises this has been your prison and i have been your jailer well give a last look round and take your liberty she glanced about the pretty fantastic room and up at the embroidered peacocks he followed her eyes then rose and stood by the mantelpiece where he seemed lost in the examination of one of the grotesque ivory faces you are free she repeated pointing with her yellow fan as she spoke why don't you go i don't mean to take my liberty he answered stolidly looking at her straight not now not in this way i am ashamed of what i said to you why if it was true i dare say that my influence is pernicious are you sure that you don't mean politically and not morally perhaps do you take me for a delilah are you afraid of being drawn by my wiles from the straight paths of progressive toryism into crooked liberal ways oh my poor boy i am a more disinterested counsellor than any of the rest of them i don't make my living by politics he echoed her laugh but in a remorseful discomfited fashion how cruel you are i don't deserve your taunts you know well that your sympathy and counsel are inexpressibly valuable to me then why give them up why make difficulties by saying things you don't mean her voice had become plaintive again i am ambitious for you ralph not for the party oh don't you see don't you know he cried starting to his feet you must know how it is lady saxon's manner changed suddenly in her rippling laugh there was a sound of mockery do i see do i know oh how poor our english language is one realizes that in private theatricals and the great moments of life all this peroration and the climax not arrived at yet in french it would have gushed out with all the spontaneity and naturalness in the world jetami and she clasped her hands dramatically on her bosom or ayotamo or do you know spanish mr bellarmin she stopped seeing his white face rising she stood before him and laid her hand on his arm looking at him with a sort of caressing command she was almost as tall as he well then he said fiercely in plain english and without peroration i think i love you i am afraid i do yes and it's not a sentiment that i am proud of lady saxon did not in the least resent his roughness my poor rolf said she moving back slowly to her seat i'm not going to be melodramatic or to let you be melodramatic either do you think those three words haven't been said to me in most of the european languages and do you think i am any the worse wife to lord saxon on that account of course i knew that the platonic mood would not last it never does last people make up their minds to separate or they don't either way there is an end to the platonics but what then would it be such a serious thing even if you did love me i also love you josephine yes in a manner in a sort of fashion but i love some other things far better i love my ambition for you best of all this last shot of hers told upon him where is the ambitious man who does not delight to hear from the lips of a beautiful woman that his fame is dearer to her even than himself but with all his delight and the sudden revulsion from his fervid mood there came to the young man he was still very young a pang of distrust in his own capacity a dread amid all the confused pain and rapture that the woman's enthusiasm was rating him far too high dear lady saxon he said tenderly and he touched her hand as he spoke you are very good to me 
I'll try to talk sensibly and not to worry you about my feelings. The touch and the tone had something remorseful in them. The passion had gone from his voice. Somehow she had calmed his heated mood. She had wished to turn him in another direction from that to which he was tending, and he answered obediently to the rein. You mustn't expect too much from me, he went on. You mustn't think too much of what I can do in politics. You must not, indeed. What man of your years, she asked impatiently, has made such a place for himself in the House of Commons? Why, you are only a boy. Yes, perhaps there it is, a sort of political infant phenomenon. And we know what the infant phenomenon grows up to. I was very young when I first got into the house, and quite unknown, and I had plenty of schoolboy cheek and little reverence for my seniors, except one, de Carmel, who was my hero and my ideal, and I rattled away at anything, and I could do the thing easily and talk nonsense fluently, and I suppose I talked better than people expected, and so I was set down as a rising young man. But one can't always be a rising young man, can one? And I sometimes doubt whether I have anything better to show after these years than I had in my first session. He lowered his voice and spoke those last words pathetically. He had really often felt the doubt rising within him lately. Come, she said, I think all the better of you for these little gleams of distrust now and again, these bursts of stage fright. They show that you have the true artistic temperament. But the real actor never gives way to his stage fright. He fights against it and conquers it. What you want, my friend, is a field, and I am going to show you the field. She paused complacently. She enjoyed all this. He looked at her, and he too waited. Did any sudden sense of distrust spring up in his mind? She, the wife of Lord Saxon, how did she propose to find a field for an enterprising young Tory Democrat? Was she speaking as Lord Saxon's wife? She quickly settled that question. I want you, Ralph, to join with Victor Champion. That is what I mean that you should do. With Victor Champion? But don't you understand, my dear Lady Saxon, it is out of the question. But you don't know, he added blankly. You absurd boy, why, of course I know. Somebody made overtures to you in Victor Champion's name, and you have been artfully trying to keep it from me. Oh, yes, I saw all that yesterday, and it was all cloudy, and you couldn't see your way. That was all right, that was then, but now it is now. That makes all the difference. Bellarmine involuntarily drew back. I don't see that much has changed since then, he said don't you i do then sir victor champion was only feeling his way now he sees it then he was only thinking of going on now he has made up his mind to go on the old wigs are done with rolf their day is past they sleep in ancient history like the monumental figures of the knights and their dames lying side by side with folded arms on the tombs in the ancient churches they are gone you see that at least, Rolf? Oh, yes, of course, he answered impatiently. Every fool sees that. Rude young man, because I see it? No, no, it is only a saying. Please go on. Well, the fossil conservatives can't do much, can they? Your whole career goes to show that you don't believe they can do anything. They can't do anything of themselves, certainly. But if they could be educated up, to the acceptance of some modern ideas they might be made a useful party under a leader who could lead yes and where is he ah de carmel is dead yes and lord bosworth is alive my dear rolf no one knows better than you that the day has quite gone by when a man in the house of lords could be the real leader of a great english party could you but ask de carmel what he thought yes i suppose that is so i suppose he began to feel that lately himself in the lords bellarmine assented somewhat reluctantly 
I used to believe in the House of Lords once, because of its picturesque side, I fancy. Radicalism is so confoundedly unpicturesque. The young man got up again and stood somewhat in the attitude of a declaimer, with one hand clenched upon the palm of the other. Curiously enough, this was a gesture common with champion in debate, and Lady Saxon knew this and noted his unconscious imitation. I wish I could believe in the possibility of a great leader in the House of Lords, Lady Saxon said, with a sigh and a distinct shrug of the shoulders. You, Lady Saxon? Why do you particularly wish that? Don't you see? Because I am an ambitious woman, wildly ambitious, not for myself. I have got about all that a woman can, well, get in that way, but for any man in whom I take a real interest. Don't be too self-conceited, Mr. Bellarmine. I dare say that I should be a model wife and famous helpmate if only there were no House of Lords. I don't quite understand. He sat down once more close to her. No? Well, I suppose not. I'll tell you. If Lord Saxon's father were not an old man, if Lord Saxon were not doomed by fate to succeed him in that hopeless house of lords, well, I really believe I should turn all my energies to the task of driving on my poor, heavy, reluctant husband to the career of a great leader in politics. You know he has some capacity, Rolf. We all know that he has capacity. Some say that he has great capacity. But what is the use? He must go into the House of Lords, and when he gets there, he becomes a mere figurehead. If he be even so much, and he will be quite content and happy. No, I can't make anything of Saxon. I want to make something of you, and it is to be done through Sir Victor Champion. What is Champion going to do? Bellarmin asked. Great things, Rolf to create a new party, call up a new spirit in English politics. In any case, your place is with him. The future is with him and will be with you if only you make up your mind, pull yourself together, and take my advice. She paused and gazed at him from under her level eyebrows. He looked at her in return but did not answer. I know Victor Champion, she said steadily. Her voice seemed clear as a bell. I discovered what was in him. Well, never mind how long ago. I am not going to tell you that. I don't make up. You can see that for yourself. Yes, I appreciated him, and he appreciated me. If only we had had the good luck to get married then. It would have been better for me now, and better for him. I am better for you too, perhaps, in one sense, for you would never have been in this dangerous confessional of mine. I should have been a devoted wife to him. Why do you tell me this just now? Bellarmine asked, with something like annoyance in his voice. He remembered Tressel's hints, and he wondered what Tressel knew. He had not come to Lady Saxon's confessional, surely, to hear her confession of tender feelings towards Sir Victor Champion. "'So you are jealous already, my impetuous youth,' she replied, with a kindly glance at him. "'You are jealous of those old days long before your time. "'Where were you then, I wonder? Eaton? Harrow? Where? "'You forget, my dear friend, that I saw the sun before you did, "'and had time to get through and get over a good many likings and loves. "'If you will put it that way, before you had grown out of the hands of your nursery governess.' Yes, Rolf, my heart ought to be an extinct volcano by this time, but somehow it isn't. He wanted to press her a little on this subject of Sir Victor Champion. Quite without premeditation, he put his hand on her wrist to check her and call her attention. Her pulse was beating as steadily and calmly as that of a Roman soldier on guard, a shadow of surprise and disappointment, dissatisfaction of some sort, passed over his face. Lady Saxon caught sight of it as it passed and read its meaning. You think I tell you all this too coolly, too composedly, with the candor which our French friends would call brutal, she said. 
I don't call it anything, only I don't quite know why you tell it to me, he answered bitterly. No, to be sure. You men are to have all the flirtations and all the loves you please, and to go from one woman to another woman, and if a woman only confesses to a man that somewhere about the time of his birth she did rather like another man, lo and behold our heroic youth is angry and offended. I am not quite so young as all that, Bellarmine said almost roughly. Sir Victor Champion is not quite old enough to be my father, and you could not by any possibility pass yourself off for my mother. Are we not wandering from our subject? she asked with a smile. Very much, I think, he answered almost with a frown. Yes, well, let us go back to it. You were asking me why I told you of my old devotion to Sir Victor Champion. Why you told me, and now? Quite so, dear impetuous youth, for this reason, that you should plainly understand why I am working for Sir Victor Champion now, because he is the only man whom I loved in my youth, the man I would have married if I could then. Such a memory is sacred to me, such a past. She put all the emphasis of her sweet and thrilling voice on that word past, giving it a significance in Bellarmine's ears which set his pulses tingling once more. Such a past has to me the sanctity of a dying bequest. Victor Champion understands me as perfectly as I understand him. I want to help him, if I can, to success because of the past. I want to help you to success because of the present. Because I am fond of you, Ralph, and I want you to go in and win. Don't you see? In these closing words which spoke of him, she dropped all her melodramatic style, and her manner was seemingly simple and natural. She put her hand in kindly tender fashion on his. The young man's mind was passion-tossed. The touch charmed away all his distrust for the moment. He caught her fair plump hand and kissed its fingers. It was not a small hand. Why should it be small? Lady Saxon was a woman of what sculptors call heroic size, but it was very white and soft. It had perhaps too many rings on for a lover's kisses. Bellarmine kissed more ring than finger. Lady Saxon smiled at him in a soft, bewildering way. No, no, we mustn't have any raptures, please. We are talking politics now. We have done with even platonics for the present. I want you to think over all that I have said. I want you to allow yourself to come into Victor Champion's way and get to know what he really intends to do. You will soon find that he is the man who really sees his way and that the next great, truly great, English party is to be called into existence by him. I will not, if I can, have you left out in the cold. I want you to understand him, to appreciate him, to work with him, to be his right-hand man, in time to succeed him. There, you have my whole meaning, and my whole secret is out now. She rose to her feet, hastily in an impulse as that of a woman who has betrayed herself has allowed herself to say what she did not intend to say no more today she cried out with passion in her voice and then she stopped for a moment and seemed to control herself and smiled and spoke in a quiet tone no more today ralph we have said enough at least i have said enough one word he put out his hand and she sank again on her divan as if she would listen Sir Victor Champion knows nothing of this? Of what? Of my talking to you in this way? About this? Yes, Lady Saxon. Rolf, how could you ask such a question? Do you think he would accept a woman's intervention in such a thing? Or that I would put you in such a position? Ah, I ought not to have asked the question, Bellarmine said abashed. You ought not, no, but I forgive you. You don't quite, quite understand me yet. No, I talk to you on my own account, for I have set my heart on your success. I want you to promise that you will think well over what I have said, 
that isn't much for me to ask after after what you told me and if you come in champion's way well do not keep coldly out of his way now that's all good-bye ralph my brother shall i still call you my brother she took the young man's hand in her own and looked into his eyes with her own swimming eyes and almost seemed as if she would draw him towards her her voice seemed the voice of sincerity itself bellarmin's heart was deeply touched dusk was setting in and the dimness and the perfumes and the strange gorgeous colouring of the room heightened the sense of half poetical intoxication under which he felt himself languishing he spoke passionately oh he cried you do me harm i must have been mad to think it i am mad sometimes when i have been kept away from you and when you seem cold and sweet and mocking when i remember that you are lady saxon and i poor ralph bellarmin josephine to say that i am yours ready glad to be counselled by you and i know that you would never counsel me against my honest convictions is to promise everything what should i wish for more than to be led on to success by you he flung himself down on a stool before her in an adoring attitude his eyes beaming with all a young man's ardour upraised to hers she stooped over him from her greater height but even as she did so seemed to interpose her soft hand as a barrier between him and her you must go she said go at once yes i accept your devotion for your own sake for the sake of your career because you are dear to me if you will but i will not urge you against your convictions i only ask you to keep your mind open to give yourself this chance to become the man of the future but go now write to me to-night ralph a letter straight from your heart no conventionality from your very very heart she said the words very low almost in his ear her head near to his now as she ended she bent her face lower still so that it seemed to him her lips actually touched his forehead actually sealed the compact with the lightest faintest suggestion of a kiss faint and light as it was the touch brought the blood to bellarmin's cheeks and a wave of passion to his heart he rose from his seat but she said to him vehemently go you must go now and almost pushed him from her so rolf left her he passed the little japanese girl in the anteroom and went downstairs dreamlike and found himself in the glaring street that night he wrote to lady saxon from the house of commons a letter in which for the first time he committed to paper and to written words a wild and passionate declaration of his gratitude to her in which he spoke of the bond he had made and protested his lasting devotion his love he went home in the early morning hours after a droning debate he slept uneasily and his first waking thought was of the letter it brought him a pang of shame of dread almost of remorse it seemed to him that under the influence of an intoxication which in his saner moments he could recognize his intoxication he had signed away his liberty whether lady saxon attached any importance to the deed and this he was hardly vain enough to think or as he put it to himself to hope the fact remained the same lady saxon read the letter with delight she read it with full satisfaction she wanted to captivate champion but yet not to lose bellarmin she was never content with any flirtation which did not give her the triumph of a written declaration of love such letters were to her just the same trophies of conquest as the rings which the clever wife of the genie in the arabian nights what marvellous stupid folk these genies were used to wear and delight in in bellarmin's case there was a little more than the ordinary joy of victory josephine had a pervading idea that the letter might turn out to be useful somehow and at some time she did not exactly know when it might in all the varying changes of the coming days happen to be of some importance to her that she could produce a letter from such a man as bellarmin telling her that he loved her 
so she put it carefully apart from other letters and she felt pleased and her conscience was quite at rest end of volume one chapter eleven Volume 1, Chapter 12 of The Rebel Rose by Justin McCarthy and Rosa Campbell Prade. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 12, Mary's Reception But in spite of Bellarmine's impassioned declaration, in spite of his still more impassioned letter, Lady Saxon did not feel certain of her prey. Love had not blinded her cool judgment, and she saw through his reactionary moods and impulses, and his struggle with the worst part of himself lady saxon had watched such a conflict many a time before it always amused her and her interest in the doubtful issue never lost its keenness there was a good deal of the instinct of the savage in lady saxon she liked to inflict pain to know that she had the power of inflicting it she had an unconquerable egotism a thirst for power for excitement for mental stimulant of some kind in her life she had felt one passionate consuming attachment and that had been for victor champion when she had laid her snares for lord saxon the thought of champion had been as prominent in her mind as that of the splendid position she might achieve she had won the position and though it delighted her less than she had fancied it would she exulted in it nevertheless there was still something she wished to win, something which she meant to hold as well as the position she had gained, if possible, but for which she would throw up the position if needs be. This had been the end and aim of her interest in politics. The fact that Champion was her husband's colleague gave dramatic point to the situation and intensified its zest. Lady Saxon was, in some sense, an anachronism she would have better suited an earlier civilization she was unscrupulous enough for a medician court she would have reveled in the luxury and the intrigues of the lower empire for the present with her one supreme object still in view lady saxon was resolved to feed her craving for power and excitement as best she could bellarmine's admiration still gratified her besides he had now become an instrument which might be turned to useful account by winning bellarmine to champion's side she might come nearer to her great aim and in any case bellarmine amused her and he should not marry the nice girl with money which was the fate his friends predicted for him he should be her slave her toy and if he were in any danger of being attracted by mary stuart beaton well lady saxon would advance daringly into the enemy's country all the movements should be made under her own eyes and if she were to be worsted which was improbable she would at least have the excitement of the fight so some days later when bellarmine was lunching in seymour place lady saxon announced her intention of calling on the princess that afternoon and she told Bellarmine that it was her wish he should also pay his respects to the representative of the Stuarts. He was surprised and showed it. He stammered, and for a young statesman exhibited a most ingenuous confusion. Yes, said Lady Saxon, the princess holds her court today. I have found out all about it. I want to see what sort of ceremony goes on at this English St. Germain's. Shall I be permitted a fauteuil do you suppose bellarmine said that he ought to be at the house nonsense she rejoined it is only solid serious politicians like lord saxon who are interested in statistics and who put in an appearance at question time come i insist upon your going stay she added in an imperious undertone these people will have gone presently Lady Saxon had been giving one of those informal little luncheon parties for which she was famous, where anybody and everybody might be found, except Lord Saxon. He exercised some slight jurisdiction in the matter of dinners, but his wife asked whom she pleased to luncheon. She usually had a politician or two of the less serious type, 
she was not particular whether Tory or liberal, a favorite actor or actress, a bishop, perhaps, possibly a foreign anarchist as mild as a sucking lamb at her table, and some smart young guardsman and frisky woman of fashion. After luncheon, cigarettes were smoked in a fantastically decorated den behind Lord Saxon's study, and coffee and kimmel were handed round in a certain laxity of conversation. Just a piquant flavoring was permitted. There followed a good deal of light talk and explanation about the princess and her claims, which somehow grated disagreeably on Bellarmin. The young man was in a feverish and contradictory mood. He had a vague longing to escape from the scene, to breathe another atmosphere, and yet he was like the prisoner in an opium den, held by a fascination which he could not and would not resist. And all the time he felt disgust at himself and contempt for his own weakness. The other guests went away, and at last he was alone with Lady Saxon in the dully gorgeous room, in which the fumes of the scented cigarettes and odors of the aromatic coffee and the kimmel blended with eastern perfumes for which she had a fancy. Lady Saxon seemed in keeping with the room. She was quaintly dressed in some soft yellow-brown liberty stuff, the color she was so fond of, with her yellow hair piled above her forehead and a barbaric-looking jewel fastening the lace at her throat. She came close to the young man and smiled at him in her peculiar way. Well, she said, you are thinking of something. You were at the German embassy last night, he said. Yes. And Champion was there? Yes. And you sat and talked to him the whole evening in a little side room. Yes, she said again. Are you going to do me the honor to establish an espionage over my movements? Would you like to know of what we talked? You and he never seemed to have anything to say to each other, till quite lately. People have remarked it. Tell me, Josephine. Poor boy, she said in her sweet mocking tone. You are so impetuous. You let your feelings run away with you. That is not wise in a politician. You know that I have your good at heart. I don't want you to take the fever too severely. It is such a wasting fever, Rolf. It saps youth and energy and hope. No good comes of it, and it isn't a thing you can get over and be done with. It breaks out sometimes years afterwards, and then, oh, one can hardly be still for that restless longing to be, her voice sank almost to a whisper, to be with the one. She moved abruptly away from him. He looked after her with a sort of sullen wrath in his eyes. It had flashed over him that it was not of him she was thinking. Presently she came back and spoke in her light caressing manner. Did I not tell you that you were to come here less often, that you were to go and devote yourself to your country's service and make up your mind how far her institutions needed reforming? It isn't good for you to hang about me. You mustn't call me Josephine. I never said that I allowed that. You mustn't write me letters, which she laughed at him rebukingly, which are so pretty and so sweet, but which might occasion some uneasiness to Lord Saxon if, which isn't possible, they fell into his hands, and if he didn't understand his wife so thoroughly. So now go and put yourself into a hansom, and meet me in half an hour's time at the court of St. Germain's. There was something in the aspect of Mary Beaton's drawing-room, when Lady Saxon entered it, which made her think of the old-time court to which she had so jestingly alluded. The house was early Georgian, and the lofty rooms were panelled, and had the corner fireplaces, and the high narrow windows and stiff ornamentation of that period. The portraits on the walls added to the illusion the high-bred, melancholy, Stuart countenance seemed to haunt the place. Even the Beatons appeared to have been of the cavalier type, and two or three vivid paintings of Italian noblemen bore no relation to modern London. The furniture, old-fashioned and Georgian too, had been collected by Falcon and Lord Stonehenge, both determined that the surroundings should harmonize with the prominent figure. Mary Beaton was seated in a high-backed chair against a background of tapestry, 
which filled in a sort of recess and represented in faded colors some of the adventures of ulysses general falcon in a sort of undress uniform stood very erect near her chair and lady struthers standing behind it had the air of a lady in waiting mary beaton's costume of rich brocade quaint and straight falling with a ruffle of mechlin lace framing her throat and at her side a quaint chatelaine with a veritable pomander said to have been the property of the queen of scots was in keeping with the scene there were a good many people in the room but scarcely any who belonged to lady saxon's world some standing about others sitting on the slim leg stools and settees others looking at the collection of miniatures on the cabinets which were of historic interest a few passing in and out to the garden a walled-in enclosure with some old beech trees in full leaf and a grassy lawn and brilliant borders the birds were singing there and the scent of roses which in this sunny sheltered corner had come early into bloom floated pleasantly in above the subdued hum of conversation there rose every now and then a word in french or italian or german miss beaton was talking in french to a venerable catholic dignitary with cassock and cross who was listening attentively to her words lord stonehenge stood near the priest and in the group respectfully standing also lady saxon to her great surprise saw sir victor champion the little circle broke up as lady saxon entered her appearance seemed to produce in all some slight start of wonder general falcon made an abrupt movement lady struthers went through a sort of preening process and put on her blandest smile she was much gratified by this recognition of her mistress's social claims and her own on the part of the fashionable world mary got up and bade her visitor welcome her greeting a pretty mixture of girlish cordiality and native dignity sir victor bowed gravely and moved apart with the priest whom with his characteristic many-sidedness he had drawn into a discussion on ecclesiastical literature it was this alertness and receptivity this quick desire of culture in every field and openness to every claim and conviction which made sir victor champion the object of such admiration among his friends and sarcastic commentary among his enemies this thought flashed through lady saxon's mind while she was uttering sweet conventionalities to her hostess it was like him to be attracted by the romantic and historic associations that clung round the descendants of mary stuart it was like him to wish to inspect more closely this fantastic flower of bygone chivalry blooming in prosaic modern london lady saxon was not much disturbed by the thought so far she had no kind of affinity with such ideas and associations what sort of feudal instincts could she possess any more than emma hart that lady hamilton to whom she had once likened herself she only said in her mind that sir victor liked to be in touch with everything and that he was curious about the charming claimant he liked a sensation that taste he had in common with herself and she recognized and made allowance for the temperament but she knew very well that the sensations he liked were of a more poetic kind than those which delighted her most lady saxon had an odd candor towards her own soul she knew the pretense and scorned it even when she made it she knew that she had never appealed to that poetic strain in champion she knew only she did not care much now that she could never appeal to the poetic strain in bellarmin that subtle moonlight sentiment of life was for such women as mary for her passionate sun-glow ripe fruit red wine still she hated the girl who had inherited the crown of romance the girl who could inspire poetry why should mary beaton be the daughter of the stuarts why should josephine saxon be an emma hart lady saxon said a great many pretty things to miss beaton and she was gracious to lady struthers also and to general falcon the latter of whom replied with sardonic courtesy a steady look interchanged between the london lady and the soldier legitimist the paladin adventurer whose changing lot had thrown him among strange scenes and strange people told a great deal to both lady saxon had no definite personal association with falcon but she knew 
that he had crossed her path in the past and that he remembered her she guessed more than this it seemed to her that there was some sinister design in the manner in which he turned his gaze direct from her to sir victor champion standing apart conversing with the priest and back again with a kind of malign exultation to her face she was a fearless woman and indifferent to consequences but for the moment she had a spasm of the heart then her natural courage reasserted itself if i have a secret he has a secret too she thought and i will find his out and turn it into a weapon if he can do me harm i can surely be of use to him it might be worth while for each to buy off the other and failing the rest if there's war i never knew the man who was too strong for me all the time that she was thus taking inward counsel she smiled on mary and her companions she complimented the girl on her pretty house and lord stonehenge and falcon on the taste which had arranged it so appropriately she told mary that lord saxon was most anxious to meet her that her father-in-law took deep interest in the question of miss beaton's pedigree she declared that the portrait in the park lane pictorial had not done miss beaton justice and asked if she had not felt angry with the artist to whom its execution had been entrusted the girl flushed a little i did not know about it she said and i did not like it I was very angry with General Falcon for giving the people my photograph. I am not an actress, or... She paused, and just then a smile of bright girlish greeting broke over her face as she glanced suddenly towards somebody who had that moment come in. Lady Saxon, without looking round, felt jealously certain that it was Bellarmine, and she was right. He too looked glad. He was thinking, I knew she had nothing to do with that park lane pictorial affair he had overheard her words the deferential manner in which he returned mary's greeting irritated lady saxon he did not perceive her for the moment and there was a buoyancy about him as if he had determinedly shaken off some stupefying influence what had made him late ah it was explained tommy tressel cool indifferent with his half-shut eyes and a smile of gentle cynicism followed bellarmine and was forthwith presented to the representative of all the superstitions he was supposed to hold in abhorrence tressel in a drawing-room and tressel on the floor of the house of commons were two different beings ah said mary to bellarmine with frank cordiality i wondered whether you would get the card that i told lady struthers to send you you seem to have so many addresses mr bellarmine do all English politicians belong to all those clubs? I have to thank you, madame, for having done me the honor to remember me, said Bellarmine. I was very sorry not to see you when you called the other day, Mary went on. I want to talk to you, Mr. Bellarmine, more problems in political economy that I want explained. Oh, if I were a statesman, what would I not do? I did not dare to tell Sir Victor Champion just at first what I am thinking about why don't you do something for your own people instead of ah uh, mr bellarmine i know a great deal more about the poor people round your houses of parliament i think than you do but never mind we have a plan lord stonehenge has a plan he will talk to you about it by and by lady saxon you are not going yet i want to show you my garden i am so proud of my garden i have a plan too said lady saxon in which mr bellarmine may be included if he pleases i want you to dine at my house miss beaton and meet my husband and the duke of athelstane and some of our political friends she had come forward and as she looked at bellarmine the young man flushed and mary saw the flush saw that his bright boyish ease suddenly left him she saw too that he and lady saxon exchanged no formal greeting mr bellarmine has been lunching with me said lady saxon and he was so disingenuous or so polite as to let me think i had given him the information that it was your reception day i sent him on to announce my coming her manner clearly conveyed to mary beaton's sensitive ear that lady saxon and lady saxon alone had been the object of bellarmine's visit that he would not have come had she not bidden him 
the girl felt a little shock of recoil from both the woman and the man. She regretted her warmth. Her manner became ever so little constrained, though she smiled brightly. "'Your plan is a very delightful one, Lady Saxon,' she answered, "'and I gladly agree to it. My dear tyrant must be consulted, however, I presume, and she glanced up at Falcon. My guardian, Lady Saxon, seems to look upon the acceptance of an invitation as seriously as if it were the signing of a state treaty.' general falcon and lady struthers will of course come too said lady saxon turning to falcon who bowed with his characteristic solemnity they would not consider it becoming that my youth and inexperience should go anywhere without their protection laughed mary is it not so general do you understand that lord and lady saxon wish us to dine with them and to make acquaintance with some of their political friends could anything please you better since you are so anxious that i should learn exactly how england is governed from the people who govern her it appears said lady saxon her eyes turning from tressel and bellarmin to sir victor that miss beaton is in a fair way to establish a political salon ah sir victor i felt much flattered when he came here of his own accord to-day i am fascinated by sir victor lady saxon and his great charm is that he is not in the least political or what do you say philistine he might be a catholic or a jacobite and he is an english radical you puzzle me you english statesman she went on you seem so out of keeping with your professed characters there is mr bellarmin who calls himself a tory and you mr tressel i heard you speak in the house of commons but i could not see you i heard you denounce royalty and aristocracy and all the rest and yet and yet i am here put in tressel with languid courtliness which amused mary people were coming and going every now and then miss beaton would move forward to greet some fresh arrival to take leave of a departing guest or say a gracious word or two to some one who looked neglected her manner notwithstanding its girlishness had a queenly assurance which might have provoked a smile had it not been so entirely unconscious lady saxon could not help observing not with unmixed satisfaction that the young pretendress showed considerable aplomb in her reception of certain guests and in the way she warded off attention from mere lion hunters madame spinola was one of these she had made her way into the house in kensington by grace of an introduction which she had been at a good deal of trouble to procure from one of mary's foreign friends she had already made an attempt to entrap miss beaton into a promise to come to one of the bohemian parties which have been described but lady struthers rose to the occasion and sustained by the combined dignity of all the dead stuarts and of their living representative replied with her stateliest air that it was not considered politic for a madame to mix much in london society just at present to dine at the marquis of saxon's in order to make acquaintance with the duke of athelstane and to attend a reception at the house of madame spinola whom the experienced old lady at once gauged as third-rate were things not to be classed together in lady struthers mind nor was miss beaton favourably disposed to the lady who was addressed by the scotch member mr levin with such easy familiarity and whom she heard talking in terms of assured intimacy about ralph bellarmin and tommy tressel mary noticed later that when madame spinola effusively welcomed bellarmin the young man's tone and manner became unconsciously and almost indefinably free and flippant she overheard also some slight criticisms from tressel upon poor jenny's grief and rage at not being able to pay her respects to bellarmin's princess which were not intended for miss beaton's ear and mary's colour heightened for a moment and she wondered what manner of women these were whom mr bellarmin appeared to know so well and she was half indignant half gratified to observe from his chivalric air when he spoke to her how differently he rated her from such as they the question rose involuntarily was his deference a tribute to her as a woman or as a steward there was a faint bitterness in the girl's heart as she passed on leaving it unanswered the knots of talkers changed and broke up 
Lady Struthers was devoting herself to immediatized royalty, and in rapid French was making such of the bystanders as were familiar with that language aware of the fact that she was on terms of intimacy with various serene and imperial highnesses. She was also expatiating volubly on the merits of iced strawberry squash, and explaining to her illustrious guest that it was a mistake to suppose roast beef and plum pudding the national English dishes, that distinction being claimed by strawberry squash. And at intervals, the deep rolling voice, with its suspicion of highland accent, might be heard above all the feminine buzz and general clatter urging in tones of deferential entreaty encore du squash chérie princesse chérie princesse encore du squash general falcon drifting about after mary beaton in the manner of a lord-in-waiting found himself detained in a little group of which lord stonehenge and tressel made part he found that they were arranging for a visit to stonehenge park the plan to which miss beaton had alluded and about the exact date of which she had evidently been first consulted this was an irritation to falcon's jealous heart the greater when he found that bellarmin had been asked without his knowledge or interference and that it was intended sir victor champion should be invited and yet he could not even in his own mind find any reasonable objection to the move which with the eye of a tactician he saw was a wise one you enter into our idea of course said lord stonehenge mr tressel would like to bring about a rapprochement between these two and it is important to us that there should be a feeling of harmony on all sides on the question of the stuart claims tressel blew away the smoke of an imaginary cigarette and gave a comical side glance out of his half-closed eyes i'm not going to say anything about the stuart claims he said they are beyond me i shall confine myself to hanoverian grants and hereditary pensions for the present we count upon you general falcon lord stonehenge said you do me honour lord stonehenge but i fear that i shall be of little use to you in your political conversations come now tressel languidly observed you don't imagine that hard-worked politicians go down to a beautiful place in the country in the whitsuntide recess merely to talk politics yes i do falcon answered bluntly quite wrong my dear fellow i assure you buttercups and daisies and a beautiful old castle full of historic associations and a library full of rare books and a pretty girl nothing in the world more calculated to warm the cockles of lucifer's heart or as stonehenge puts it to promote a feeling of harmony i ain't quite so sure of the harmony on bellarmin's part though tressel's remarks grated upon stonehenge almost as unpleasantly as they did upon falcon you will come he said turning to the general undoubtedly lord stonehenge i could not refuse an invitation which does me so much honour and the grim old soldier bowed himself out of the conversation wonder it don't get upon miss beaton's nerves sometimes to have such a companion always hanging about her said tressel he is devoted to her and she knows it lord stonehenge answered gravely something about his eyes rather suggests the idea of the private madhouse tressel observed oh come he was a splendid soldier and he is a man of considerable capacity stonehenge remonstrated just you wait and see i don't exactly claim to be an inspired prophet tressel replied but i do observe that what i predict does somehow always come to pass you haven't predicted anything in this case said stonehenge good-humouredly no then you'll find that what i haven't predicted what i keep to myself in this case will come to pass end of volume one Chapter 12、Volume 1, Chapter 13 of The Rebel Rose by Justin McCarthy and Rosa Campbell Prade. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 13 The Bothwell Part. Meanwhile, Lady Saxon, too, had been moving about, having come across several people whom she knew. She had exchanged a few words with Bellarmin, upon whom the double fascination was working, and who was like a moth between two flames. 
She left him presently and got in conversation with an attache of a foreign embassy, who expressed some surprise at seeing her in Mary Stuart Beaton's circle. Lady Saxon, in her turn, said to Champion, when chance threw them together, I was not prepared to find you in the pretendress's court. Why not? he rejoined. She is a very fresh and interesting young woman, quite a picturesque figure. I don't know if anything can be done for her, he added in a reflective sort of manner. The manner vexed Lady Saxon, partly because his reflections were about Miss Beaton, partly because he was reflecting about anything while supposed to be engaged in conversation with Josephine Saxon. Have you any ambition to be a nineteenth-century general monk, she said saucily? General monk? He did not understand her at first. Oh, yes, I see. No, I was not thinking of a Stuart restoration, only of a possible restoration of Stuart property. A little wave of people who were near broke upon them, and Lady Saxon found herself talking to someone else with the annoying idea that Sir Victor had purposely escaped from her. She had a wonderful knack of seeing all that was going on around her, without even seeming to turn her eyes away from anyone with whom she was talking. She saw now that Bellarmine was standing at Mary Beaton's side, and that General Falcon was close by with a set frown on his face. General Falcon evidently did not like Bellarmine's attentions to Mary Beaton, and the mere fact made Lady Saxon like them less, for it showed that Falcon thought there was something serious in them. "'Yes, I am delighted with my glimpse into your parliamentary life,' Mary was saying. "'I mean your House of Commons life. I think the other house is lifeless and dull, but your house of commons, I don't know how any Englishman could live without trying to take part in that sort of battle. As Mary spoke, a little bunch of roses of a peculiar reddish color, which she wore at her girdle, and with which she had been carelessly toying, fell to the ground. Bellarmine moved to save the bouquet from being trodden on by the bystanders, but Falcon was beforehand with him. Stooping his erect form and gray head, he picked up the flowers and gave them back to his mistress, who did not seem to have noticed her loss. She gave him a little nod, more impatient than grateful. General, she said laughingly, you watch me as closely as a heron watches his prey, or a master his pupil. I am sure that you are afraid of my becoming corrupted by dangerous doctrine, or of saying something that would be unbecoming in a steward. Mr. Bellarmine isn't a socialist, or a dynamiter, or even a wig, dear tyrant. And do you know, this is the third time in the last hour that you have interrupted the flow of my conversation by restoring some lost property, which I could very well have done without for a time. Falcon drew himself up stiffly. He averted his face for a moment, that Mary might not see how deeply he was wounded. Lady Saxon's eyes met his full. She smiled, and he turned away again quickly. I am very sorry, madame, he said, in a deep, resentful voice, that my small services annoy you so much. On the contrary, dear general, I am quite aware that they are my salvation. There's no saying what would become of me if it were not for you. But you know school children like to tease their masters sometimes. Are those flowers from your own garden, madame? asked Bellarmine. They are very curious. I never before saw roses that color. They grow in Schwabenstadt, and nowhere else, replied Mary. The dear old Grand Duchess invented them. I like them because they remind me of my childhood. And do you know that General Falcon, who in spite of his tyrannical ways, can be quite courtier-like when he pleases, gets them over for me, and every day makes me a pretty little posy. Mary scarcely glanced at Falcon as she thus alluded lightly to his devotion, but Lady Saxon, with her keen woman's perception, divined how that arrow would strike home. The wave of emotion, which for an instant swept over the stern man's face, and which no one else, perhaps, would have observed, for whom it could have any particular significance, revealed to her experienced gaze what the thoughtless girl was so far from suspecting. Bellarmine still examined the flowers. He admired their peculiar color, and praised their perfume, and he quoted in courtier fashion the well-known line, The fairest rose in Scotland grows on the topmost bough. 
and made a playful allusion to Mary Stuart's device of the crowned red rose. "'Would you like to have them?' said Mary simply, and with a little gesture of graceful condescension, which was quite spontaneous, and had a sort of regal absence of affectation, she gave Bellarmin Falcon's posy. The young man accepted it, as he might have accepted the gift of a sovereign. Falcon made an abrupt, passionate movement, as if he would snatch away the bouquet. The scar on his forehead showed dangerously upon the red flush which rose, but he restrained himself. His arm dropped heavily to his side, and he was turning away. Just then Mary said, her eyes still wandering, "'General, I don't think you are doing your duty as a gallant soldier ought. I am sure that Lady Saxon must want some iced coffee or something. Take her to the tea-room.' and with a little imperious wave of her hand she dismissed him. Lady Saxon saw it all. Her heart thrilled with mingled exultation and anger. She was inclined to think that Mary meant offence to her in thrusting Falcon on her. "'So you have to be polite to me, General Falcon. Your young mistress commands it,' she said, as he gravely offered her his arm, murmuring, "'You will permit me, madame?' "'I try to be polite,' Falcon returned grimly. "'But you don't much care for this sort of thing. "'I don't much care for mixed assemblies.' "'Something in the tone in which he said this, "'and the look which accompanied his words, "'made Lady Saxon's cheek flame. "'She was at once alarmed and offended. "'She said nothing, however, "'but, putting on her most gracious air, "'let him take her to the tea-room "'where she drank a cup of iced coffee "'and played with some grapes. "'Presently she said to him, I should like to take a turn with you in the garden. Lady Saxon had a keen memory for faces, and a sensitive faculty which forestalled memory itself by association. She had had to live on the defensive very much during certain years of her life, and even in these her later days, when smooth success strewn beneath her feet made her path so comparatively easy and pleasant, she found caution necessary. It occasionally happened that a disagreeable association surrounded some face which she supposed she was seeing for the first time, and then the association resolved itself into memory and justified itself. A chill, uncomfortable sensation had passed through her when in the central lobby of the House of Commons she had first seen Falcon's marked face, with the heavy drooping moustache that reminded her, she could not tell why, of a hawk's wing, and the steely gray and restless eyes, eyes in the depths of which something tyrannous and cruel might be read, she thought. But on that evening Lady Saxon's mind and heart had been so fully occupied that she had not troubled herself about General Falcon and her vague qualms concerning him. They had come back to her later, however, and she had remembered the man in a dim, indefinite way. Yes, she knew that they had met before, he had seen her in England, in her bohemian days, before the Dalcamara enterprise of her first husband had been covered by a patent of nobility. He had seen her, perhaps with champion, before Victor had become famous. Lady Saxon was not a woman to wait for danger, and let it choose its own time for finding her out. She always preferred to go forth to meet it. "'We have met before, General Falcon,' she said, turning to him with a fearless smile. "'Your face is quite familiar to me.' He bowed. "'We have met before, madame.' "'I never forget a face like yours,' she went on. "'Perhaps,' she added, with a benign, encouraging glance, "'a face like mine is not easily forgotten.' "'I remembered your face perfectly,' he replied, and he looked at her straight as he spoke. He could not help, soldier that he was, feeling a little thrill of admiration for her courage. Yes, I am glad. Not with any disagreeable association, I hope? There was nothing particularly disagreeable in it to me, madame. I have met you on several occasions in the company of your late husband, who was not then Baron Langenwald and I have seen you on two or three occasions about the same time in the company of another person. Lady Saxon was silent for a moment. She recollected now that Falcon had gone to her husband for treatment of his wound. She recollected what Langenwald had told her of its probable effect upon Falcon's life and temperament. 
I understand, she said, with the composure that, under the conditions, did her credit. General Falcon, a soldier, means to remind me that he knew me when I was poor and humble and under a cloud. Oh, madame, the steely eyes flashed, the heavy mustache moved in deprecation. What else? she blandly asked. What else could I understand? Well, I dare say you know all about me and my worst days, my poverty and my struggles, and how a quack adventurer made use of my youth and my, well, I suppose I may say beauty, to advertise his drugs. What then? Perhaps General Falcon thinks my husband, Lord Saxon, does not know. General Falcon is mistaken. My husband does know. All. Her audacity deceived Falcon for a moment. When later on he thought over it, he felt almost certain that she had lied. Now it occurred to him that she was brave enough to have trusted to Lord Saxon's infatuation, and to have secured herself by telling him the truth. "'I was not thinking of that, madame,' he replied. "'I was not thinking of Lord Saxon. I have not to think of him. I was thinking of others, whom it might have been my duty to caution against—' Mary Beaton's silvery laugh rang out in the soft summer air as she, too, came with a little group of people from the tea-room. Lady Saxon looked meaningly towards her, and then unflinchingly at Falcon, who at the sound of Mary's voice had started and glanced in her direction. Lady Saxon laughed, too, and lightly touched his arm with the gold handle of her parasol, forcing him to meet her gaze. Do not be so impatient to go to her. She does not want you. It is only natural that she should prefer Mr. Bellarmine's society to that of her guardian. Your Mary Stuart likes to be amused, General, and you are too old to play the part of Chasselard. That of Bothwell would suit you better. I shall suggest to her that she had better be careful. Madame, you would not dare. Dare is an odd word, isn't it, for a man, especially for a soldier to use towards a woman. I am not afraid of any one in the world, General Falcon. I am not even afraid of my husband, and though that may seem strange to you, I am not in the least afraid of any stories you may think proper to tell of me. They couldn't do me any harm. They might hurt me, perhaps, if I were struggling for a place in society, if I were in a fashion on probation. But, as it is, Lady Saxon drew her parasol into a perpendicular position, and lowered it with an air of magnificent disdain. She wished to imply that society would not believe stories about a woman who was March Ionis of Saxon, and might any day be Duchess of Athelstane. "'I warn you, however, General,' she went on, "'that I know your secret, and that though you cannot injure me, it might be better for you, and for your mistress, and for the success of your hopes, to make a friend of me instead of an enemy. She spoke coldly, and made a move across the grass as if she would put an end to the conversation and join her hostess. Falcon stopped her with a gesture of entreaty, and she turned back towards him, still cool and smiling. She saw that he was at her mercy. Come, she said. You see that your secret is more important to you than mine. If I had any particular secret, which I haven't, I can be bon camarade if I choose, and in any case, I am not fond of telling tales out of school. I should really like to help you, if we were to decide upon being friends, just for the mere interest of the thing. There's something quite picturesque in the idea of an old soldier like you, Reckless and heroic, chivalrous and all the rest, madly in love like some knight of old, and with the prince's claimant, too. You should win your suit by some daring stroke, the Bothwell sort of thing, you know. And if your Mary Stuart has the blood of her ancestress in her veins, that kind of wooing might well appeal to her. I assure you, General, that I should be quite sorry to work against anything so romantic, it would be too commonplace to marry your princess to a young London Tory Democrat, whose highest ambition would be gratified by a summons to Windsor. Every shaft that she had aimed struck home. Falcon writhed inwardly, 
with fury and pain and yet he realized in a strange confused way that there was a certain affinity between the reckless spirit of this woman and his own her extravagant suggestions contemptuously as they had been uttered seemed an echo of the wild imaginings of his brain of thoughts and impossible projects which had haunted his dreaming and waking hours he felt instinctively that there were passionate chords in her nature which made her comprehend his mad love for mary lady saxon he said with impulsive appeal you know how you understand what a man feels something tells me that you do a man such as i am for whom youth is gone all its crackling fires swelled into one terrible flame that burns and burns and that nothing can quench except he stopped short and laughed in harsh quavering tone you are a woman who knows you have a soldier's spirit i like the way you face danger i'll keep your secret lady saxon though you deny that you have one and i will trust to your woman's generosity to keep mine falcon's tone and manner were not without dignity they touched lady saxon curiously she had been perfectly sincere when she told him that she would rather be his friend than his enemy you may do more than rely on my generosity she said you may rely upon my help perhaps i may be of greater service to you than you think now and you may not be sorry that i have surprised your secret come to me if ever you want a woman's advice and trust me i know it all i know what your love is and what it means to you i know what you dread and would avert whom you like and whom you dislike don't ask me how i know all this it is enough that i do know and that no one else does lady saxon's voice was low but her manner was intensely melodramatic she delighted in the melodramatic she was never so much herself as when she was play-acting now she had a purpose in her melodrama and felt such a pride in its success as hamlet must have felt when he found that his lines of tragedy had caught the conscience of the king she made a movement which signified that she had no more to say she did not wish to mar her latest effect by another word on the subject just then come she said will you see me to my carriage i am going now to bid miss beaton good-bye falcon followed her across the lawn to where mary was standing among a rapidly thinning crowd lady saxon bade her a gracious farewell and again spoke of the contemplated dinner party which it was decided should take place upon a day fixed after the winsentide vacation we are going to stay with lord stonehenge mary said and we shall not be back till after the recess i too shall be out of town said lady saxon but my holiday place will not be so delightful as yours miss beaton you have never seen that part of the coast it is so wild that you could hardly imagine it comparatively near london i have a den of my own down there i almost wish that i were going to have one of my misanthropic fits and to retire to my eyrie by the sea i could never have suspected you of misanthropic fits lady saxon put in bellarmin with a certain forced gaiety it is true though an effect of early barbarism miss beaton i was not trained like you to the restraints of polite society my girlhood was an odd unconventional one she darted a fearless glance at the bystanders as she spoke and laughed her ringing little laugh which seemed to proclaim that she considered herself above criticism i like to break away from my shackles sometimes and your eyrie by the sea is near stonehenge asked mary interested this was a new view of lady saxon's character which appealed to her yes high up on the cliffs lord stonehenge can show it to you if he pleases i wish i were going to be there to show it to you myself and to you mr bellarmin you would believe in my misanthropy then she gave him a smile that said you see i know all about the visit and the snares that are being laid for you and i am quite indifferent then she went on you didn't know lord stonehenge that i possessed the loneliest and most romantic of ruined castles about ten miles from your own you mean petrel's rest replied lord stonehenge i go so seldom beyond my own gates when i am down there but i have seen the place 
I did not know that Lord Saxon ever used it. I dragged him there once, in our honeymoon days. It was a freak of mine, and I fell in love with the old ruin, and he made it over to me as a wedding present. I keep a very primitive staff there, and when I am tired of London life and country house parties, I want to draw a breath of freedom and to be savage again without shocking anybody's prejudices. I run down there all by myself for a day or two. Lady Saxon departed, having left a dramatic impression behind her. Falcon saw her into her carriage and then came back to the grounds. He did not join the rest, but sought refuge in a quaint little strip of flower garden, partly screened from inquisitive eyes by a projecting wing of the house and by a spreading beech tree, through which the soft breeze gently rustled and seemed to chime with the hum of voices and laughter beyond. The windows of Mary's sitting-room looked out on the rose-beds and grassy walks. There was a broken sundial in the centre, and Falcon leaned his arms upon it and gazed up miserably into the foliage of the beech-tree. He felt the dull, heavy pain of his old wound throbbing in his head, and the humiliation and the anxiety he had just been undergoing seemed part of the wound's pain somehow. Lo, the very secret of his heart of hearts! the secret with which he would not trust the winds or the birds of the air, which he had long tried to keep a secret even from himself, had been snatched from him by a woman who was not fit to breathe the same air as his queen, his stately innocent princess, the lady of his love. It seemed an insult to Mary that his secret and hers, it must be hers when the time was ripe, should be in the keeping of Lady Saxon. The maddest thought shot tormentingly through his distracted mind. If he could but kill her! But he must stoop to her, give her his confidence, profess to trust her, profess to be her friend, see her in familiar companionship with his mistress. One word from her might put out forever the light of poor Falcon's tortured life. Mary's guests were melting away. Only a few remained. Tressel, in close conversation with Lord Stonehenge, had gone towards the house after having made his farewell bow to Miss Beaton, and Bellarmine wondered within himself what political log-rolling could have induced Tressel to pay an afternoon call and deny himself for two whole hours the luxury of a cigarette. "'Must you go, Sir Victor?' Mary asked, as she saw Champion coming up to her, evidently with the intention of taking his leave. "'I am sorry to say that I must. I have even outstayed what ought to have been my limit of time. I am proud of having had so much of your time given up to me,' said Mary sweetly. "'It is an honour any woman might well feel proud of. You are not any woman, Miss Beaton.' "'Ah, that is nicely said.' I like to hear a great man pay a pretty compliment. I didn't know that I was doing anything of the kind. I was only going to explain why I was so glad to outstay the limit of my time here, madame. He paid her the further compliment of recognizing the formal mode of address which her courtiers adopted in so dainty and courtly a manner that the young girl, for she was but a girl, our Princess Mary, felt her heart give a bound of gratified vanity. Well, she said, it is a triumph for me to have kept you beyond the limit of your time, but I hope I haven't done harm, like the girl in Scott's novel, who keeps the brave knight by her side while the standard of England, which he was sent to guard, is torn from its place. Sir Victor's cheek flushed slightly. His enemies had a way of saying that he had no regard for the standard of his country, but it was plain that Mary meant nothing of the kind. She noted his momentary pause, however. "'Have you not read Scott?' she asked. "'I am told no one in England reads Scott nowadays. "'We do read him abroad.' "'Oh, yes, I know Scott well,' Sir Victor replied. "'What was there which Sir Victor could say he did not know?' "'No, Miss Beaton, the comparison will not hold. "'Your influence will never be employed "'to keep any soldier of England from guarding her standard. "'And to prove it, I am going along now to my post at Westminster.' "'He took her hand and bent over it as though he were doing homage to a recognized princess, and he, too, made his way back through the tea-room and out into the street. Bellarmine was almost the last. Presently he, too, made his farewell. 
are you going to the house of commons too mary asked yes he answered but i'm afraid that my absence from the post at westminster wouldn't be of quite so much importance to england as that of sir victor champion bellarmin had been speaking in a constrained manner he was doing his best to compel himself to look on mary beaton as a woman utterly away from him and to keep her out of his heart mary suddenly seemed to notice something strange in his voice and his manner wholly unsuspicious of the real cause she looked at him with open and sympathetic eyes and asked are you not well mr bellarmin oh yes madame quite well you don't look like it you are doing too much in the house of commons of course you are going to stonehenge park that will do you good i don't intend to go to stonehenge park no she looked at him in wonder oh surely you will go i look forward to meeting you there yes you will go he shook his head no i think not but you will go if i command you she said with a smile which went through the young man's heart if you command oh then i do command then i will go and a thrill of joy and fear shot through his heart thank you ever so much you have made me glad good-bye she had made him glad too though his heart had remorse and dread in it as he left her and knew that his resolve to keep away from her had died of her first entreaty end of volume one chapter thirteen recording by diana beauvais end of the rebel rose volume one by justin mccarthy and rosa campbell prayed volume two chapter one of the rebel rose this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit LibriVox.org. recording by diana beauvais the rebel rose by justin mccarthy and rosa campbell prayed volume two chapter one stonehenge park the visit to lord stonehenge was arranged to take place about the time of the whitsun vacation there was to be a curious collection of guests under the picturesque and ancient roof of the great house of stonehenge park time was to be given to sir victor champion to be melted by mary beaton's charms and to make an impression on rolf bellarmin this latter opportunity was to be champion's quid pro quo if you give us a chance of winning you to our money claim we will give you a chance of winning bellarmin to your side against the house of lords the position had not been openly defined in bald terms such as these though that valuable intermediary trestle had made it his business to throw some subtle hints into the jacobite conclave lord stonehenge who had none of the gifts of a politician and took very little interest in the strife of parties and the manoeuvring of leaders in the house of commons hardly appreciated the full significance of trestle's suggestions he had nothing in common with the radical trestle and had been a good deal surprised to see him turn up at mary beaton's reception still he was quite aware that for the sake of miss beaton's claims it would be well to have trestle's good word in the house though he did not yet know how or when those claims were to be advanced he accepted trestle's ideas therefore with polite cordiality and though no deliberate scheme of the kind would ever have shaped itself in stonehenge's brain the true meaning of the visit came to be tacitly recognized by more than one of the party mary beaton and rolf bellarmin knew least of the immediate political purpose of the visit when the invitation was given mary thought it was got up as a pleasant holiday and novelty for her and till he came to the house bellarmin did not know that champion was to be his fellow guest mary beaton noted with keen and artistic interest all the features of the beautiful region through which they passed she and her chaperon lady struthers and her cavalier general falcon had been brought by special train from london some seventy miles to the nearest station to stonehenge park where they found lord stonehenge's carriages and from which they had still some miles to drive the country had a sort of cultivated barrenness there were bluff chalk hills rising abruptly and covered with box and gnarled funereal yews 
and below these were green pleasant valleys and rich apple orchards and picturesque thatched cottages and perhaps a quiet stream meandering beneath spreading beech trees now they would come upon a stretch of common with its clumps of black heath like ill-shapen mounds and shrubs of gorse lifting golden plumes and tall bracken spreading its fronds over the dead brown refuse of last autumn or now the road would wind round by some wooded hillside where straight green larches and sombre red-stemmed firs lifted their pyramidal tops above the undergrowth of hazel and alder and oh how beautiful were the mossy boles of the big trees and how delightful it would be to set one's feet on the crisp red-brown carpet of withered leaves or to lie stretched on the dry moss and look up to the blue sky through lattice-work of foliage or watch the gleams of sunlight slanting downwards and the shadows shifting their pattern as the wind stirred the boughs overhead all these things affected mary with a curious melancholy interest it was like passing through some land she had known in her childhood and till now had forgotten or had seen in some tender dream of the morning it was all so thoroughly english but english of the past and not of the present the ideal england which some of us and she was of the number would fain believe to have once been real the girl's eyes were moist why she did not know the carriage passed through the lodge gates and there was a mile or two of stately pleasance where deer lifted their antlered heads and scampered away among the fine old trees till at last the house came in sight lady struthers honest heart swelled with pride and joy at the thought of being welcomed and lodged in such a place she drew back her shoulders and let her full chest expand and her eyes sparkled even more brightly than their wont but she kept her proud and glad emotions to herself not for worlds would she have had it supposed that her life from childhood upwards had not been passed in halls with which stonehenge park could at best only compete one might be very happy in a place like this mary said with a sigh it seems so much more real so much more like a home than our big dreary barracks of palaces in germany oh well of course there's no place like england lady struthers affirmed and you as an englishwoman must feel that as well as i lord stonehenge has quite a nice home of it here very nice indeed it reminds me a good deal of my aunt's place in perthshire observed lady struthers reflectively she was my mother's half-sister and a great heiress and if all had had their dues her property should have come to me as the rightful inheritress but my uncle married again and had a son at the age of sixty-five a woman the family couldn't countenance my love and that's how wicked reprobates flourish while virtuous paupers have to grub along as best they may i got nothing pursued lady struthers mournfully except a parcel of mechlin lace and a diamond heart the jewel madame which you admire i trust my dear mistress and pupil will honour me and my aunt's memory by accepting it as a wedding gift at such a time as she shall have made her choice of a husband which will i am convinced be in accordance with her illustrious ancestry it should have been an entire peru and lady struthers sighed deeply if my aunt's wishes had been duly considered a peru that would have been worthy to take its place among historic nay even royal jewels but bygones must be bygones as i am always telling general falcon it's not for us poor mortals to keep up ill feeling when even in revelations the devil was only let loose for a thousand years general falcon's eyes spoke scorn of lady struthers maunderings just then however the carriage drew up at the entrance to lord stonehenge's house on the steps to receive them stood lord stonehenge and when the carriage stopped he came down the steps bareheaded and handed mary out with him a little in the background were two men one old and thin and stooped one young and thin and straight and a dark-haired bright-eyed boy after lord stonehenge had handed mary out and welcomed her the boy came forward with a smiling face and the assured grace of one who knows that his turn comes next lord stonehenge presented him to mary as don jose 
prince of saragossa don jose prettily dropped on one knee and took mary's hand and touched it lightly with his lips general falcon's heart swelled with exultation we are recognized was the thought that passed through his mind mary blushed and smiled was confused and pleased all this was delightful to lady struthers whose demeanour seemed instantly to acquire an even greater stateliness and whose curtsy to the young prince was worthy of the seventeenth century lady struthers disdained the modern bob we might almost fancy ourselves again at the residence she murmured to her mistress then lord stonehenge presented monsignor valmy and the rev dr amblaine the first of whom as became a most true and fervent catholic mary greeted with a deep reverence don jose was the heir the recognized heir of a lost cause he was the head of the elder branch of an exiled royal family he was a representative of legitimacy of divine right he was like mary beaton in a certain sense but then he had the advantage over her that his was a country of revolution and hers was not the crown might be going a begging any day in his country and his house might put in a claim and make it good he was a claimant of admitted rank and account diplomacy kept its eye upon him he was never quite out of the calculations of european statecraft of foreign offices and embassies and chancelleries and drawing-rooms and coteries and petticoteries but in mary beaton's country no palace revolutions were looked for and european diplomacy regarded the throne of queen victoria as pretty safe therefore mary beaton as compared with don jose was like the niece of a rich man who has any number of healthy children and grandchildren while don jose was like the nephew of one who has neither chick nor child of his own but has some few nephews or nieces all of whom he cordially detests but some one of whom he will have to choose for the inheritance of his possessions no doubt any practical politician in looking shrewdly over the field would have betted heavily against don jose's chances but no practical politician would have troubled his head about mary beaton at all don jose was far from being a favorite indeed he had the field against him but mary was not in the running that was the difference and it certainly was a very considerable difference it particularly impressed itself just now on the mind of mary beaton herself and she even wondered whether it did not impress itself upon the mind of lord stonehenge as well mary was not certain yet whether stonehenge was a mere dreamer and visionary or not stonehenge house was a vast pile of red brick and gray stone it stood upon the brink of a broad lake the grounds around were of immense extent a pine wood was but an incident in the visitor's drive lord stonehenge when he was staying at this place never left his own grounds never passed beyond his own gates unless when he had to visit some sick tenant or neighbor poor neighbor that is to say for he did not hold much intercourse with his nearest rich neighbors one was a newly made radical baronet the other was a no popery tory squire and lord stonehenge naturally did not greatly care for either although lord stonehenge was a devoted catholic his actual domain enfolded the parish church and the vicarage and even the graveyard where the rude protestant and puritan forefathers of the hamlet sleep he was not unpopular among his protestant tenantry he always acted liberally and he was not in any sense a bigot he might have been very popular if he had cared for popularity but he loved quietude and ease and the society of people who thoroughly understood him and at present his mind was filled with fancies and dreams fancies which he tried to discourage and dreams which used to be day and night thoughts and projects to generations of his ancestors the outer door opened into a great hall almost the full size of the middle block of the house ancestral portraits most of them by famous painters hung on the walls suits of armor and stands of arms were there the empty mail coats seeming not inapt representatives now in their emptiness of the cause for which they had once been dinted and battered on many a battlefield 
the hall had a great stand in which were grouped sticks and staves and cudgels and stocks of various kinds lord stonehenge had a taste for the accumulation of sticks from all parts of the world his friends who knew his taste often brought him a present of some desirable and uncommon sort of staff it was all new and interesting to mary she had never stayed before in a great english house her own ancestral home had been sold in her grandfather's time, and it had not occurred to her to regret it, but now, amid her ejaculations of surprise and pleasure, she could not suppress a deep sigh. This makes me sad in a kind of way, she said, turning with her sweet, frank smile to Monsignor Valmy, who, standing a little apart, with his thin hands folded before him, and a gentle, benevolent curiosity on his somewhat severe countenance, was watching her intently i was so delighted with my little house in kensington mary went on and so glad because the portraits of some of my own people looked down upon me from the walls and in england their own country but now after all when i see this place i can't help feeling an alien and an exile lord stonehenge made a little movement of almost impassioned protest but he did not speak perhaps shyness kept him silent surely that is an impossibility madame if you turn in this direction said monsignor valmy in suave tender accents and he motioned towards a part of the hall where hung a collection of stuart portraits conspicuous among them a fine likeness of mary stuart this particular painting is said to have been done by a french artist during that brief period when in the flush of her youth her loveliness and her happiness mary stuart presided as queen consort at the court of france she is represented in the dress of that court a royal mantle of crimson velvet edged with miniver falls from the shoulders she has the ungraceful puff sleeves and the more becoming long-waisted jewelled bodice with high collar and small ruff which is thrown back opening deep in front and shows the shape of her long slender throat dark chestnut hair dark save for the ruddy tinge running through it waves upon the broad candid brow and is confined by three rows of pearls with one large pendant drop below the parting the face a perfect oval turns a little towards the left shoulder the large dark almond-shaped eyes have a clear penetrating gaze and an almost childlike purity the brows are delicately arched the nose is fine and straight and the lips gracious and slightly pouting in spite of the girlish serenity and sweetness of the countenance it has that expression of melancholy so characteristic of the royal stewards it was impossible not to be struck by the resemblance mary beaton bore to this portrait even in that very pensive shade which gave so pathetic a charm to her bright young beauty it was remarked by several general falcon looked earnestly from the pictured to the living face involuntarily lady saxon's words rose in his memory you may be her bothwell a red wave overspread his forehead through which the scar shone livid monsignor valmy seemed an appropriate figure against the stonehenge background he was don jose's tutor and travelling companion a jesuit priest whose ascetic life was printed in the lines of his thin clear wasted face his hair which fell almost to his shoulder beneath the beretta which he wore was prematurely gray he looked seventy in reality he was about fifty he had fine delicately cut features of the dantesque type there was power in his steady serene eyes and a greater sweetness than subtlety in his smile he had an air of culture and dignity and his manner like that of most catholic priests of high birth and position was singularly bland and courteous monsignor valmy's chaplain and secretary the rev dr amblaine hung in the background he was a very young man with a hectic flush and apparently of a consumptive tendency mary heard later from her host that he had in fact but poor hope of prolonging his life he was a scholar and she heard too that he had an almost morbid love of books 
and a taste for the personal possession of editions which the public could not easily get at a little room full of books all his own his very own was his happiness the library at stonehenge in which they had tea must one would fancy have been a paradise to poor dr amblaine it was a great oblong room with three tall windows looking out on the lake and its collection of books and manuscripts was almost unique for a private owner's house but in fact it gave little joy to dr amblaine he had been a few weeks at stonehenge park and was to be there only a few weeks longer but he had already set up his own little store of books in his own room and he stole every possible moment to go and look at them and to take down this one and that from its shelf and open it tenderly and pat its cover and stroke its back and study its title page and its imprimatur fondly and utter little half articulate and gladsome words over it nor did he want to keep his treasures all to himself he was only too delighted when he could entice some one of the company into his room and win by gentle extortion a few words of admiration and of sympathy all this seemed curiously pathetic to miss beaton when after she had been some days at stonehenge she made him thus happy and she would not even smile though don jose did his very best to force her into mirth by his odd interjections and furtive grimaces don jose was a clever sweet precocious boy of fourteen he was an odd compound for he had the frolicsomeness of an english schoolboy the unleavened conceit and whims of a parisian lad and occasionally an interval short indeed of the spaniard's melancholy gravity when lord stonehenge had placed mary in a chair near one of the windows through which floated a gentle breeze from the lake bearing sweet scent of june roses and honeysuckle on its breath and was busying himself in getting her tea don jose rushed forward with a funny little gesture of mock humility no no he exclaimed she is my princess the head of my family the queen of my house i am her page i must pour her wine i must bring her tea i and no one else lord stonehenge laughed but i am her host my prince he said no matter cried the prince and he sprang to the table poured mary's tea and handed it to her kneeling on one knee the while and mary laughed too and accepted the homage and leaned back in her chair sipping her tea and feeling delightfully at home she fell into conversation with monsignor valmy presently and asked some questions about the services in the private chapel at stonehenge she regretted that she had as yet no chaplain of her own and that though the oratory was not far from her house she attended the offices of her church less regularly than had been her wont abroad the priest bent upon her a look of fatherly regard you feel the need of religion he said it is difficult to lead the religious life in london said mary thoughtfully and yet it is in london where material interests and enjoyments throng around us like a vast army of shadowy forms darkening and vitiating the spiritual atmosphere that the religious life seems a greater reality as well as a greater need than here for instance where the air is pure morally and physically said the priest with a grave smile yes i know what you mean cried mary i feel that it is as you say we are surrounded by shadows i often fancy that other people's realities are my shadows and then to go into the solemn security of our own church and to feed our own souls and give no food to the starving ignorant souls outside seems to me no less selfishness than to feed our bodies and let the poor die of hunger at our doors madame you allow your mind to dwell too much upon the sufferings of the poor interposed falcon abruptly i have often had the thought which madame's words suggest said lord stonehenge in a dreamy tone we rich and exclusive catholics in england are in the spiritual sense like divs well he added in a lighter manner we are introducing one alien presence into our fold here if not two when mr bellarmine arrives he will find himself the only one of the party who is not catholic mary made a little involuntary movement of interest as he spoke 
she had been wondering since her arrival in the house whether bellarmin was already there and if not when he was expected falcon asked the question when does mr bellarmin come in a day or two replied stonehenge presumably he is less necessary in the house of commons than sir victor champion who follows him when the whitsuntide recess begins you are right monsieur valmy said presently in qualifying your remark about the alien presence in one instance at least sir victor is as yet outside the fold but his instincts are leading him to look over the pale his mind has in it much of the churchman his sympathies are with the church i have sometimes thought stonehenge said with a smile that champion would make an admirable cardinal he would like the office i dare say many of its functions at least but has he not a little too much mysticism emotionalism even ecclesiasticism about him to be quite effective as a prince of the church yet you look to his being prime minister of england said stonehenge oh yes that is different in england you govern you govern stonehenge said again with a smile why don't you say we govern you are an englishman yes but i am in spirit a medieval englishman an englishman of the days when england still believed in her saints answered monsignor valmy well you were going to say something when i interrupted you i was going to say that in england you govern by talking and therefore champion is a destined prime minister said monsignor valmy but a prince of the church must be trained to the art of silence as well as speech and do you think sir victor could ever learn that no he must be always in some place where he can use the great gift which heaven has given him he would make a marvellous preacher if he were one of us monsignor valmy added meditatively i should like to appoint him to preach in some west end church to stir the hearts of the light-minded and to compel protestants to go and listen i am afraid there is a very worldly side to champion's ambition lord stonehenge said the redemption of souls might serve as an avocation for him it would never be his vocation os hominis sublime did die Balmy said quietly a man of genius and heart looks naturally up from the world have you seen much of sir victor champion he added turning to miss beaton yes she answered he has called on me several times lately and we have talked a good deal together and you like him you admire him oh yes she replied frankly who could help admiring him i confess that i like him best when he puts on that courtier-like old-world manner which suits him so well i am not so much interested in him when he talks generalities to me as he might to an ordinary young london lady and asks my plans for the season perhaps that is champion's diplomatic way of trying to find out something about you madame said lord stonehenge something about your own and your friend's projects and ideas which he might think it impolitic to ask directly i would rather he questioned me outright about what he wanted to know said mary but i think he must have discovered after the second visit that i did not like him so well as the man of society for he became the courtier again and mr bellarmin pursued the priest blandly oh mr bellarmin and mary's colour rose slightly he too has been to see us three or four times but mr bellarmin is different he is younger naturally more of the london man mr bellarmin amuses me and he interests me too for he seems to have two sides to his character i don't feel with him as with sir victor that i ought to be on my best behaviour she laughed a half-conscious laugh which both monsignor valmy and lord stonehenge noticed alas for bellarmin it was quite true that in spite of his prudent resolves he had found occasion more than once to visit the young pretendress at her house in kensington it would seem uncourteous unfeeling he argued to himself to slight the frank invitations almost commands of a lady in mary beaton's peculiar position a stranger in her own country a victim so bellarmin put it to the accident of her illustrious birth 
at first miss beaton was enchanted with everything at stonehenge park she loved to wander over the great old house from room to room and corridor to corridor from the foot of the two wide flights of stairs which met in the middle of the hall one might look up to a glass dome and through it see the shadow of a little turret that commanded a view of the whole country round mary delighted in mounting this tower and gazing over the broad fair english landscape on the one side to the more barren stretch of country the bleak cliffs and misty sea on the other she persuaded herself sometimes that she saw on the horizon the outlines of lady saxon's airy petrel's rest she had thought many times since that day of her reception of lady saxon of her brilliancy her beauty her vivid intriguing life and of her frank confession of an occasional longing for solitude and savagery somehow mary thought of lady saxon most often in association with bellarmin and then the young girl's cheek would flush painfully she did not dare to ask herself why and she would shrink and determinedly turn her mind away the people at stonehenge humoured mary beaton's fancies and permitted her to throw completely aside the flimsy pomp and ceremony which in london falcon so strongly insisted upon thus here she was more of the merry schoolgirl than the dignified young claimant who had declared herself every inch a queen lady struthers remonstrated feebly but she could not gainsay the prince of saragossa and monsignor valmy who took miss beaton's view of things mary was charmed with little don jose the boy had picked up some london slang which he found great pleasure in airing for mary's amusement and social education they became comrades and used to have long rambles and rides together still there was want of force of interest of movement about all this and mary found herself secretly wishing that mr bellarmin would appear he had not come on the day first appointed but had put off his arrival two days on the plea of committees and debates she wanted him to come before sir victor a day or two of his bright companionship without the constraint of the elder and graver statesman's presence would be pleasant mary thought for mr bellarmin was young and sir victor was oh well not old not exactly old but elderly sir victor seemed quite an elderly person to mary beaton she had always been a good deal mixed up with elderly people she was under the care and in the close companionship now of elderly people and she yearned for the society of the young as one weary of gray skies and dun clouds might yearn for the sunshine perhaps this condition of feeling all natural and comprehensible as it was might serve to account for the fact that elder people sometimes grew a little displeased and impatient with sweet mary beaton they suspected that she yearned for younger companions sometimes and it made them bitter certainly it made general falcon bitter general falcon looked out for the coming of young bellarmin with alternate sinking of the heart and rising of passion the mere mention of bellarmin's name brought a scowl to falcon's face he was beginning to fancy that he had been wrong in his first estimate of bellarmin's position he had believed him to be enmeshed in lady saxon's toils he now suspected that lady saxon's influence was not entirely paramount it was evidence of a certain feline craft in falcon that he should seem to countenance and even encourage any apparent admirer of mary beaton whereas in reality the serious suggestion of her marriage coming into his mind as a possibility nay a certainty in the future set all his strongest passions at work and turned him for the time almost into a madman he had appeared eager to welcome both bellarmin and sir victor champion to the house in kensington and to seize on the evident attraction of both to his charge as a factor in his political schemes but now that the attraction seemed to have become more distinct he regarded it with a mixture of abhorrence and terror yet he still placed so severe a restraint upon himself that only lady saxon had she been in his company could have read the morbid workings of his diseased mind end of volume two chapter one
Volume Two, Chapter Two of *The Rebel Rose* by Justin McCarthy and Rosa Campbell Prade. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter Two: Among the Lilies. For days before the Stonehenge visit, Bellarmin's soul had been sorely racked. Soon after he had sent away the fateful letter, which was Lady Saxon's trophy, a terrible revulsion of feeling came over him he felt like one who has sold his soul to the spirit of darkness never had he been deceived in his cooler moments by lady saxon's tenderest protestations and professions he knew that she did not love him that she was not a woman to love any one in the true sense his heart revolted at the thought of her treachery to her husband he felt himself degraded by the servitude he had allowed her to impose on him and now from servitude he had made it slavery he had written to her a declaration of love and it was not true he did not love her he was dazzled by her allured by her infatuated by her his senses betrayed him to her but he did not love her and he knew it now only too well he had a hideous presentiment that his letter would yet be made to play some part in some scheme of lady saxon's so little faith had he in her when he was not under the bewildering sway of her presence and her charm that he actually found this thought taking possession of his mind the thought that the letter had been drawn from him to be used in some way against him and added to all this was the feeling that now he had cut himself off from mary beaton forever little hope indeed had he ever that mary beaton could care for him or that anything could come of it even if she did but still he was free to think of her to fill his soul with thought of her to hold her always in his heart now he must try to think of her no more the bond slave of josephine saxon must not admit the thought of mary beaton into the profane sanctuary of his heart he felt that such transactions have their own code of honor and he must order his heart so that it should not give out its feelings to any other woman a man he said to himself savagely ought to be one thing or the other he ought to be either good or bad he ought to have the courage of his goodness or the courage of his badness he ought to be not like me bellarmin was for the time distinctly unhappy he seemed to have lost interest in everything he was out of tune with political life there were moments when he wished he had never come up to london never got a seat in the house of commons the world his world seemed all darkened he could not see the sky or the stars anywhere he was as one who suddenly finds that he has lost sight or hearing or power of movement and whose senses are paralyzed by the appalling knowledge he had come to understand that in the terrible struggle between the two forces in his nature the spirit of evil had conquered but not cast out the spirit of good that the conquered spirit lay a perpetual ache and agony deep in its prison in his heart still bellarmin was young and whether he would or not his forces were elastic and he soon determined to make the best of his stonehenge visit to put on an appearance of brightness to meet mary bravely and to be in the world like a man of the world these thoughts were in bellarmin's mind as he came down by the train the same train which had brought mary beaton he found the party drinking tea in a quaint garden on one side of the house a garden laid out in fancifully shaped beds bordered with box and almost closed in by red brick walls on which hung big yellow marechal neil and souvenir de Maumesson roses the roses were abloom in sunny sheltered regions now they grew in profusion at stonehenge and the very air seemed heavy with them lady struthers was at the tea-table general falcon and monsieur valmy were conversing together and mary and lord stonehenge sat a little apart they both rose as bellarmin was ushered towards them and lord stonehenge went forward to greet his guest but mary held back looking very stately and slender as she stood beside a bed of tall white lilies and indeed not unlike the lilies themselves bellarmin thought a little blush came to her cheek however when at last bellarmin shook hands with her 
i am glad to see you she said simply we were beginning to think that you didn't mean to come oh he answered i have had tiresome committees a tedious time altogether with only the consolation of feeling that i was doing my duty which was not much of a consolation after all under the conditions and the satisfaction of knowing that i should get a holiday anyhow at whitsuntide every one gets holidays at whitsuntide said mary and then she was going to say and then sir victor will be here but added we were going to give you a longer holiday have you seen sir victor champion asked stonehenge and felt immediately that the question needed some preparation for bellarmin gave a quick surprised look seen him yes every day but i've had no particular talk with him he is coming here in the whitsuntide recess said lord stonehenge calmly coming here repeated bellarmin still surprised and glancing at mary i did not imagine that i was to meet sir victor champion you don't object said lord stonehenge i know that you differ politically perhaps not as much as people think here political differences count for as little as those of creed and he made a gesture towards the priest you will find monsieur valmy a perfectly delightful companion so i hope you and miss beaton too will find sir victor i have an idea mr bellarmin that if you were in the house of lords you would sit on the cross benches in more senses than one mary laughed and so did bellarmin i dare say you are right said rolf anyhow i haven't the faintest dislike to staying in the same house with sir victor quite the contrary it is what i have often wished to do but i have never been given the chance i am delighted to meet him outside the field of politics mr bellarmin cried lady struthers from the tea-table handing him at the same time a fragrant steaming cup and the cream jug it's a fresh brew do you take sugar though it is not the fashion in england to take sugar i observe the first cup was delicious mr bellarmin our second wasn't so good but this is going to be quite as excellent as the first and strawberries i always assure foreigners that strawberry squash is really the typical english dish i tell madame mr bellarmin that there's one good you get by living out of one's own country for a number of years you notice things and you get perspective if i ever go back to schwalbenstadt i shall introduce the dear grand duchess to english strawberry squash that evening both mary and don jose were in particularly lively humour the girl seemed to have been endued with a spirit of playfulness and innocent gaiety that contrasted with her former vague depression and which was to bellarmin peculiarly captivating the young prince of saragossa still hailing her as his queen made himself her cup-bearer and poured her wine and waited upon her somewhat to the embarrassment of lord stonehenge's solemn butler bellarmin fell into the boy's fancy and gravely paid homage to the pretty pretendress the priests smiled benignantly general falcon scowled in sullen dissatisfaction to lady struthers and stonehenge each in a different fashion the proceedings savoured too much of a jest on the sacred subject of divine rights to be altogether agreeable but mary beaton and bellarmin were very happy perhaps neither of them quite knew why when dinner was over they all went back together to the drawing-room the windows stood wide open to the terrace and the lake shone silvery in the moonlight don jose vaulted forth and ran down to the boat-house where a tiny skiff was moored and presently they heard his clear boy's tenor ringing out a sort of boat song in spanish which sounded like an invitation to follow him miss beaton paused a little irresolutely on the sill i am going on the water said she looking back into the room and then she turned again and sang an answering call she had a very sweet but not very powerful mezzo-soprano voice with a pathetic note in it that struck bellarmin as peculiarly in harmony with that slightly melancholy strain he had noticed in her character madame said falcon abruptly you will not trust yourself alone on the lake with the prince who to say the least is young and heedless but indeed i shall my good general replied mary with pretty wilfulness and we shall sing duets on the water to which you may join chorus from the bank if you please lord stonehenge 
let us have coffee in the boathouse and you gentlemen may talk politics or science or anything you like while don jose and i enjoy ourselves and i said lady struthers shall beg to remain indoors if madame and his highness will excuse my attendance the lake has no attractions for me i am not fond of leading the vie de canard which appears to delight you so in england we make a virtue of necessity lady struthers put in bellarmin dr amblain and i will enjoy a game of draughts or a little literary conversation went on lady struthers the pleasures of intellectual intercourse have not come much in my way since we left the cultivated circle of the residence i must confess that i am disappointed in english society and she threw a rebuking glance at bellarmin it seems to me that the entree to the highest circles in london political or social is far from being a guarantee of intellectual distinction quite true lady struthers answered bellarmin you must amuse us is the first command of smart society it doesn't say you must improve us miss beaton went lightly out into the garden singing still as she walked bellarmin followed her he carried a white knitted cloud lady struthers beseeches you to put this on she let him wrap the shawl about her head and shoulders i have never heard you sing before he said oh i sing very passably i assure you she replied but i have a perverse and gammon taste for street songs and general falcon doesn't encourage me in it he thinks it is unbefitting your bellarmin was going to say pretensions but stopped himself and added your illustrious descent exactly and there he is wrong mary stuart never thought about what was befitting or unbefitting her dignity and yet she was always a queen that's part of the bore of sham royalty mary added with a sigh one has metaphorically speaking to keep the sceptre and crown perpetually en evidence now i am sure if your queen when she was much younger say had taken a fancy to sing johnny peel or up in a balloon boys every one would have thought it quite pretty and nice bellarmin laughed mary turned her bright frank eyes to him they were sparkling with amusement i have only seen the people in their wretchedness she said and her face became suddenly sad again i want to see them in their places of entertainment mr bellarmin she clasped her hands with a girlish impulsive gesture i am going to carry out the most daring project when i go back to london i should shock you so terribly that i long to tell you what it is but i dare not i have only brought the general to consent by dint of coaxing and promises of the strictest secrecy i dare say i can guess said bellarmin a private box at the oxford or the london pavilion oh dear no nothing half so much in the world but don't ask me another question whether by design or accident they had made a little detour and instead of proceeding straight to the bank of the lake near which don jose was paddling they turned up by a small inlet crossed by an ornamental bridge tell me said bellarmin looking at her in a half amused half earnest manner what is the meaning of it all the meaning of it mary repeated and she stopped short on the bridge and looked up at him the meaning of what this sham royalty as you call it what is it to end in noblesse oblige said mary a little haughtily i am the last of the stuarts that of course no one doubts it but he paused he had a vague impulse to question her that he might discover to what extent she herself was aware of any political or social machinations on the part of her adherents though mary beaton had been magnet powerful enough to draw him at once to stonehenge it puzzled him a little why he had been invited there he wanted to find out what was expected of him how far he was supposed to espouse miss beaton's claims why sir victor champion had been asked whether the meeting between him and sir victor had been arranged by the jacobite clan with a view to furthering the minor stuart business or by champion himself for a greater political purpose his embarrassed manner quickened mary's curiosity well she said what is it that you are wondering about i'll tell you i'm wondering about two things 
why general falcon and lord stonehenge were so good as to press me to join this party and by the way why does general falcon scowl at me so fiercely now that i am here he saw in the moonlight the red blood rise to mary's face and overspread its milky whiteness you were asked because well i'll be frank with you because i wanted to have someone new and entertaining and fresh from the outside world about me i am tired of all these fossilized interests as for my general perhaps it is that which makes him cross i can't be responsible for his whims they puzzle me quite as much as they can puzzle you madame said bellarmin with real feeling in his voice i am more than honored i am deeply grateful if you knew what a sweet and soothing beneficial influence you have over me you would not be surprised that i thank heaven for the kindly impulse which made you wish for my company there was a little pause it seemed to bellarmin that the red deepened on mary's half-averted cheek and the other thing you were wondering about she asked presently the other thing oh why is sir victor champion coming mary looked round at him with a bright little laugh well i don't mind confiding to you the least little faint hint of a very tiny political conspiracy which lord stonehenge got from mr tressel and which he let out to me only yesterday mr tressel just suggested that sir victor would not be sorry to see something of you in a friendly informal way oh mr bellarmin it is too delicious that i should be mixed up in your english parliamentary intrigues i wish you were on sir victor's side i believe in him you wish i were on his side said bellarmin slowly not against your convictions of course i think on the whole that what interests me about you is that you are a frontier still i believe i should not be sorry if your convictions were to take the same form as sir victor's you believe that he has sincere convictions that he has the good of his country at heart oh i am certain of it no one could watch his face and see the light kindle in his eyes when he talks of what is near his heart and not feel that he is intensely in earnest i have seen him several times lately he is very good in explaining things to me and he has such a pretty way of recognizing me as a steward and all that as if he were indulging the whim of a child he was fond of oh yes i believe in sir victor i am a little afraid of him i shall not dare to be frivolous before him as i am this evening but i admire him immensely all the same the thought came into bellarmin's mind as he walked along by mary beaton's side that it was curious these two women josephine saxon and mary beaton women as unlike in character and temperament as if they had been born in different planets and showing that dissimilarity most it seemed to him in the strange conflicting influence they exercised upon himself should both feel such genuine and apparently intuitive confidence in champion's political sincerity josephine's frank admission of a former acquaintance with champion dispelled any dark suggestions that might have rankled in bellarmin's mind her arguments and her appeal in their late interview had almost unconsciously to himself affected him strongly now they seemed to receive additional strength from the fact of mary's partisanship it was a curious convergence of opposing forces mary's enthusiastic expressions grated slightly upon him but they set him thinking if this bright intelligent girl were so imbued with belief in champion's high purpose was he right in refusing to hear what champion had to bring forward in his own support they had crossed the bridge and now by a turn in the shrubbery they had been skirting came suddenly upon the boathouse a kind of open pavilion with tables and lounges where the gentlemen were sitting and enjoying their cigarettes and where coffee was being served mary did not wait for any coffee but stepped into the canoe in which don jose was established and presently the two had paddled out into the lake monsignor valmy and lord stonehenge called out admonitions to keep near the shore the boy and girl laughed and murmured together and in a few moments their voices burst on the still soft night blending in a rollicking rhine song it was very charming and poetic bellarmin thought he sat somewhat apart near the wide entrance arch of the pavilion 
silent and dreamy as he smoked his cigar and gazed at the white figure in the boat and the noble head and the play of features and eyes which seemed spiritualized by the moonlight the two young people went on singing song after song pushing out into the lake so that their voices sounded softer and more distant and now they turned a little point and were hidden by a drooping willow though the sweet ringing melody told that they were not far after a while they stopped singing altogether it could be seen that they had landed on an islet in the middle of the lake where there were more willows and another pavilion meanwhile the men had fallen into general half-political talk and the question of mary stuart beaton's inheritance was brought up general falcon was explaining the position to monsignor valmy and while the echo of mary beaton's and don jose's first duet still lingered in his ear bellarmin was roused from his dreamlike reverie by a pointed question End of volume two, chapter two